He was running away from her, but she was faster. He fell on the ground. She sliced his hand with a blade. She told him to not move in order to tell her what he, the human, was doing here. The guy started talking. His name is Shibata Kosuke. He said he liked to play survival games on his computer, but somehow he ended up in a forest and he couldn't explain how it happened. But the elf girl didn't believe his words. Then he looked at her face and said, Dark elf, beautiful. She kicked him hard for that. Not for the word beautiful, but for the word dark elf. She didn't like him calling her that. Kosuke yelled at her and called her savage. Well, she just smiled and snidely asked him what he was staring at right now. He was honest and said he was looking at her breasts. She liked his honesty and let him wake up. Then she asked him again what he was doing here, and he honestly answered he didn't know. And that was true. He woke up in this place and looked at the sky. There were two giant planets above him. Then the elven girl told him they are in Risu, Pensu continent, in the Omit wilderness border of the Black Forest. Let's take a look at the past. It was Kosuke's first day of survival. He realized he ended up in an unknown place. He had his house key, smartphone, and some wallet. He could take a taxi and go back home. Well, actually, he couldn't. It was another world. That's sad. He wished it would be just a game. But it was reality and he needed to think up something. He literally had no idea what to do. Then he calmed down and realized that it would be more important to build a safe shelter first. He luckily ended up in a dark, dense forest. If it was a game, he could just make a stilt shelter. Well, it doesn't matter! He took a stone and quickly made a stone knife, his first tool. Then he headed to the forest. Since it was reality, there were a lot of huge insects and bushes. How disgusting. Then Kosuke found a tree that looked nice for his safe shelter. He had to do everything fast until the sun set. He got some materials. It wouldn't be possible to survive without a fire, so Kosuke decided to make a bow drill fire starter. It was hard for the first time, but after some attempts, he finally did that. A campfire. Kosuke realized he felt hungry. He was really angry that he didn't have anything in this world. He just ended up here without any special abilities. What a stupid situation. But Kosuke couldn't go hunting at night. He needed to sleep well now. If it was a game, he could just press the E button and summon the craft menu. And once Kosuke thought about it, he suddenly summoned the craft menu. What? Then he realized he can summon or disable it just by thinking about pressing the E button. It was for real. Then he thought about what would happen by using the tab key. And once he thought about that, he summoned an inventory. He could also see his status. Then he realized he was actually in a survival game. What luck! He could easily make anything he needed just by using the craft menu. Then he started thinking about what he needed to make right now, and how would it work? He took a stone and a stick, and it worked. He could create anything. After some time, he made all the weapons and instruments he needed. Well, some of them he couldn't use normally since he had no required skills, but it was possible to use at least. And the inventory thing is really cool. Kosuke could put everything he wanted and not feel its weight. And it was easy to pull out any item from there. Well, now it was time to sleep well. It would be dangerous to go somewhere at nighttime. The hunger was really annoying. The next day, Kosuke was fooling around. He imagined he was streaming with a wooden camera. But then he remembered it was reality and all the magic suddenly disappeared. He needed to find some food and water. If Kosuke starts thinking about pressing move buttons, he could move to any side by only his wish. What the hell? Laws of inertia literally went away. And he also could jump by using the space key. Then he looked forward and saw water. He headed right there. There was a rock on his way. Kosuke tried to do a double jump. He jumped by himself and then used the space key. It worked. Then he landed successfully on the ground. But when he looked forward, he saw his first enemy. Lizard. That wasn't good at all. So bad. In the next moment, he rushed away from there and the lizard started chasing him too. Kosuke realized he could use the sprint key, but the lizard was too fast and Kosuke decided to take the fight. He took his spear and threw it into the lizard, but he missed. What unluck, there was a second one, but the lizard suddenly jumped at Kosuke and he fell on the ground. Kosuke didn't understand what happened, his weapon broke, but then he looked at the lizard and realized he defeated him. To make sure the animal died, he took the stone axe and struck him hard some more times. He opened the window and saw all the loot he could get from the animal's corpse. After Kosuke took all the items into his inventory, the lizard's corpse disappeared. Well, it was time to go back to his shelter. Kosuke put water into the bottle. He did it 50 times. It might be 50 liters of water. Now he needed to boil this water to sterilize it. When he came back, he saw there was a craft recipe of safe water by using the campfire. He also wanted to grill the meat to make it tasty. Kosuke noticed that the craft icon of the safe water was looking different. It was actually a plastic bottle. How could it be possible? But well, he didn't care. He drank a lot. It was really great water. The meat also has been cooked. Kosuke was crying from happiness. It had the chicken meat's taste. It's his first meal here.
After the dinner, he decided to do some more work. First, he needed to create a stone shovel. After that, he started digging around his base. It wasn't hard to do since this world was working like the game. If he digs a little, it digs the entire block. Very easy. He finished it quickly. He got some rich soil and clay. It was possible to craft some more blocks by using it. There also was a furnace which would be helpful in processing metal. It was almost night. Kosuke quickly made a hammock and went to sleep. And when he fell asleep, that elf girl noticed him. She couldn't get past the human. She listened to his story and this time she believed him. Then the elf girl summoned some spirits and they surrounded Kosuke. First he got scared but when he saw they healed the wound on his hand he was surprised. It felt really pleasant. She said that the spirit of life actually was fond of him. Kosuke thought he might be able to use magic but the elf girl broke all his dreams since she didn't feel any magic aura surrounding him. Then she told him to follow her. She said there might appear other hostile creatures. Kosuke agreed it wouldn't end well and he gladly came with her. Then he suddenly realized he still didn't know her name. She turned and realized she actually forgot to say that. Her name is Sylphie. She is one of the guardians of the Black Forest. She is also known as the Witch of the Dark Forest. Sylphie was too fast for Kosuke. He was breathing hard. She told him to not cry and be the man, and they were almost at the right place. Sylphie pointed forward and Kosuke saw a village. It was pretty large. Kosuke thought that the villagers would be happy to meet him. But Sylphie suddenly gave him a collar and told to wear it. It looked interesting. But why should he wear it? Sylphie said it will save his life, and she didn't lie. When they came to the village, Kosuke realized it was literally opposite to his dreams. All the beasts wanted to kill him. They were really mad to see a human. Kosuke didn't get what was happening. Sylphie shouted out to everyone to go out of their way. She said she needed to talk with guardians and told Kosuke to wait here. He was worried if he would be safe. Then an elf guy came here and told Kosuke to follow him to not gather the attention of the crowd that much. Kosuke didn't mind. They came to a quiet place. Then the elf threw him on the ground. Kosuke realized he was betrayed by him. Kosuke looked back and saw two oni that were going to smash him. And other villagers gathered here too. They surrounded Kosuke with weapons. He didn't know what to do. It was such a terrible situation. Then someone shouted out to get out of here and the cloud of dust covered the site. When it dissolved, they saw Sylphie. She was holding Kosuke by the collar. He couldn't breathe normally. She told everyone he is her own slave and no one is able to make him suffer except her. They understood her clearly and walked away. Kosuke realized why she told him to wear this collar, but he actually didn't like that she kept holding him like a dog. Sylphie said that every dog should be chained with a collar. Kosuke didn't like her jokes. He also wanted to know why those beasts wanted to kill him. Sylphie told him a story. There is a conflict between humans and other races. In the kingdom, subhumans aren't able to live normal life since the kingdom didn't count them as humans. So, the refugees from the kingdom live in this village. It's way better to live far away from humans. That's why they were that hostile to him. Kosuke looked forward and saw large flying plantations. Sylphie said they grow crops by using magic. It might be even better than in Japan. Sylphie told him to continue following her. They finally came to Sylphie's place. Kosuke was amazed by how beautiful it was. When Kosuke entered the house, he started sniffing. It smelled really good, but Sylphie said she didn't burn incense and it was just always like that. Well, Kosuke wanted to know what was the reason for capturing him. Sylphie said she did it just for fun, but Kosuke didn't believe her words. Then she said he was looking interesting for her. There was a legend of the god Ador that sometimes summons humans to their world. Sylphie hoped Kosuke was one of those humans and it meant he could have some interesting powers. She asked him what kind of power he has, but Kosuke didn't want to show all the aces that fast. But Sylphie really wanted him to answer, and she used all her charisma to force him to talk. Kosuke couldn't keep his silence and started talking. He showed her his inventory and what he can do with it. She was surprised he made all these items by himself. Sylphie wanted to know more. Kosuke regretted telling her that much. She also noticed raw lizard meat. Kosuke told how he got it. The lizard's corpse disappeared and all the loot came to his inventory. He thought about meat and realized he was hungry. Sylphie told him to make some food. He was her servant so he should cook for her too. Kosuke asked her to help with that, and she didn't mind. It was not bad for his first cook. Kosuke would say it was really tasty, but he also needed to sleep somewhere. The floor won't be a good place for that. Sylphie smiled and offered to sleep together. Kosuke got really shy, but she was persistent. Kosuke didn't actually know what to do. This world's social rules may be different from his one. But Sylphie calmed him down. She said all he needs is just a bit of curiosity. Then Kosuke realized there was nothing that would stop him. He woke up and picked Sylphie up. She blushed hard. Kosuke carried her to the bedroom. Sylphie said it will be her first time. Kosuke actually would have love experience in this world for the first time too. She asked him to be gentle. 
The next day, Kosuke felt strange. Everything was like a blur. He asked Silfi if she felt good. She answered it was like she lost something important. Kosuke cooked some food and offered it to her. But she was mad at him because he did that yesterday to her. Her hits were painful. She told him they were going hunting today. The lunch was actually looking great. Silfi chained Kosuke again. He still couldn't get used to it. Everyone was staring at them, but they didn't try to do anything. Were they afraid of Silfi? Then Kosuke noticed that elf guy that tried to kill him yesterday. His name is Nate. Silfi told Kosuke to not worry about him. Anyway, he couldn't do anything to him because of her. There were some wooden materials. Kosuke asked Silfi what they were building. She said it will be the house especially for refugees. There were a lot of refugees and they needed to live somewhere. Ever since the Holy Kingdom took over, the refugees lost everything and their only way was to leave the kingdom. Kosuke said everyone who loses the conflict faces fate like this, but he actually understood what she was thinking about. Silfi might want to help the kingdom of Vernard gain its freedom back. He didn't mind helping her with that since he had a really good skill. He could create any weapon quickly. Well, it was time to hunt. And finally, Kosuke could take off the chain since they weren't in the village right now. Silfi told him to be quiet. He told her to not worry about that and demonstrated how quiet he can be. Silfi got scared of his abilities. It looked not normal at all. He also asked her if he could try to cut that wood. Silfi said it would take too much time to make it useful, but Kosuke wanted to show something. He opened the inventory and took the stone axe. First, Silfi thought he was doing something strange, but then the tree suddenly fell down. What the hell was that? She had no words to say. The tree he cut it just now was absolutely clear from all the branches and leaves. Moreover, the tree was looking way straighter than it actually was before. Silfi thought she was going crazy. Then he reached out his hand and opened the inventory. All the items got immediately sorted there. Kosuke asked Silfi if he could cut some more trees. She told him to not cut anything but those she will point at. After some time, Kosuke had 50 tree logs. That was enough. Well, now it was time to find some ores. They headed to the mountains. After some time of walking, they suddenly stopped. Kosuke said he heard something strange, but Silfi told him he was going crazy and they continued walking. But then she stopped again. There was an unknown spider-like beast. It was standing in their way. It was a really large spider. Kosuke realized if he met this spider when he was alone, he could be dead already. Silfi told Kosuke to watch the spider's abdomen. He wanted to say something, but he didn't see Silfi. She attacked the spider. She was really fast. Then Kosuke noticed the spider's sting. It was ready to attack. Kosuke decided to do something and tried to use the bow like it was the game. And it worked. The arrow got right into the spider's body. Silfi didn't lose any time and jumped at the spider. She stabbed his head easily. Then she jumped back and landed on the ground successfully. Kosuke was astonished. Silfi looked at the spider. They killed this creature. Kosuke asked if this thing was edible. She said it's absolutely not, but its poison gland and abdomen is worth a bit. Then she added he can actually cook the spider's legs. Its meat might be good for the bow. Silfi told Kosuke to use his inventory and bring the beast to the village. Then he came closer and reached his hand out. The spider's corpse suddenly disappeared. He looked into his inventory. This beast is called a gizma. Silfi was very surprised to know this beast was walking in the forest since it must live in Omit Wilds. She realized that the bad things she was thinking about were becoming real. She told Kosuke that a lot of refugees were killed by these monsters. That was terrible. She said that they didn't see any new refugees for the last two years. It meant these monsters were just killing them. Sipli told Kosuke to go back since they might meet more gizmas or other dangerous beasts. He realized he could easily meet them while he had been gathering the stones when he was alone. It seemed that he got really lucky. Kosuke found a lot of resources. The temperature was cold, but never mind, Kosuke was determined to make a workbench today. He got a lot of magnetic sand and it was time to create a furnace. After that, Kosuke needed to create the materials for creating a workbench. It was just like in the game, but still a bit hard. He needed wood, nails, vice, and toolbox. For creating the vice, he needed 20 pieces of steel and 10 mechanical parts. The easiest thing was that he didn't even need to know how to make it. He just needed the materials and that's all. He was wondering where Silfi was right now. She said she went to watch the perimeter but still didn't come back. Well, he finally made the vice. It was the last material he needed for creating the workbench. Nice! It was way easier and faster than he thought. He immediately put it right here. Looks nice! He opened the menu and was really surprised by how much stuff he was able to create now. And there were also new types of weapons. A crossbow, for example. He looked at the crossbow craft recipe. He needed two twigs, two wooden sticks, mechanical details, and 20 fibers. But he could actually make a better version of it, but he needed to craft a steel plate spring. But how to make it? He opened the recipe and there appeared more windows. 
To create the spring, he needed to upgrade his furnace at first. And to upgrade his furnace, he needed to upgrade his workbench. That was too hard to do right now. Then, Kosuke noticed a new section there. He opened it and saw his level and stats. Not bad. There you can see all the stats Kosuke can upgrade. Well, he couldn't decide what to upgrade first, so he decided to do it later. There also was an achievements menu. There were a lot of locked achievements, but some of them were already complete. First workbench. After completing this achievement, he was allowed to see his status, skills, and achievements in the menu. So every achievement was giving him something. Then he saw he completed the achievement First Mate. Just because he had an act of love with Sylphie? What the hell? And it actually wasn't his first time, but was there something else? An achievement technician. Because he made Sylphie feel great that night. What the hell are these achievements? That was totally dumb. Kosuke didn't notice Sylphie came back. He got scared. He apologized for letting his guard down. She also came here with the rabbit. She told him to use his inventory. Sylphie praised him for his work. She was surprised to see the shovel made of steel. There also was a steel pickaxe. Kosuke struck the stone a few times and it disappeared. He gave her a little piece of iron ore. He didn't know why it was working in that strange way, but if it works, then doesn't matter. She asked him if he wasn't a mage for sure, but Kosuke really had no idea what kind of power he had. It wasn't magic at all. Sylphie told Kosuke she will protect him from danger. He felt shy because of her words. Then Kosuke put a sandwich on the table. It was still warm and Sylphie was wondering if the time in the inventory just stops. His power was against all the physics laws. Sylphie told Kosuke they needed to come back to the village today. There was something she wanted to talk about with the elders. Hold him better! An elf guard was yelling at Sylphie. He didn't want to let her and the human meet the elders, but she just ignored him. Then the guard took her shoulder and was going to say something, but in the next moment he immediately got a strike in the face. And that's what happens to those who make Sylphie angry. They entered the house. There was a big hall room. In the center of the room were sitting the elders. They were surprised to see Sylphie, since she didn't like their company at all. Sylphie said she came here with important news. They immediately asked about Kosuke. He was human, so it was obvious that they were interested in him. The elder said she didn't feel any magic around him. Wasn't he a Marabito? A guy from another world? And she guessed right. Well, it wasn't the main thing Sylphie wanted to talk about. She said about Gizmas appeared in the dark forest. It was a serious problem. The elders started talking with each other about that. All the problems were because of refugees, and the elves actually had no reasons to help them. Then the elder asked Sylphie about Kosuke. Didn't she want to make him her own servant? And moreover, they knew she already had mingled with him on the first night. Sylphie blushed hard. How did they figure that out? Well, the elder elf said that her magic aura just changed a bit. It happens to every woman who accepts a man. Sylphie was going to sink into the floor. The elder said she was the only royal bloodline virgin girl. That information surprised Kosuke. Well, it wasn't time for jokes. The elder elf asked Sylphie seriously, Who is this guy? Sylphie answered that she didn't know anything about him but that he appeared from nowhere in the forest and that he has some interesting skills. The elder elf didn't feel like she could trust her words. She was going to take Kosuke into their custody but Sylphie refused to let them do that and hugged him hard. And it seemed that he didn't mind at all. Well, the elder elf realized they're looking good together so she decided to watch what would happen next. But despite being a Marabito, he was also a human. It meant it would be hard for villagers to accept him. Kosuke needed to show them his best and then the villagers would accept him. Sylphie understood the elder elf's words. They wanted to see his powers in work so everything was on him. Then Sylphie told Kosuke it was time to go and they were going to leave. Then the elder elf asked Kosuke his name. He told her his name. Shibata Kosuke. The elder elf asked him to take care of Sylphie. He said everything will be okay and they left the house. After they left the house, Kosuke asked Sylphie if she felt okay. She looked a bit nervous and Kosuke just wanted to lighten the mood. She said she was just thinking about what they need to do now. Sylphie said that if they will be able to save the refugees with Kosuke's powers, then he will be accepted by the villagers. Kosuke asked if they needed some help with building the walls. Sylphie said they will end building it at best in six months. Kosuke got a thought. He said he can help with that. First, he started making the items he needed. He also needed to create some bricks. Kosuke didn't show all his powers to Sylphie, so it was time to demonstrate something. He swung his arms and there appeared a block of wood. And then he was walking back and placing the blocks like it was the game. Sylphie had no words to say. He just built the wall in a few seconds. What the hell? Kosuke really surprised Sylphie by his trick. The wall he built was made of real wood. It wasn't magic. Then Kosuke said they actually need to use bricks or stone material for the walls. And he started placing it fast. It actually was looking like some kind of magic. No, it was just something strange. He was proud of his superpowers, but Sylphie told him to shut up. She touched the wall and realized it was made of real bricks. Then Kosuke said he made a new weapon, so he wanted to test it out right now. It was a simple crossbow. 
Sylphie thought it was some kind of bow and she guessed right. Kosuke said it's easy to use. He gave it to Sylphie and offered to make a shot. She immediately realized it was way easier to aim than the bow. And finally, shot. Very well. Kosuke said it's a really good thing for those who aren't able to use a simple bow. It meant they could give these long-range weapons to all the refugees. Well, the crossbow wasn't strong enough to pierce the gizma's skin. Then Kosuke gave her an upgraded version of this weapon. She looked at it and realized it would be way stronger. She asked Kosuke to put the gizma's body here. She wanted to test it against the real enemy. Kosuke put the gizma's body on the ground. Sylphie aimed and shot. The projectile pierced the gizma's skin easily. It's a really strong weapon. Then Kosuke asked Sylphie if he could build a workshop here in the backyard. She didn't mind and told him he could build anything he wanted. Kosuke decided to make a simple square building. Then he took a wooden block and started the building process. First he built the floor. Now it was time to build the walls. Well, it was still looking crazy. Sylphie couldn't get used to his abilities. And the last thing he needed to make were the windows. And finally his workshop was finished. Sylphie was shocked he built the entire house in just 30 minutes. It was a bit strange inside, but Kosuke felt great. It was better than nothing. He wanted to talk about building the walls tomorrow, but Sylphie put the finger on his mouth and said it's time for dinner. She was going to cook it by herself. Even if Sylphie thought Kosuke was her slave, she also was his wife. And every good wife should cook for her man. Sylphie offered him to come to her place. It was happening really fast. Kosuke didn't get what was happening but followed her. Kosuke and Sylphie had a good dinner. Kosuke told her about his plans. He wanted to build the brick wall around the village so he wanted to get as much clay as possible. They also needed to make a lot of crossbows. It's really important for refugees' safety. Sylphie asked Kosuke if they could replace the animal's bones with the gizma shell. Kosuke said it's a good idea. Sylphie smiled. Kosuke felt embarrassed. She was a really cute girl and he was wondering why she was so kind to him. She was way different now from the moment they met each other for the first time. Then Kosuke asked Sylphie about her past. It made her blush. Was it that interesting for him? Sylphie put her head on Kosuke's shoulder and said she is the heiress of the royal family. Kosuke was wondering why the princess was walking living in the dark forest alone. Sylphie said it's the royal family tradition. But the Holy Kingdom captured her country and she lost her family. That's why she was so determined to protect everyone in this village. And then Kosuke asked her if she was using him for her own purposes. The human that came from another world and has powerful abilities. Kosuke also guessed it was the reason she had an act of love with him. And Sylphie said it was true. But Kosuke said it's okay. He didn't care about that much and was happy to help her. He said he will be there until he has repaid her for all of the things she did for him. Sylphie was really surprised to hear that answer. The honest answer from Kosuke. She hugged him. She was happy to be with him. They kissed each other. It was a long, lovely night. Tomorrow, Sylphie felt embarrassed. They were doing a lot of bad things that night and she wanted Kosuke to forget about this. He made some jokes about her, but it seems that she wasn't in a fun mood now. Kosuke was sent to the kitchen to cook breakfast. They came to the village's main storage. There were some goods they needed to transport. Eight barrels of wine, eight bags of flour, and four cans of salt. Kosuke took it into his inventory. After that, they headed to the refugees' camp to talk with their leaders. They wanted to know what were the results of their talk with the elders. When refugees saw Kosuke for the first time, they were really scared. They wanted his death. There was a minotaur named Danon. When he saw Sylphie, he bowed down. He was addressing her as Your Majesty, and Sylphie didn't like it at all. Well, she told him to just tell the leaders of the refugees that she arrived here. Danon immediately started carrying out the order. Before he walked away, he glanced at Kosuke with evil. That was scareful. Kosuke asked her why he was so hostile, and she told him his story. Humans raped and killed his wife, and after that, he lost both of his children in the Omit wilderness. That was sad. Kosuke asked Sylphie what was the reason to bring him here then, and she said it just would be a nice chance to show the refugees that he isn't bad. All Kosuke needed was to just follow her orders. Sylphie said she won't abandon him, and Kosuke said the same. Sylphie was happy to hear that. Then Sylphie told everyone she brought a lot of food and wood here. Then Kosuke reached out his hands, and there appeared the gizma's meat. Everyone was shocked. It appeared literally from nowhere. Then Sylphie said it was time to cook. First, they wanted to feed kids. When Danon came back, he didn't understand what was happening. He told Sylphie the leaders were waiting for them. Sylphie and Kosuke went to meet them. They entered the tent. The leaders asked them how they may help. Sylphie told them it was about the problem with gizmas. The leaders told them what they heard from the elders. They could make a choice to run away to the forest or to take the fight here. It was good. Then Sylphie introduced Kosuke to them. He was the guy that could help them with building the wall and with weapons. She also said he was the one who took her virginity. Well, no one expected to hear that and even Kosuke was confused. 
No one could believe her words. That was scandalous. Kosuke is a human. What the hell? Silphy shouted out to everyone to calm down. She was going to explain everything. She told them he came from another world, and she didn't want to just tell them about his abilities. Better would be to let Kosuke introduce himself. But Danan and others still felt confused and didn't trust Kosuke. That was obvious, and Silphy knew they wouldn't believe it until they had seen it with their own eyes. Then Silphy told Kosuke to tell them everything. It was really important. And he told them his story. It was hard, but they believed his words. Danan told Kosuke if Kosuke will harm her majesty, then he will stab Kosuke's heart with his horns. Kosuke understood him clearly. Then Danan offered everyone to introduce themselves, too. Danan was first. He was a Marinard Imperial Guard, the Vice Commander of the Knights. Then the Sheep Girl introduced herself. Her name is Melty. She was the Internal Affairs Minister for the Marinard Kingdom. Kosuke was surprised to see a Sheep Girl there. He liked her from the first glance. And of course, she noticed what he was staring at right now. The Cyclops Girl introduced herself as Era. She was the Marinard Kingdom's court mage. And when Kosuke looked into her eye, she tried to hide it. Well, she was a shy girl. The wolf girl was named Kubi. She had no status or special abilities like them, but she was pretty confident in herself. The leaders and Kosuke finally found a common ground. It was time to talk about more important things, about Kosuke's abilities. Melty asked him to clarify what kind of things he can make. So, Silphie offered them to go outside and see everything with their own eyes. Then a refugee entered the tent and asked about the food. The leaders that were in charge of all food were going to solve the problem. Silphie said to not wait for them. They still had a lot of things to do. They came to the place where Kosuke had already placed some bricks. Silphie smiled and told them to just watch the show. Kosuke asked if he could just break it all. Silphie didn't mind, then he took his pickaxe. A few touches and the block of bricks just disappeared. There are no words to describe their shock at that moment. He was just slightly swinging the pickaxe and nothing else. What the hell? The territory was cleared from the bricks. Now it was time to build the wall. The leaders were ready to see what would happen next. Then Kosuke started walking back and swinging his hands. The bricks were appearing from nowhere, and there was zero magic. Kosuke told them to touch this wall to check if it's not an illusion or something else. Then Kubi and Danan came closer and started hitting it, but it was too hard to break. Impossible! They built the wall just in a few seconds instead of two weeks. Ira couldn't believe he was just doing this with no cost. Impossible! It was trick! She didn't want to believe her own eyes. Kosuke said he didn't know about his abilities. It was just working and that's all, but Eira wanted to know more. Silphie told Kosuke to explain everything to her or she won't calm down, and Kosuke showed her more. She couldn't believe it was working like that, but she was holding a plastic bottle right now, and it appeared from nowhere. Was he cheating by using this so-called inventory? Kosuke told Era everything he could, but it was still impossible to explain why it was working in that way. But Melty was happy to know that Kosuke had such cool powers. It might be nice for cooking food. And then Melty and Era caught Kosuke. They were going to test if it's for real. It seemed that Kosuke and others were getting along. That was nice. After an hour, Kosuke felt really tired. They forced him to work hard. There was his lunch, Gizma's meat. It had a taste of chewy garlic shrimp. It was his first time eating an insect. In his country, people weren't eating such strange food. But their world was so different that they even had no monsters. Aira was shocked. How could it be possible? Monsters should be everywhere where magic is. And she was surprised even more when Kosuke told her that his world has no magic. What a strange guy. But she liked him. Silphie came here and noticed Kosuke was spending a lot of time with Era today. She was cute when getting jealous. He told her that he will never cheat on her. And since he said it too loudly, he got a hit in the stomach. They were getting along very well. Then Kubi asked Silphie what they needed to do next. Silphie said it was time to continue building the wall. Danan will show where he can find clay. They also had fuel, so there shouldn't be any problem. However, they had no wood at the moment. Then Silphie smiled and told them that Kosuke will solve this problem easily. The first tree fell on the ground, and for another time the leaders got shocked by Kosuke's powers. That was funny. He didn't even put any effort. Besides, the wood was straight, long, and ready for use. It was way more absurd than that trick with water. Ira said that Melty will be happy to know about Kosuke's ability. It made Kosuke feel worried. Didn't they just want to cut all the dark forest? He asked them to not tell Melty about that. Then Silphie told Aira and Kubi to go get some clay. But Aira asked Silphie to let her watch Kosuke for some more time. She didn't mind and let her stand with them. Kubi immediately started carrying the order and jumped high. What a strong girl. While well, Silphie was going to mark all the trees they needed to cut, it was sunset. They did a lot of work today. 
Ira realized that Kosuke's instruments and items had no magic powers, but it starts working in that crazy way only when Kosuke uses it. Absurd. Ira was holding the axe. It was really sharp. What an interesting tool. Kosuke was a bit scared by her, but she actually wasn't going to cut him in parts. Well, at least while he is alive, that sounded creepy. Kosuke felt really tired. Sylphie praised him for his work today. He did a lot. Sylphie asked what he was holding. It was bread he got from a refugee. He was glad to know he started getting along with refugees. Sylphie was glad to hear that too. She also praised him for the work he did with flour milling. He still couldn't forget this hell, so he asked Sylphie to not remind him about that. Sylphie asked Kosuke if he would try to find a common ground with them. Well, he wasn't sure. But everything was looking good and it seemed that the only problem might be Danan. He would be the most difficult person of them all. But Kosuke felt like he could get along with him too. But Sylphie wasn't sure about the crossbows. She said it won't end well if someone bad will get this weapon. It might end badly if they would give this weapon to everyone. Well, Kosuke offered her to give the crossbows to only persons they trust. Sylphie said it's a good idea. They came to Kosuke's workshop. It finally was the time to prepare everything for tomorrow. He placed some furnaces and put all the materials there. Everything was working by itself. That's very easy. Kosuke was happy to have such cool powers. He told Sylphie that they can upgrade the furnace. She said it would be nice. Then Kosuke clicked on the upgrade icon and the bright light suddenly filled the room. When it dissolved, they saw an upgraded furnace, anvil, and sharpening stone. Great! Well, it actually broke his wall for some reason. It seems that the new furnace needed a bit more space. Now it was time to see what this new furnace can do. Well, Kosuke expected that. Now he could upgrade the crossbow and the workbench. Moreover, he could start creating better armor and weapons. Sylphie offered Kosuke to make a weapon for Danan. There were some variants. He could create a halberd and a battle axe, but a bit different from what he was imagining, and then he finally got an idea. Bardish. But it appeared only when Kosuke thought about it. Another interesting thing about his powers, moreover, he also could repair things like armor or weapons. Sylphie instantly got an idea. She told Kosuke to follow her. They came to the little warehouse. There were the spoils of war. It was looking pretty old, and it seemed that this blood couldn't be removed. Kosuke opened his inventory. He was going to transport it all there. Everything was all right until Kosuke noticed some items were cursed. It scared him a bit. Wasn't it dangerous to hold cursed items? Sylphie said there is a way to remove the curse by using fire. They came back to Kosuke's workshop. He was going to repair all the equipment. Well, some of it was cursed, so he was still worrying about that. Then Kosuke realized that the weapon for Danan was already done. It was Bardish, a kind of battle axe, huge and heavy. He gave it to Sylphie. Even for her, it was a bit hard to move with. He told Sylphie there's a blade that would fit her very well. Sylphie came closer to him and asked to make it especially for her. He was glad to help her, but he didn't understand her hint. Then she straightly offered him to get some fun in bed tonight. Kosuke was glad to accept her wish, and he said he would let her do what she wanted. And these words changed the situation not in Kosuke's favor. The next day, Kosuke felt tired. This night was too crazy for him. Sylphie wanted to repeat it again today. When they came to the wall's place, they saw there was a lot of clay. Sylphie told Kosuke to bring all the weapons they repaired yesterday. Swords and shields dropped on the ground from his inventory. Then Danan wanted to see his weapon. Kosuke gave him his bardish. When Danan took it, he immediately realized it fits great for him. Would be nice to slice some gizmas with this axe. A really great weapon. Danan was wondering if it was made by Kosuke's powers. Sylphie said it's true. And she smiled, since Danan still didn't know about other Kosuke's abilities. Then Kosuke told everyone he was going to build up the blacksmithing facility here. He swung his hands and in the next moment there appeared a furnace with the anvil and the sharpening stone. After that, he placed more simple furnaces like it's just a wall. Everyone felt shocked. Ira was staring at him with jealousy. She came closer. She couldn't believe it was working like that. She was going crazy so Kubi caught her. While the furnaces were working, Kosuke decided to repair some cursed swords. They also needed to collect all this clay. Kosuke took his shovel and started working. Aira was watching him closely. She still wanted to figure out how it works. It isn't magic, but then what is it? Then Kosuke looked to the side and saw Melty. She was looking at Kosuke friendly. His sight fell on this thing she brought here. Well, he tried to ignore it this time. He didn't want to do the same work he did yesterday. Then Kosuke finished collecting the clay. He needed to create blocks of bricks. Then he swung his hands and there appeared a workbench. He was going to create an upgraded workbench. Ira came closer and focused all her attention to see what would happen next. Kosuke warned her it might be a bit bright, but she wanted to see everything. Then Kosuke pressed the button and the bright light blinded them. Melty asked what that was. Kosuke explained to her it was a process of upgrading. 
In the end, he got an upgraded version of the workbench. It was made of steel. Then Era said she saw something. It was a glimpse of the truth, and it reminded her of the holy magic used by priests. They got silent, and then Kosuke played along with her by saying it's true. Well, it was a joke. He just assumed he could be summoned by an unknown creature, and it granted him these abilities. There was silence. Ira believed his words. She was staying in this pose, holding her head until lunchtime came. Today they had some burgers for lunch. It looks tasty. Sylphie asked Kosuke if he was going to continue building the wall later today. He said that they made enough brick blocks so it would be nice to finish the job. Aira addressed Sylphie. She told her that she got an idea how to prove the fact that Kosuke came here from another world. It was interesting. Aira pointed at his slave collar. If he will be able to take it off without someone's help, then he is a true Marabito. Everyone got her idea. Then if he tries to remove it, then he dies. It scared Kosuke, so he started yelling at them to explain everything to him. Ira said this magic collar should lock his magic power and allow his owner to control Kosuke's body. Well, since Kosuke had zero magic powers, it meant this collar wasn't working at all. It was kinda interesting. Then Sylphie was going to test it out and she ordered him to take off all his clothes, but he actually was going to take the collar off first. Melty asked him if he would be able to take it off by himself. Then Kosuke put his hands on the collar and suddenly realized that Sylphie was thinking she could command him all this time. Then it meant their bed games were... Kosuke immediately got hit in the face for these thoughts. Melty asked Kosuke how much time building the wall might take. He said it might be around two or three hours. Then Sylphie woke up and said that right after Kosuke is done with the wall, they will hold a demonstration. Kosuke headed to the furnaces to take the bricks. Then Danan addressed him. He wanted to know why he didn't do anything bad to the princess if the collar wasn't working all this time. Kosuke just said there were no reasons to do that. Moreover, she saved his life. His words surprised Danan. But he believed him because Kosuke was an honest person. Kosuke asked if there was someone who could help him with confirming the range of the wall. Danan took a step towards him. Sylphie just smiled. Danan was glad to accompany him. They headed to the village entrance. Sylphie, Melty, Era, and Kubi were glad to see that Danan and Kosuke finally got along. After some time, Kosuke finished the wall. The last thing was to set up the gates, and well done. He finished building the wall around the village. Danan was very surprised that Kosuke did all his work that quickly. He did such a great job, very nice. But Kosuke had doubts about the height of the wall. He thought Gizmas can just jump like the insects in his world. Their jump was really high. Danan just calmed him down. Gizma can't jump that high. Their legs are used to jump straight forward. He also added that Gizmas usually gather into groups and attack from an ambush. Silphy was waiting for them. Danan and Kosuke finally finished the job. A large crowd gathered near the wall to listen to what Silphy wanted to say. And elf villagers were here too. There was silence. Then, Silphy started her speech. They finished building the wall with their help very quickly. She said there were no reasons to care if these walls would get broken by gizmas. The barrier was really hard. And all thanks to Kosuke, a human that came here from another world. Silphy said that Kosuke has no magic power at all. Even insects have a little amount of magic power, but Kosuke had literally zero. Ira could say it's true, but Silphy also wanted to show them the real proof. She pointed at Kosuke's collar. It was a slave collar, so if he has magic powers, then this collar won't let him do a single move without the master's command. But Kosuke just put his hands on the collar, and to everyone's surprise, he easily took it off. No way. But it was true. She might stop at that moment. But to convince everyone, and to prove the fact this collar wasn't fake, she offered them to test it out. A few brave monsters took a step forward. First was the cat girl. Sylphie put the collar on her neck and ordered to fell to her knees. The cat girl couldn't fight back the order. Then the lizard put the collar on another monster girl. When she tried to take it off, she started suffocating hard. So the collar wasn't fake, and it was time to test it out on Kosuke again. They were glad to do that. The cat girl put the collar on him and gave him an order to fall to his knees, but Kosuke just refused. She tried a few more times, but it wasn't working at all. And then he just took it off his neck without any effort. Then Sylphie hugged him. It seems that she was the only person he obeyed. When everyone saw it with their own eyes, Silphie said what they wanted to hear. Yes, Kosuke is a human, but he came here with only good intentions. After her words, the monsters started applauding them a lot. Melty was clapping too. Kosuke was a bit scared the monsters were that intense. Silphie was glad to know everyone agreed with her. Then she ended her speech. Kosuke realized they still had a lot of work to do. Silphie and others gathered to discuss their next plan. They needed to make a plan against the Gizma. Here also were some new faces. The cat girl introduced herself as Jaghira. She was a scout in the royal army. Pilna the harpy was also from the same squad. The dog named Warg was the captain of the guards in Tanto City. There also was a bear girl named Gerda.
she was from the heavy infantry of the Marinard Royal Army. Kosuke was surprised that these girls were soldiers. Well, in this world, male and female beastmen have the same strength. Then Silphy told Kosuke to show them the weapons, and Kosuke put a bunch of crossbows on the table. Everyone got interested in what that was. They never saw such an interesting weapon. Silphy told Kosuke to show how it works. He took a step forward and put the steel chest plate on the ground. He showed how to load the crossbow. It wasn't hard. Then, when everything was prepared, he aimed and shot. The arrow pierced the chest plate easily, the long-range weapon that wasn't hard to use. Nice. Then Kosuke offered to try it out. Jagira loaded the crossbow. She immediately realized this weapon fits her great. Era was interested in the mechanism of this weapon. This weapon might be really hard to make without Kosuke's powers, but they can try to look at this mechanism better and try to create something like that by themselves. Gerda couldn't use the crossbow since she was too big for this small weapon. Warg was fine with it. Pilna couldn't use it at all so most of them may use it without any problems. Then Jaghira asked about the range of this weapon. Kosuke said it's pretty far, something around 50 meters. Danan asked Kosuke how many crossbows they may create. Kosuke answered that the amount would be around 300. However, they also needed to create arrows. That's a problem since they didn't have that much resources. Silphy said it's okay. They also needed some weapons for reserve, so she offered to make 300 crossbows and 5,000 arrows. Since they needed more iron, Silphy said they also need to get more resources tomorrow, at the moment, it was possible to create 202 arrows. That was pretty much. Then Jaghira told Danan she was going to try it out now. Danan hoped she wouldn't do anything bad with this weapon. Well, he also wanted to take the crossbow and 100 arrows. He also gave it to Melty. Silphy said they don't need to worry if there aren't enough weapons or materials since Kosuke can make everything. Well, she shouldn't say such things when Melty is standing nearby. She already has some dirty thoughts. That was a mistake. Silphy said they were going to visit the elders. Kosuke did his part of the job, so she wanted to hear what they would say. It was evening. The elder elf was glad the wall was done, but she still was doubtful if the human won't betray them. Well, they were too old to think normally, so Silphy was getting annoyed by their behavior. Anyway, they were going to keep the promise. The elder elf said they will send them 20 spirit archers for help. Kosuke had no idea who those so-called spirit archers were. Silphy explained to him, they're the warriors who can use the spirit magic to shoot. Their arrow gets twice more speed than it usually has, and when the arrow lands into the target, it blows. Kosuke was amazed. The elder elf said they can go. Moreover, she knew they wanted to spend some time together, so she didn't want to hold them up. Silphy got blush. They started talking about their future children. That was absolutely confusing. Silphy couldn't listen to them anymore and just took Kosuke and rushed away from here. Well, they didn't like to be in company with these olds. Silphy was mad at them, then suddenly they saw their old friend, Nate. He wanted to stop them again, but Silphy wasn't in the mood to talk with him now. She landed a powerful punch right between his eyes. Too annoying guy, the hit was really good. After she punched him, she felt better. Kosuke asked why this guy was always that hostile to her. Silphy answered it was because he wanted to take revenge on her for his parents. There was a story. It happened three years ago. A rebellion occurred in the Marinard Kingdom. Silphy sneakily entered their common warehouse and stole all the spirit stones. Of course, she was chased by the guards, and there were Nate's parents among those guards. However, Danan's refugee squad met the Holy Kingdom's army. Of course, it was going to end really badly for them since the refugees had literally no chances against them. Silphy couldn't just watch this terrible massacre. The anger took over her mind and she attacked the Holy Kingdom's army. In the end, her skin color had been changed to dark and her muscles had got stronger. Yes, when the elf goes furious, he gets possessed by the dark powers and becomes the death machine. The elves whose skin color was changed to dark were called Tainted, and this is the reason Nate hates her that much. But Kosuke also wanted to know about what happened to Nate's parents. Silphy said they and a lot of other elves died that day because she lost her mind. The elves guards, including Nate's parents, entered the fight against the Holy Kingdom's army and they died. The Holy Kingdom's army was destroyed and they retreated quickly. It was done at the cost of a lot of elves' lives. Kosuke was astonished that she killed more than 2,000 soldiers by herself, so her dark skin color marked her as the cruel murderer. Her body changed a lot because of the dark powers. Kosuke listened to her story and just smiled. He told her she shouldn't care too much about her past. Moreover, he loved her, and he didn't worry about what she did before. Silphy smiled. She was thankful to Kosuke's kindness. She got closer and they looked into each other's eyes. They were holding their hands tight. Tonight, their relationship got even stronger than it was. It was the seventh day of survival. Kosuke almost finished upgrading the crossbow, and a few more things, and finally, done. The improved crossbow. Well, Kosuke couldn't use it normally since it was way harder than the usual crossbow. Then he realized he needed to just think about this like he is in the game. And it worked. 
Without this cheat ability, he wouldn't be able to do that. He tried to do a test shot. As expected, it was way stronger than the usual crossbow, but it seemed that this weapon would be possible to use only for someone strong. Okay, now Kosuke needed to use the forge. He noticed that he could craft some glassware stuff. It seems that it might be used for making potions. So he decided to make the brewing stand right now. Well, he needed a lot of materials for it, so it looked a bit hard. While the forge was working, Kosuke opened his achievements window. There were some new achievements he got, but it would be hard to say what these achievements gave him as a reward. There also appeared more skills he could increase. He used some points to increase his endurance, speed, and shooting skills. Then Sylphie entered the room. Kosuke said hello to her, but she was naked so immediately became blush. She couldn't take it so she ran away. Kosuke was wondering if she just loses her mind every night but then becomes Tsundere back. Kosuke didn't mind. The contrary, he really liked her personality. The breakfast was ready. Silphi made an angry face and told Kosuke to not remind her about their last night. He just agreed. Better to not argue with Silphi when she's in her Sundere mode. She asked him if he finished his work with crafting crossbows. It was time to give them to the guys and girls and then go for some iron ore. They headed to the canyon. There was a good place for mining. Jaghira wanted to test her new crossbow so badly. She took it and rushed to hunt immediately. Well, she never liked using simple bows so having such a cool weapon as a crossbow made her feel really happy. Pilna asked Kosuke to make sure if he could craft a shooting type weapon especially for her. Well, Kosuke had no idea what he could do now sadly but it still needs time to think up something for her wings. Pilna told them she goes into the air to scout the area. She quickly flew away. Now it was time to mine and mine hard. They were waiting for some trick from Kosuke and he pleased them with his new focus. He was jumping and placing the blocks under himself. In the next moment, he ended up at the top of the canyon. Then he put one more block to safely step on the ground. But how did he suppose to mine from that position? Well, Kosuke had an answer for it too. He just started digging blocks like it's just a game. Stone blocks were disappearing one by one. Silphy and Era were just staring at these hella crazy miracles. Silphy wondered if he could just rush the kingdom's walls like that. It actually was true. Then Era told she was going to get some special herbs. Kosuke continued working hard. And after some time, he dug the entire canyon and turned it into a large quarry. He had a lot of iron, stone, and even some mithril. When Ara heard the word mithril, she became excited. Had she heard it right? Kosuke showed her this thing. It was mithril for sure. That looked pretty precious. Even Silphy was excited and told him to not tell anyone about that. Well, now it would be better to hide this material in the inventory. However, Ara wasn't ready to give him this little piece of mithril back. Well, it seemed that she wanted it so bad. Kosuke gave it to her as a present. She was very happy. Pilna and Jaghira came back and were shocked when they saw what happened here. And they got even more surprised after they realized it was done with only Kosuke's powers. Later they came back to the village. Melty met them and asked how it was going. There was news from scouts that Gizmas have entered the forest. It meant that they needed to organize a unit with our light-footed personnel. Danan was thinking the same way. Meanwhile Kosuke was doing something interesting. Ira asked him about this strange thing he was using now. Kosuke told her it's called a brewing stand. He could make some potions with it. Kosuke was going to create some by using the herbs Ira had collected. Then Kosuke opened the craft window to see what he could do now. He was surprised when he realized there was a powder. But there were two ways to craft it. Interesting but also dangerous. He had nothing to say but absurd. Did he just copy-paste Ira? Okay, it's time to craft potions. After some time he made a lot of potions. Era was wondering if it was something useful. There were healing potions, disease potions, and cure poison potions. Ira wanted to know the way it can be used. Kosuke explained to her that he has no idea, but maybe all you need is just to drink it all up and it would work. Ira looked at him suspiciously. She couldn't believe all these potions weren't fake. She ordered Kosuke to give her all the potions he made. Her eye was like a bottomless pit, so Kosuke felt a bit scared and gave her everything she asked for. Today, she was really strange. Well, better to say she was creepy. It was the training time. Danan gave a signal and everyone shot. They were trying hard. Kosuke was chilling under the tree. Silphi came here and asked what he was doing. Kosuke told her there's an interesting thing called a loom. He crafted it quickly and was trying this thing out. He was going to make a lot of clothes. For example, it would be useful for making bandages. Then Silphi realized she wanted to find some new clothes for him. Kosuke smiled. He was surprised she remembered all the details so well. They headed to the warehouse. Their elf friends gladly welcomed them. And of course, Kosuke had a present for these guys. They let them enter the warehouse. 
When they entered, they met a beautiful elf woman. Her name is Risa. Silphy said they need some clothes for Kosuke. Risa said that he can ask her for everything. Then Kosuke used this opportunity and asked her for some glue, leather, and alcohol. She was a bit surprised by such a strange request, but she was glad to help them. While Kosuke was looking for the materials he needed, Silphy found clothes for him. She offered Kosuke to wear it. Then he finally showed up in his new look, Kosuke in elf folk clothes. It looked pretty nice and Kosuke felt great. Risa actually thought it didn't look good enough because of his dark hair. Then she showed him how to wear it right. Then he was ready to continue his work. He looked pretty cool. When Sylphie and Kosuke came back, they saw Ayara. She was looking pretty tired and upset for some reason. Then she told them she tested it all out, and it was strange. These potions had no side effects, at least now, and were working instantly. It was hard to rate such absurd potions normally. Kosuke was puzzled. Then Era explained to him better. She said even if it's that good it may be bad to give it to everyone since they don't know how it works and it may affect their health. Then her face changed in sadness. Era couldn't hold back anymore. She started crying. She realized she was mistaken and apologized for everything she said. Silphie and Kosuke didn't get what was happening and they tried to calm her down. Silphie told him to continue working while they would be talking with Era. Kosuke had a lot of thoughts about Era. She was a very nice girl. Of course, as every court mage, she is pedant and has a specific personality. But what could make her feel bad? Then Silphy asked Kosuke to come here. It seemed that they needed to have a serious talk. Ira told him that she was jealous of his abilities. He understood everything. She was working hard to get at least something useful. And then there appears a guy that can create such a miracle stuff without putting any effort in it. Then it was an obvious reaction. But Ira was apologizing for her behavior since she thought he was just a lucky guy beloved by God. But then she realized he got these abilities in exchange for his previous life. Parents, friends, his home, he lost everything and ended up here. Kosuke said he wasn't angry at her at all, so there were no problems. But he noticed that Sylphie and Melty were a bit sad too. Sylphie said she had a thought she might be jealous of his abilities too. Melty was the same, so they apologized for that. But Kosuke actually hadn't thought too much about that. He was just okay with his new life in another world. Moreover, he got such powerful abilities close to being God's one. He also was still thankful to Silphie for saving his life that day, so he wanted to repay them all by doing goods. They looked at him and realized this world gave them this cool guy. Kosuke was glad to live in this village with them too. Aira was looking way better now. It seemed that she was happy that Kosuke forgave her, then he reached out his hand. She was a bit surprised. Well, she didn't know about his world's manners, so he told it's a handshake, an important ritual for friends. Then, Ira shyly shaked Kosuke's hand. At that moment, everyone felt the atmosphere became very calm and peaceful. He offered others to do the same. This ritual made them all feel way better. Silphy told Kosuke to continue crafting items. Tomorrow, they finally will go for a gizma hunt. At nighttime, Kosuke was in his workshop as usual. Today, Kosuke had a lot of thoughts. This day was very calm. But this incident with Era made him feel worried about his abilities. He was lucky that Era wasn't really jealous and a bad person. If there would be someone else instead of her, he would have been dead already. He even thought about using it less than before. But then Silphie changed his mind. She said his craft abilities are very important for them. Somehow she understood what he was thinking about. She told Kosuke she will protect him from anything so he shouldn't worry about this too much. She was ready to stay on his side no matter what would happen. Kosuke was a bit embarrassed of her words. A girl protects a boy. This world was really strange. Kosuke said he was going to take part in their hunt tomorrow, but they needed to wake up earlier than usual. When it was morning, they were already roaming the forest. Then Kubi noticed something. She told Silphi and Kosuke to stop. Kosuke and Silphi were ready. Kubi looked at the ground in front of them. It was a bit damaged. It meant that gizmas were somewhere nearby. They were going to check it and threw a stick. When it landed there, something huge suddenly blew the ground. The cloud of dust dissolved, and they saw a gizma rushing at them. It was time to fight. The enemy rushed at them. Silphi drew the blade and was going to attack gizmas from behind. Kosuke's strategy was simple. Shoot and run. He was very good at shooting thanks to his superpowers. Kubi and Kosuke shot at once. First blood. But it wasn't enough to kill the monster. The gizma rushed right at Kosuke, but he wasn't going to run away. He had an idea. He did another shot. Kubi told him to retreat, but he was going to face the enemy with his perfect plan. The gizma jumped at Kosuke, but he wasn't a fool. He put the block right in front of the monster, and the gizma's head blew up. No way. That was pretty damn close. And it actually looked a bit disgusting. Well, Kosuke actually wanted to use Mr. Woodspike. They had no idea what he was talking about. By Mr. Woodspike, Kosuke meant this thing, but it was a bit small, so he wasn't sure if it would work. 
Then Kubi told them to continue their way. Their strategy was simple. Kubi was baiting monsters to attack and then Kosuke was using blocks to blow their heads. Meanwhile, Silphie was killing the insects from behind. That was pretty easy. Kosuke was glad his plan worked well. They also upgraded the wall with Mr. Woodspike so the defense was ready too. All the soldiers had crossbows and a lot of arrows. Then Kosuke got an idea. He put some blocks. No one had an idea what he was trying to do. Then he destroyed the first block and... What? Well, never mind. Kosuke just broke physics laws for another time. Everyone expected something like that, but they still were astonished. Now they understood Ira's feelings. They couldn't stop getting surprised. The hunt was in full swing. Then Kubi stopped. She heard a group of gizmas is coming right here and there might be a lot. Kubi, Silphie, and Kosuke headed to the place where the sound was. There might be three or four or even more enemies. Then Kubi pointed forward. The squirrel girl and the snake girl with the lizard girl on her back were running away from gizmas. The enemies almost caught them. The situation was really bad. Then the squirrel girl, Nark, jumped at the tree and baited the enemies to attack her instead. They needed to save the lizard girl since she was injured hard. The enemy struck the tree so hard that Nark lost balance and started falling down. Sylphie noticed her at the right moment. She gave a command to Kubi and Kosuke to shoot properly. They immediately shot at once. Sylphie chopped off the insect's head easily. Then she was going to help those ones. The snake girl was running away. It was really close. Then Kosuke drew another arrow and shot into the enemy. He told her to calm down and stand here. The moment the gizma jumped at Kosuke, he put the block in front of his head. The insect got hit but didn't die. Kosuke drew an arrow again and shot into the insect. Good. Kubi and Nark shot at once and killed the last gizma here. They did such a nice job. Well done. They felt okay except the lizard girl. She was injured hard as we know. She broke her leg so badly that you can feel her pain while looking at it. Then Kosuke realized he had all the stuff to repair her bones quickly. Aira rated his medicine level as very high so he was very confident in what he was about to do. Kosuke took her leg and told to not move. Then he used the potion to wash the wound. It was painful. Then it was time to use the splint. He never tried to do that, but he remembered that all he needs to do is to think about that like it's a game. There appeared a button, Use. He pressed it, and then his body started doing all the work by itself. No way. The lizard girl was shocked by how better she started feeling herself. Her leg was getting better and better by every second. And then after a few seconds, the splint disappeared and the lizard's leg was repaired successfully. Then he offered her to take a healing potion for the prophylactics. The snake girl had no words to describe her feelings at that moment. And when the lizard woke up and started walking normally, all of them lost their mind. What the heck was that? The lizard girl bowed down and thanked Kosuke for help. Without his help, she could lose her leg forever. Kosuke told her to not move too much since he wasn't sure if the healing process was finished. She lost a lot of blood so it would be better to take care of herself. Then they started counting their frags. 10, 11, 12, 13. They killed 13 gizmas. That's a lot. After that, they headed back to the village. When they came back, they met Danan. He asked if those crossbows were working well against the enemies. Everyone proved that. They were doing a hit-and-run strategy, but it was still hard to fight against them since they needed more strength. For everyone's safety, Sylphie offered to gather in six-member groups. Danan absolutely agreed. Then Danan immediately headed to tell the information about new formations. Kosuke noticed that Danan had some problems with his leg. Kosuke asked him to wait. He asked him to sit down and sham him his leg. First he wanted to go, but others told him to calm down and wait for some time. Then Kosuke took a splint. Danan was surprised. What was he about to do? He was sure it wouldn't work. It shouldn't work at all. Were they thinking he was such an idiot? He was yelling at them to stop, but when the process of healing started, he realized there was a miracle happening right now. Everyone just smiled. And when the healing process ended, Danan realized he didn't feel any pain. What the heck was that? Then Kosuke told him to drink up the healing potion. After that, Danan felt way, way better than before. It was even tasty. He tried to move his leg and was amazed. What a nice feeling to move your limbs with no pain. He couldn't believe it was for real. He felt like the fairies were just laughing at him now. He walked away with the words, I must repay you for that. They saw Danan smile. That's a rare thing. So, they have a cool doctor named Kosuke-san. He didn't expect it to work that good. Then Sylphie ordered them to call Melty. When Melty came here, she saw a lot of Gizma's meat. That's a really lot. Well, she was strong, so it wasn't hard for her to transport all this stuff to the warehouse. But Sylphie had a better idea. To keep all this meat in Kosuke's inventory. Well, he wasn't happy with her idea, but he had no choice. Today, they were going to give some meat to civilians since they had a lot. Then Melty asked him to take it into his inventory. Well, he was happy that Melty wasn't his master. In that case, he would have died from fatigue.
After some time, Kosuke made a place where he was repairing civilians' bones like a professional doctor. When Era saw it, she was amazed. She entered the tent to check what was happening, and she was shocked when she saw the process with her own eyes. She wanted to help Kosuke with that. There was a rabbit girl with broken leg. Ira did some work and... Nothing happened. Nothing changed. There were no reasons to use splint. Then Kosuke asked Era to let him do something. There was a button, use. Once he pressed it, the process of healing immediately started. The rabbit immediately felt something started happening. Ira had no words to say. When Kosuke looked at her face, he saw her amazed like she was looking at a miracle. He decided to leave her in that state. Absurd! This time everyone's reaction was like that. But it doesn't mean they weren't happy. The contrary. The more Kosuke can do with his powers, the better the situation in the village. Later, the warriors were coming back from hunt, and thanks God there were no injured ones among them. So now they needed to think up what to do next. Silphie was worrying if it's a good idea to take Kosuke for their hunt on Gizmas. No one wanted his death. Kosuke had some ideas about the defense and was ready to take part in upgrading it instead of going for hunt which is dangerous. There was a chance that the fight might start at the nighttime, which is not good since they have no lights. So, Kosuke was going to solve this problem. And now everyone expected something crazy from him again. Kosuke put the torch on the block. That was his plan. To install the light everywhere. It might work, so why not? They were trying to understand how this torch was standing on this block without any support. But that was another Kosuke's strange ability. Sylphie said she didn't want to cut too much trees, but Kosuke convinced her they have no choice, and anyway, this part of the forest will be destroyed after the Gizma's attack. Sylphie gave up on that point and they started working. It was almost night, but it wasn't dark. Kosuke had done with everything he wanted. All the territory was lighted with the torches. Sylphie was sad that they destroyed too much trees today. Well, the defense near the walls was upgraded very well, and now no one monster would be able to break through it. Then Kubi asked Kosuke why these torches were that strange, like the fire was kinda everlasting. Sylphie didn't surprise. It looks like she stopped getting surprised at some point. Ira was staring at this miracle. She felt like she was getting in contact with something transcendent. Then Sylphie told the guards watch the walls during all the night. Kosuke looked at the moon. He was wondering why it has red color, but Sylphie didn't notice anything strange. Ira didn't notice it too, but Kosuke was sure it's red, and it meant only one. The bloodbath is coming. The soldiers were ready to shoot the enemy. The gizmas rushed into attack. Once they saw the insects, they shot. The rain of arrows fell on the monsters. They couldn't do anything. Kosuke was watching the scene from the wall. He was glad his defense was working that nice. Jagira was really happy to use such a nice weapons and thanked Kosuke for making it for them. There were a lot of gizmas attacking them, but they were dying faster than getting close to the walls. And even if they would get closer, they would fall into the trap with Mr. Wood Spikes. They were shooting really fast. Kosuke was wondering how strong they are. Jagira said they have a very strong bodies, so even if they would use the improved version of crossbow, they wouldn't get tired of shooting. Kosuke started thinking about making more of it. Danan was giving orders to the guards. They were doing fire right by his commands. It was easy to shoot the enemy despite it was nighttime, thanks to Kosuke that he lighted the territory. They maybe don't even need elders' help. They were doing very well by themselves. Then Melty came to Kosuke to say that they have not much arrows left. Well, by simple maths, he realized that the amount of arrows they had was enough only for 10 minutes maximum. So he gave them some more arrows. Well, Melty was surprised to see that much. It would be enough now. Then he saw Jaghira reached out her hand. Kosuke realized she was standing nearby him just because she wanted to shoot more than others. Well, it wasn't bad. Kosuke asked Melty how much the gizma's meat is stored. Melty answered it usually takes half of the day to go bad. Then Kosuke decided to collect some meat. Yes, right at the battlefield. Crazy guy. Jagira was ready to help him with that. Kosuke headed to the command post. Danan asked him what happened. Then Kosuke told him his idea. Danan said they need to take some melee fighters for that. And Gelda was ready to help with that. But her sword? Well, it was quite bad. She was too strong for such weak weapons, so it was getting bad really quickly. Kosuke realized he can make a special weapon for her. She requested a powerful mace with a huge shield. Kosuke headed to the forge. He was looking for something looking like the mace, but there was nothing similar. Then he tried to imagine it properly and the mace suddenly appeared in the craft window. That wasn't too hard to make it. Then he made a huge shield. But Kosuke also wanted to make some kind of weapon for himself. He had some ideas. When Silphy heard that Kosuke was about to enter the battlefield, she started getting worried for his life. Kosuke gave Gelda her new equipment. She was very happy swinging her long mace, which actually looked small in her hands. Kosuke got a bit tired of just holding it. He gave it to Silphie and she was swinging it easily like a wooden stick. He was wondering how powerful this girl is. 
Danan and others gathered near the gates. He introduced his best soldiers. The reptile, Zumiru, Donan was her disciple, Lord Leonard, a swordsmanship master, and the big girl named Sumeru, a true death machine. She was glad to meet Kosuke. These soldiers will help Kosuke to collect the Gizma's meat safely. Era was about to help him too. He never saw her magic, so it will be for the first time. Sylphie and Kosuke looked at each other. It meant they were ready. Everyone was ready. A powerful, unbeatable squad was going to kill all the enemies and protect Kosuke from them. They opened the gates. It's gonna be epic. Kosuke and others left outside. There were no monsters around, so they quickly got all the Gizma's meat. Kosuke's new friend still couldn't get used to his abilities. Sumiru was wondering if it was some rare kind of magic, but to her surprise, Danan said it's not like that. Even if it was a special type of magic, she liked him. Kosuke felt embarrassed when they were talking about him that much. The lizard master Zamiru told them to not be careless. The monsters could come here at any moment. Gerda agreed, but she didn't worry about that at all, since she had a new powerful weapon thanks to Kosuke. Zamiru was jealous of her. She wanted a new weapon too. Zamiru asked Danan if his cool weapon was made by Kosuke too. He told her that Kosuke was a great blacksmith. Kosuke noticed she was staring at him. It was easy to guess what she wanted to ask him. Leonardo also wanted to upgrade his swords. Sumeru was fighting just with a large wooden log. Everyone wanted to get strong blades and axes and of course they were staring at Kosuke at that moment. He looked at Sylphie. Maybe she would spare him? How naively. So, Kosuke told them to just wait for a while. He would make it for them. But first, he needed them to say what kind of weapon they wanted to see. Suddenly, they heard a loud scream from the forest side. It was easy to guess who it was. What they're gonna do? Run back to the walls or take the fight right here. Leonardo told everyone to not be afraid that much. They were ready to slice the enemy or smash. Depends on what weapon they use. Sylphie told Kosuke to not worry about this and just continue collecting meat. So, let's go. The fight is gonna be epic. The monsters were coming. Kosuke was fine with the fact that everyone felt pretty calm. The craft Avengers entered the battle. Danan made first blood and parted the insect's head like a melon. Gerda was stunning enemies with shields and then blowing their heads. Yes, like a melon's. It was Leonardo's time to shine. He was ready to attack. Then he rushed forward and sliced the Gizma's body like if he was a true samurai. Zamiru was making highlights too, and Sumeru, well, that was pretty cruel. Can't even tell you anything about this. It's just the power of Oni. Suddenly, they saw a light coming from the side. It was Era's magic. She was casting a powerful thunderbolt spell. And then, lightning. The entire battlefield was covered in thunderbolts. Zeus nervously smokes on the sidelines. Kosuke was amazed. Was it the real power of magic? It's incredible. Sylphie realized that had never seen any magic before. So it was his first time. Understandable. Well, the only time he had seen it was when Sylphie recovered his wounds, but Era's magic was something transcendent. It's epic! Era was glad to see them praising her. At that moment, Kosuke realized that there were a lot of interesting and cool guys and girls, so why was everyone astonished by his abilities? Sylphie just gave him a clear answer. Everyone who was training a lot can do this. The Gizma's head was perfectly chopped off. Kosuke thought she was just joking with him. So then everyone here was more interesting than him. Well, it was understandable. He was amazed by his fighting skills and they were shocked by his craft abilities. That was fair enough. Okay, now Kosuke needs to continue his job. They finished with the monsters, so it was time to go back to the village. This night was especially great. They did everything they planned pretty well. 216 Gizma's corpses, that's a lot. Everyone will be happy to know they have that much food. Moreover, it gets really tasty when you cook it. Leonardo wanted to hunt for more meat. But well, first he needed to get his new blades. Everyone wanted that from Kosuke, and of course he couldn't refuse. Sumeru already knew what she wanted, something huge and heavy, and Sylphie wanted something long. The hint was obvious, and unfortunately Kosuke got that. I hope you didn't. Then someone touched his shoulder. It was Ira. She wanted to get a magic rod with the mithril stone, but Kosuke wasn't sure if he would be able to do that now. First he needed a craft instruction. Ira was pretty fast since she wanted to get her new weapon as much as everyone else. Well, now Kosuke was ready to listen to their wishes. They were waiting for it, and after they told Kosuke everything, there was only Sylphie left. But she said she would be fine with everything he would make for her. But Kosuke wanted to get more description of the weapon she wanted. She decided it would be something sharp, something like scimitar. Some time later Kosuke was working hard in the forge. He got an idea to make a weapon made of mithril. It would be nice. Then he put some mithril to the furnace. It was the ninth day of Kosuke's survival game. Pilna came to Sylphie with good news. There were no gizmas around. It seemed that tonight's battle showed them who was the real ruler in these lands. It seemed they got away right at dawn. More good news. Leonardo, Zamiru, and Sumeru got their new weapons. Wait, this one is really strange. Never mind, it still looks powerful enough. Sad they couldn't test it out right now. 
Kosuke was glad to see their happiness. And there was a special one for Sylphie. She almost forgot that she was asking him about that. He was making it for six hours. She immediately realized what it was. Once she drew the blade, everyone instantly got shocked. A mithril blade. So beautiful. Sylphie asked if he gave a name for this weapon. Kosuke actually didn't think about that. But while he was making it, he was thinking of the moon. So maybe something like Moonlight or Blue Moon? No. Pale Moon. Pale Moon sounds great. It was as beautiful as the blade by itself. What emotions. Ira was wondering how strange it was to get a mithril blade that was made by a human. But mithril weapons actually always were only for royal family members. Wait, how did she appear here so unexpectedly? She brought here a craft recipe for the magic rod. Then Sylphie asked Kosuke to bring the Gizma's corpse right here. She wanted to test her new blade out. He quickly pulled it out of his inventory. Sylphie swung the blade and it easily got right through the Gizma. Everyone was staring at how Gizma's body was getting separated by little pieces. Epic. But well, it might be dangerous to use such a sharp blade. She needed to get more training to not accidentally chop off her own limbs. Leonardo and Zamiru offered Her Majesty to train with them later. Kosuke had been working hard all this time so now he wanted to go to rest. Kosuke put some things to craft and sat down. Suddenly he remembered about the achievements window. Maybe something interesting appeared here. His stats were pretty good. He had 12 skill points so he could increase something he needed the most. He didn't want to think too much and just did it quickly. Well, what about achievements? He had a lot of things done at the moment, and most of them were new. Most of them were about killing monsters, doing something for the first time, and etc. And all the buffs were pretty cool, so nice. And of course, there were some achievements he didn't expect to see. He got more than five girls in his harem and the achievement god noticed it. Kosuke didn't even guess that he had seduced that many girls. Moreover, he hadn't known about that. And once he imagined it, he realized how huge his harem might be at the moment. There might be even those elven elders. No, better to not think about that. He already had relationships with Sylphie so he could think about such things. There also was another interesting achievement. He survived the Red Moon Knight, and for that now he was able to upgrade his skills level. It looked interesting. Tonight, Kosuke told Sylphie that their village may be attacked every week. It was pretty possible looking at what kind of abilities he has. She said she would tell the elders about his words. They could trust them and they, of course, would help with resources. Kosuke thanked Sylphie for being so kind. She said it was just for their kingdom and, of course, to make him work less. He was trying hard all the time, so it would be nice to have more free time. Then Kosuke said he needed to go to make a magic rod for Ira. But suddenly, Sylphie grabbed his hand. He turned around to say something, but she suddenly kissed him. She didn't like him talking about other girls in her presence. Kosuke apologized for being like that, but now she was too excited to stop. She was going to punish a bad slave. Then she suddenly grabbed him and headed to the bedroom. After the punishment night, Kosuke felt embarrassed. It was so bad to remember. Sylphie told him to wake up. It was time to go. It seemed she felt good after the night adventures. Eleventh day. Kosuke was working hard, and twelfth and thirteenth were funny and hard too. The more they were working, the more powerful their little empire was getting. And finally. On the fifteenth day of the survival, they were prepared for the Red Moon Night. However, the moon was still normal. From what Pilna said, there were no gizmas around the forest. Even in the desert, they hadn't noticed them too much. Kosuke noticed that the moon was especially beautiful tonight. Sylphie agreed with him. She wanted to see the blue moonlight, but she was fine with this one too. Well, it seemed that there was no red moon this time and it wouldn't happen in the near future, but it didn't mean that their hard work was useless. Anyway, it was worth it since in the end, they have a really powerful fort that could destroy any enemy's attack. And Kosuke easily guessed that Sylphie wanted to get her kingdom back. It wasn't hard to guess. She was thinking of it from the beginning, and to her surprise, Kosuke didn't mind helping her. Moreover, he wanted to make their relationship stronger. She was really surprised by his words, but they still weren't strong enough to handle the entire kingdom. Anyway, Kosuke was kinda calm. He was confident in the fort they had built. Even Sylphie got calm while listening to his speech. He was just an optimistic guy. Then she thought a bit and made an important decision. She was going to bring the kingdom back. Kosuke saw the pure determination in her eyes, Everyone was astonished by what Sylphie said at their next meeting. No one expected it. Well, at least that quickly. But everyone also agreed it was time to do something. Getting their kingdom back was just a matter of time. The saint bastards must be kicked out from their homeland. However, they knew they couldn't bring it back that easily. They still had not enough power. But they had a trump card. Kosuke. Of course he was going to help them. Kosuke at that moment realized that all his life here was so epic he didn't notice it lasted just for a few weeks. A month ago he was sitting at his home and now he, Kosuke, was going to the Omit Desert to build up the fort here. 
Kosuke made a little landmark to not forget where they were. They had a goal to build a base here. Kosuke made eight marks here. Now it was time to find the best place for building. They have come a long way from the village. Maybe it would take 10 days to come back there. There's a map of the territory. You can take a better look at it if you want. Suddenly, Leonardo put his hand on Kosuke's shoulder and said that he would be happy if he would make a mithril sword especially for him. Zamiru got mad at him because he was asking that straightly with no excuse. Of course, she wanted it too. Their sight was so demonic that Kosuke couldn't handle it. But then a very loud, explosive sound distracted them so they looked back. It was a new Kosuke's weapon. So cool. But well, Kosuke told her to not shoot too much since they had not many bullets. No one liked this weapon actually since it was pretty loud, but it was effective enough to use it. Gizma just died by one shot. Silphy told Kosuke to take the monster's meat to the inventory. Leonardo asked Silphy about the place where they should build their base. Silphy pointed towards a little hill. It looked like the highest point in this desert. Their choice was logical, so Kosuke agreed with them and started preparing for building. But first they needed to prepare a camp to sleep tonight. Kosuke started doing his job. First he needed to make the landscape flat. It was done pretty quick. By the way, he unlocked a new ability. Now he can place four blocks at once. It looked crazy. Silphy even forgot how to get surprised. She expected everything but not something like this. And after a few minutes, the entire house was done. Too quick. Now it was time to build the walls. Well, Kosuke had really crazy abilities, which cannot be explained even by magic. He was working two, no, three more times quicker than usual. How can it be possible? Well, one day they will realize that in this world, everything is possible. Kosuke made the walls in a few minutes. Now they don't need to be afraid of monsters. No one expected it to be that quick, so they had a lot of free time. Silphy told everyone to take a better look at the walls outside and tell her if they would find any problem with it. Then Kosuke started making stairs. Of course, they needed to get on the walls somehow. He noticed that someone was staring at him just now. It was obviously Leonardo and Zamiru. They wanted to get their mithril blades so much, so Kosuke just tried to run away from them. They started chasing him. He was faster than they expected him to be, and of course he used all his abilities to get rid of them, but it seemed that he got trapped himself. Leonardo and Zamiru were smiling cruelly. There was nothing good in their words. Kosuke told them that he didn't want to do anything with Mithril anymore without Silphy's permission, so he told them to ask her about that if they want their weapons that much. Then Pilna appeared right here. She told Kosuke that she came here to save his life. He was happy to hear that. However, there was a condition. She was ready to help him only if he would make a weapon especially for her. That was pretty unfair. And fortunately for Kosuke, Silphy finally appeared here. She had a lot of questions for them. What was going on? And once she realized this mess was happening because of Kosuke, she struck him hard in the stomach. Painful. Then Leonardo and Zamiru asked Silphy straightly to let Kosuke make mithril weapons especially for them. Silphy sighed. She was glad they were helping them, but she couldn't let it be like that. Mithril weapons are especially strong and serious, really serious, so there should have been a reason for making it for them. But well, now they were in a different situation, so why not? Silphy said she didn't mind if he would make it for them. But in exchange, they must protect Kosuke all the time. It's important. Silphy told Kosuke to make mithril weapons for them. Leonardo and Zamiru were very happy. Kosuke also didn't mind if they really would become his securities, so he said yes. But there also was Pilna. She looked sad, and Kosuke had some cool news to raise her mood. He made a special weapon for harpies. Pilna immediately resurrected from depression. But what was this weapon? It looked like a melee thing, but it wasn't like that at all. Kosuke was going to show them everything, so he told them to gather on the wall. A strong explosion astonished everyone. That was amazing. Pilna was excited. She wanted to try it out immediately. Kosuke said it's called a grenade. He showed them how to use it. Just throw it and boom. So nice. Explosion feels pretty strong. Kosuke told Pilna to be careful with it. She was happy to get a weapon she and other harpies could use. Pilna was going to test it out. She flew out far enough and then threw the grenade. That's epic. Then she got an idea how to throw it in different ways, and it worked very well. She got used to it quickly. The wooden logs were blowing so hard their sharp parts were going through other logs. Pilna was glad her new weapon works that great. It looked like something really powerful. Now they have a really hard advantage on the battlefield. Kosuke praised Pilna. She was doing really well with her wings. Then Kosuke asked Silphy what she was thinking of it. She looked thoughtful. Kosuke asked her if everything was okay, and she immediately came back to Earth, and of course they needed to eat something. They hadn't eaten anything for a long time. It was almost night, so they needed to cook dinner fast. All the group gathered near Kosuke's craft place. He was making food quickly. It was burgers, his world's tasty food. They agreed it looks tasty, and the taste actually was great. Thanks to God they have Kosuke. 
Then after the dinner, Silfi told Kosuke to tell them about today's plan. He said that he wanted Jagira and Pilna do something important. Then he put a lot of ammo on the table. He asked Jagira to shoot as much as she wanted. He just needed to check the durability of the rifle, something like a crash test. But it might be dangerous since there is a chance the rifle can explode if she will be shooting too much. But it didn't stop Jagira. Her eyes lit up with fire. She grabbed the rifle and rushed forward. It seemed that she had a lot of fun with it. Then Kosuke gave Pilna a case full of grenades. He asked her to test it out too. Well, now it was time to continue working on their base. While Pilna was preparing for the test, Kosuke was building more and more. Leonardo and Silfi were wondering how crazy his abilities are. And after a few minutes, he finished another building. So they have 20 barracks for now. That's great. He made it big enough so they can put around 16 people here. And if there's 20 barracks, then they can gather 320 people here. It sounds pretty nice. Then Kosuke realized he almost forgot to do something important. He started digging holes, yes, for toilets. He was a big fan of sanitation. Kosuke didn't even want to disagree with this fact. It was important to keep your place and yourself clean. Silfi and Leonardo agreed it's true. So he quickly dug some holes and started placing toilets. He did it really quickly and it looks nice, but it was not much. They needed more of it. After he finished his job with toilets, he immediately started working on the well. It's important to have a water source, especially if you are in the desert. So he did everything like in the game and he got what he wanted. He found a little water source. That's nice. So it was time to go back. He did a very hard job. So now they have four wells at their base. That should be enough. Silfi surprised Kosuke by the fact she can check the water's quality by using magic. Kosuke also noticed there were no trees and grass for some reason. This place was full of water for sure. So what was going on? Silfi told him the story of this place. Some magicians were trying the spirit stone magic out too much here and in the end it caused this hard dried climate. Kosuke wasn't happy with this news. He heard about the spirit stone a bit. It might be dangerous for them. Suddenly Kosuke remembered another thing he should have done. Leonardo was wondering what this guy was trying to do this time. And as you can guess, it was going to be a mini farm. Leonardo looked at the dirt better and realized how good it is. He just took some dirt from the forest and brought it here. He said they need at least three days until the harvest would grow. Then he picked up a hoe and started working hard. Well, should I say they kept getting surprised? I guess no, but they almost got used to this irrationality. After a few minutes, Kosuke finished his job. Now it was time to put some seeds there. And after a few seconds, they already could see some sprouts growing. They had no idea what was going on. It was impossible to explain, but Kosuke also needed to put some water here to get his harvest more quickly, so he started building another well here. He put two blocks of water there and got an infinite water source. Well, he couldn't explain to them how he did it. He didn't know either. And it seems that they already figured out its infinity. So Kosuke just told them it's just a strange well and nothing else. It was an answer to all their questions. Then Jaghira came back to tell Kosuke she finished shooting all the ammos. Jaghira noticed Silfi was looking a bit thoughtful. Well, she couldn't explain to her what happened. She didn't even know how to tell about it and not look crazy in people's eyes. Jaghira had shot all the 500 ammos and didn't notice any problem with this rifle. It was shooting as good as before. Kosuke was a bit surprised. He didn't expect it to be that good. Well, anyway, he had a new weapon for her, just to be careful with it. Jaghira was happy to take this gift. Anyway, they have no problems with weapons for now. But well, maybe Kosuke's craft abilities made the rifle unbreakable or something like that. When Pilna came back, she was astonished to see a vegetable garden here. How quickly he did that. She was outside for just a few hours. Moreover, it was already growing. That's incredible. Well, okay. Kosuke wanted to ask Pilna how the test was. She said she found a way to bring more grenades at one time. There was around 5 kilos. Kosuke asked her if it wasn't too much for her. Pilna said it's okay. She was a strong girl in the end. Kosuke realized it's a pretty cool way to use grenades. Kosuke was looking like he was going to create an atomic bomb and give it to harpies to throw it down on the enemy. Silfi looked pensive for some reason. Kosuke asked her what they needed to do next. She was away with the fairies today, so she got a bit off guard when she heard his question. So she offered to have lunch first and then think about it better. That was a nice idea. After the lunch, they decided to divide by pairs. Jaghira with Pilna and Leonardo with Zamiru should do some scout work. Kosuke and Silfi were going to make more weapons. All of them got their tasks. They still needed to do a lot of work today. When they walked away, Kosuke immediately put the craft table here and forgery. It was time to make some bombs for harpies. All he needed was to imagine the image of the item he wanted to create. And then the craft recipe of the bomb appeared in the window. Well, 10 bombs would be enough for the first time. Then it was time to upgrade the rifles. Then Silfi suddenly addressed Kosuke. It seemed that she wanted to ask Kosuke about something important, and it was making her feel bad. 
She was worried if he felt good about his new job. He was living his normal life before and now he was making the military stuff every day. That was looking kinda sad for Silphy. However, Kosuke didn't even think about it too much. As he said before, he got used to his new life quickly and moreover it feels better than his previous one. He was glad with his new life and had a lot of fun here even if he needs to work hard every day. Well, maybe he found himself in it. The only thing that might make him feel bad was the deaths that would happen soon because of his weapons. He was the one who brought the military stuff in this world so all the deaths will lay on his shoulders. Maybe he will be sent to hell by God. Wait, the hell? Silphy wasn't familiar with the religion stuff so Kosuke told her about it a bit. Hell is the place where people who break God's law suffer hard forever. Well of course there's no proof of hell's existence but still everything in this world could be possible. Silphy realized it's similar to the underworld. People in this world believe that every dead person goes to the sky and turns into a star that shines bright every night. It sounds romantic. Then Silphy added, if hell exists for real then she would go there together with Kosuke. She didn't want to let him go there alone. He had no idea whether he should be happy with that or not. Maybe the demons would make him suffer less than it usually does Silphy, and especially Melty. So maybe hell isn't that bad a place as he thought. Then Silphy took his hand and told him that she would never let him suffer alone. Kosuke was about to start crying from the fact his mistress was such a kind person. So, it means he must do his best now. Maybe God would spare his soul after life. He didn't do these weapons just to kill for no reason. In the end, they wanted to save their brethren from the slavery and kick the enemy's asses out of their kingdom's walls. Kosuke absolutely agreed with Silphy's words. To beat evil, you must become a bit evil too. And anyway, it would be better to just kill them all with no mercy, isn't it? Silphy didn't even want to argue, so true. But anyways, first he wanted to show those bastards their real military power so they would understand it's better to not get in a conflict with them. Silphy agreed. Their current plan was about hit-and-run strategy. It should cause the right effect. Harpies would attack their fort by using bombs, and if they would try to attack them too, then they would get a warm welcome with crossbows and grenades, and Kosuke was glad to present his new explosive weapon, a landmine. It blows once you touch the thread. It sounds dangerous, so Silphy didn't really like it. Kosuke agreed it might be pretty much even for their situation. And then Kosuke put an interesting thing on the ground. It was TNT, a dynamite. They'll win the fight. It can be very helpful if used right. Kosuke still hadn't tested it out, so he wanted to see how it works somewhere far. Silphy offered him to ask Era to cast fire from a far distance to blow this thing up. Kosuke already had an idea how they could use it. They can build a trap base, first they let the enemy's army enter the fort and then they do a big boom. And that's it. Even Silphy was surprised by his cruelty, it sounded like a compliment actually. She reminded him that he still didn't upgrade the rifle. Kosuke thought about it, but who needs a rifle now if he made something better and he was going to show it right now. There were four different types of guns. Pistol, revolver, rifle, and shotgun. Silphy wanted to take a better look at it. It was heavier than it actually looked. Kosuke showed her how to shoot. First, take the right stance. Second, aim. And then, fire. Revolver and pistol are used to shoot from short distances. In Kosuke's world, people always fight by using guns. They forgot about melee weapon types, but Silphy was wondering how she would be supposed to reload it during the fight. Well, Kosuke didn't actually think about it, since in his world, no one tries to attack into melee a man holding a gun. Then Silphy took a shotgun. It was pretty cool. Kosuke took a rifle. First, Silphy didn't get what was the difference between them both. Kosuke told her that the shotgun can shoot a bunch of bullets at once. It's actually a weapon that is used for a close distance. Then Kosuke offered her to go to the walls. He had some more weapons to set up there. First, it was a huge crossbow called a ballista. It's a huge crossbow for sure, and it launches huge arrows that can break any armor. The mechanism was pretty tight to use. The arrow was actually looking like a spear. Kosuke put an arrow there and loaded it. To launch the arrow, you need to use this lever. Kosuke did a shot for a test. Well, it just broke the stone for real. Such a crazy strength. Silphy was surprised. But there was one more thing that was about to surprise her. It was a cannon. It's like a huge gun that shoots huge bullets. You need to load a cannonball inside it and fire it. Powder explodes and the cannon does a shot. Easy. But Kosuke needs a lot of iron to create cannonballs. Sad that it's impossible to create more of it. And well, he wasn't really sure if they needed too many guns since this world has magic which looks way more powerful than anything else. Maybe it was the reason why people didn't want to invent more technological weapons like this one. He loaded a cannonball inside the cannon and did a shot. Boom. It was pretty loud. Silphy was astonished by how powerful it was. She had no words to say. It also blows when it lands and it means that there are little iron shards that can strike everyone standing nearby. That's a really strong gun. 
Well, the only thing they could create massively was only Ballista. Sylphie actually liked that revolver thing, it looked pretty cool and it fit her very well. He even tried to imagine her as a cowboy. Suddenly, Leonard and Zamiru ran up here. They got scared of that explosion so they thought that something dangerous was happening here. Others came here too. Well, they were on alert so of course any loud sound may scare them. Kosuke apologized for that, then he demonstrated to them his new guns that shoot that loudly. Jagira and Pilna were amazed, it's so cool. But Leonard and Zamiru didn't like only one thing about it. They didn't feel the warrior spirit in it. All the meaning of men's power of will and spirit in a fight would just disappear when this thing would appear on the battlefield. Then Leonard challenged Kosuke and asked him to shoot him with a pistol. Kosuke was afraid that he would reflect all the bullets for sure. But Leonardo looked pretty confident so Kosuke took a pistol and shot. Strike. All the bullets fell on the ground. They were sliced in two parts. Kosuke thought he ended up in an anime. It seemed that these weapons weren't a problem for them all. Beast's physical abilities were way above Kosuke's expectations. Sylphie also thought she wouldn't lose to a soldier with a pistol. Kosuke was wondering if there was a reason for making such weapons like this one. Well, they didn't think that way at all. And besides, they didn't mind using it in exchange if it would carry them to win. The only thing Sylphie was worried about was the Holy Kingdom. It would be really bad if they would get these guns. Kosuke even thought he made a mistake. Well, they decided to leave him alone for now. Kosuke was thinking of how to avoid the fight and get their kingdom back. Then Pilna suddenly addressed Kosuke. There was a harvest. They could collect it right now. What nice news. Kosuke almost forgot about that, so they wouldn't have any problems with food then. Five days later, they came back to the village with a lot of good news. They made a base with a strong defense and a lot of weapons. Moreover, they can live there since Kosuke had built enough barracks for people there. The villagers had no words to say. That was surprisingly great news. Now most of the refugees and Sylphie's family are still captured in slavery. That's why she was doing so much work with people here. They still were weak because they had not many soldiers. Besides, they have no goal to turn the kingdom into a bloodbath. It wouldn't be good. So she had another plan for that. They were going to the Omit Desert and would continue building more forts there. They needed more power. That's what they needed the most now. Sylphie also wanted to sneakily free the refugees from slavery and bring them to their forts. That's how she planned to increase their army. She made this plan a few days ago with Kosuke and others. The best way would be playing hit-and-run strategy. Once the knights will try to attack them, they will just take their guns and shoot them all. The first step would be bringing at least 50 people to their fort to test it all out. And so how many forts do you want to build? Danan asked Sylphie. She replied that it would be at least three forts in the end. First fort for the communication with elves, second would be their main base, and third would be as a defensive base in front. They have a nice image of how it looks. The defensive fort wouldn't be too far away from the kingdom to be closer to the enemy, it should be situated in the middle of Omit Desert. Danan understood their idea and besides, Kosuke made a lot of strong weapons that would give them a very high advantage in battle. However, they still need more people, and Sylphite told them how they planned to free the slaves from the kingdom one by one. Danan was afraid that they were going to let them go with no food and clothes. Sylphie told him there's nothing to worry about since they have Kosuke. He can make a camp for them and give them anything they would need. So the plan sounded pretty solid, and there were no problems, at least at the current point. Sylphie was pretty confident it would work. Then Melty asked Sylphie about the way Kosuke works with the harvest. Once he heard Melty was asking something about him, he got scared. It's going to be really bad for him as always. Of course, Sylphie did it intentionally. She didn't even look at him. That's cruel. I would say she was just trolling him. So, Kosuke pulled out some haystacks from his inventory. Melty was very surprised to hear that they got a harvest in just a few days. Her sight was terrifying. Kosuke explained it to her as much as he could. It was still hard to imagine he could do almost everything that quick. Melty understood him. And anyway, it was still such a miracle he got that much harvest from just one field. And all the crops were very high quality. Just in three days, he might be Jesus. And she quickly realized how she could exploit him, as always. Kosuke noticed Ira was looking at him. Well, no, she was looking into nowhere. Before, she couldn't even imagine it's possible to get a harvest that quickly, even with a special potion. And here appears a guy that does it without any magic stuff or anything else. What a mess. Still hard to get used to it. Sylphie asked them if they had any more questions to ask. It seemed that no one had any questions left. Except our Oni girl. Sumeru wanted to make sure if they hadn't planned kicking the Holy Kingdom's asses up. Well, Sylphie didn't want to turn it into a bloodbath, but at the same time, they shouldn't just sit down and wait. Her Majesty planned to do a clean job, and for that, they needed to free all the slaves first. So, Sumeru was glad to hear that. She was glad with the current plan. The meeting had ended at that point. 
Sylphie and her people were going to get their homeland back at any cost. What determination. Kosuke was in a good mood today. He couldn't even imagine what would happen next. He knew it's going to be a hard and maybe long war against the kingdom. So, it's going to be especially interesting. Three days later, Sylphie got 50 people, and they headed to the Omit Desert. On the same day, they reached their first base. And then three days later, after Kosuke finished working with Fields, they headed to the middle of the desert. And after half day of their way, Kosuke finally found a good place for a camp. They didn't have much time until the sunset, so they should have been working fast. Kosuke quickly made the walls around. His friends didn't know about his abilities, so they were shocked. Well, Era was kind of used to it already, so her reaction was calm, and after some time, Kosuke built up the entire base. It was incredibly quick. All the professional builders were crying in a corner from sadness after seeing that. Kosuke also put a new building there, a water storage tank, and he also made bathrooms for boys and for girls. Later, they were chilling there. What a great end of the day. Kosuke couldn't even imagine it was possible to make something like this in a dry desert. Silphi and Sumeru were very happy and they had a lot of fun with this stuff. They thanked Kosuke for such a great gift. Taking a bath in the desert, isn't it a dream? Suddenly someone addressed Kosuke. It was a furry man, at first he didn't recognize him, but then realized it was his old friend Kubi. I apologize, I called him a girl in previous parts, well, it just happens sometimes. Kubi asked Kosuke to help him wash his back since he couldn't do that by himself. He didn't mind helping him with that, and don't worry, there was no hidden subtext. This is just a party of true men. It was time to explore the desert better. This territory looked pretty well for their new base, but Silphy felt strange like something was wrong here. Then Ira got an idea and casted a magic sphere. Kosuke asked her what it was. It's the spell that detects magic waves. And as she thought there were a lot of magic waves, there might be a forbidden old mechanism underground that causes these waves. There also was a campfire. Then Sumeru remembered that there were no gizmas around even at nighttime. So it seemed that this place was somewhat unusual. Era didn't remember what Sumeru was talking about. Well, she was just sleeping well at that moment, so that's why she didn't remember it. But Sylphie didn't get how something like that may be situated here. Ira told her it was forbidden 300 years ago, and it's a really wonderful fact that this thing still works. It's some kind of a barrier that was used to not let gizmas and maybe other monsters enter this territory, but since it was kind of old, there might be a chance it would just break one day. And instead of making a barrier, it would accidentally start attracting the monster's attention. Sylphie was sure they should take care of this thing. So they needed to understand where they should dig. Ira showed them where they needed to go. The magic sphere stopped moving suddenly. There were a lot of magic waves underground. So Kosuke started digging down. He got there quickly, and after some time he found something interesting. There was a dungeon wall under his feet. He told everyone to come here. That was really interesting. And when Kosuke dug the bricks, they saw a really old dungeon. There was the item they were looking for. A magic sphere that causes those waves. It was a barrier magic thing, and Ira was a bit familiar with it. It looked like a place of court mages. But she felt uncomfortable with those statues. It was obviously golems. Those who protect this artifact from strangers. Kosuke was amazed. He had never seen golems before. He was very interested in how their mechanism works. Era told him that every golem has its core inside his body which allows them to move. And as it should be, golems are invulnerable to any magic or melee attacks. They just have no weak spots. Golems can see them with their eyes as well as other living creatures. Kosuke realized there shouldn't be any problem with them then. First, he got closer to the golems. He had a very nice plan on how to deal with them without a fight. He just locked them with the blocks first. Then he took his pickaxe and started trying to break their armor. After a few hits, it got cracked and he could see the golem's core. Well done. They expected it to be boring as usual. No even epic fight. But it didn't mean it wasn't good. The contrary. They didn't need to put in too much effort most of the time. He just makes their job easier. And well, they got what they wanted. Now they needed to get back outside to build a fort. In the end, it was their main goal for today. Pilna almost died from boredom here while waiting for them. Kosuke did his job quickly and they got their dinner at the end of the day. So good. But Kosuke still had some more work to do in his forge. He was wondering if he had enough materials. In the end tomorrow, he needed to build a huge base for 3,000 people. That's quite a lot. He couldn't wait for it. However, he was a human. And every human has to relax normally. In his situation, he was getting relaxed with Silphy in bed. But in the last days, they both had no time for this at all. It was making him feel stressed. Suddenly, Silphy appeared right from behind. It was so unexpected that he got scared. She was pretty surprised by his excited reaction. He asked her why she didn't sleep. It was pretty late. She straightly told him she wanted this. Well, you understand what she meant. 
Kosuke understood her hint. It seemed that they thought in the same way. Sad that they had no time for it, but she was persistent and wanted to do this right now, right here. She didn't care if someone would watch them. It was going to be a great night. And as it usually happens, there were some night stalkers. Maybe it was some kind of a reality show for them. It's fine if they were enjoying watching it. Well, it would be better to just leave them alone so they walked out to sleep well. After a week of building the fort, Kosuke was dying from fatigue. That was his payment for his superpowers, being exploited by his friends every day. Once he saw Melty's fort plan, he realized it would be better to just drop everything and run away. Well, who said he can run away that easily? He had no choice from the beginning, so she wanted him to make not a simple barracks but houses for families. Would be better to make it bigger, one house should contain four or six families at once. 3,000 people wasn't a joke. Well, they had enough time to build it. Just eight hours of work every day and they would finish it quickly. Melty promised him to make a weekend for him. Even if she was a cruel exploiter, she was honest and never lied to Kosuke. That's true. She never was unfair with him, but, well, it didn't mean she couldn't ask him straightly to do something crazy. And of course, Kosuke wanted to know what kind of reward they were going to give him for his work. Silphy would never leave Kosuke without a reward, isn't it like that? Well, it was pretty obvious that Melty hadn't even planned on giving him any kind of reward. Silphy said they rely on his powers a lot. She said she was ready to do everything he would ask for him. And then Kosuke's dopamine system gave him feedback. Finally, a worthwhile reward. Silphy realized it was a pretty bold promise, and Kosuke knew she couldn't refuse. Of course, she was a great princess of the kingdom. She couldn't refuse from her own words. Not in this life, and not even in the next one. So she just smirked instead of making any excuses. That's gonna be interesting. Then Silphy addressed Melty and asked if she was ready for it. Melty couldn't refuse too, of course, she was her underling. Well, she did that in case Kosuke wanted to gather a harem of girls in bed. Kosuke asked Danan why they both were talking like they were old friends while actually Silphy was a mistress and Melty was her underling. Danan's answer made it pretty clear. They were friends since childhood for real. Melty's mother was raising Silphy so they are more than just old friends, more like close sisters. Kosuke was surprised to hear that, he didn't even guess it could be like that. Danan asked Kosuke to keep being a strong support for Her Majesty. It was really important for her now. But well, it was time to work hard. Melty grabbed Kosuke and they headed to the fields. It's exploiting time. Just no mercy for this poor guy. Danan and Silphy watched after them walking out. Then Danan told Silphy his worries about Era. He rarely sees her nowadays. Silphy told him she was just exploring the dungeon in the desert. It's okay, she wouldn't be Era if she wouldn't do that nerd stuff. Moreover, she loved doing that. She made up a little laboratory there and was doing a lot of research. Then Silphy attracted everyone's attention. There was important news she wanted to tell the newcomers. It should have been an introduction to their hard-working times. It's gonna be hard, but they must handle it. The people's morale rose up after Her Majesty's speech. And then, two weeks later, they got some results of their hard work. It was a very beautiful city. City that was made in a few weeks, but it wasn't easy at all. However, it was only the first step of their huge plan. Only the beginning of everything. Kosuke unlocked a new skill. Now he could save all the building's drawings. It meant he didn't need to build it anymore. He could just summon the entire building by one click. But he still needed more resources. Anyway, the building speed was above any expectations. Kosuke could build the entire city in a few minutes now. It looked like he was cheating. Maybe he just hacked the Matrix. It was lunchtime. His friends were praising him for his abilities. There's no words to describe how much he did for them. He was glad to help. Kosuke also installed 116 ballistas over the walls. He also needed to set up Mr. Woodspike's traps around the walls. And after that, the bridge. Kosuke also planned to place TNT under the base to blow it up in case they would need to retreat. Silphy asked Danan about the scout squads. Danan said he was going to make six squads consisting of 12 soldiers. That should be enough for their mission. They already started planning how they would sneakily enter the kingdom. There's a map of it, but it's quite hard to plan their way since their map was old. The relief in some places could change a lot in three years. And now Silphy had some important things to say. Kosuke did a giant part of his job, so it was time for them to start working hard too. It was a declaration of the start of their expeditions. Everyone was glad to hear that. After a few days at night, a monkey named Saix, an alchemist, was trying to understand what had happened to him today. He was just scared of how someone had jumped at him all of a sudden. He thought someone was about to kill him. Thankfully, it wasn't like that. Just someone had an estrus. It happened so better to be careful. This is Indy from the Blue Demon Clan. He was a former adventurer. Well, no one was glad about the fact the girls were hunting at them like that. Kosuke was wondering how it could be possible in their society. He was surprised it still hadn't happened to him. Well, of course, he was the princess's husband, and it was the only reason he wasn't stalked by other girls. 
Is it good or bad? Well, depends on what he wants from his life. Kosuke was mad. What the hell were they talking about? No, Kosuke, what the hell are you talking about? Kosuke couldn't believe it was possible. He never had gotten so much attention from girls. And those achievements weren't just a bad joke, of course. The only thing he hoped was that they wouldn't try to do something naughty with him. Anyway, he could only continue living, but since now holding it in head. Who could imagine that Silphy was the only reason he was still safe? And anyway, Kosuke was a really important figure here. Even the elders called him a miracle, like Jesus. And besides, Leonardo said they did not have many men. It was a real problem for them. So their main goal was to sneakily free them from slavery and bring them here. Kosuke had a question why they wouldn't just do this with all these mad girls. It was obviously weak since there were too many girls and only a few men. Moreover, Kosuke would have done the same with Ira, Melty, and others. Kosuke agreed with him. Harem is fun, yes, but not in their situation. Leonardo was glad to see Kosuke was thinking cold, but he was sure that every true man must get a harem one day. So, what about Leonardo, actually? Well, he was a man of honor, so his heart was only for his deceased wife. It sounds like a double standard. Leonardo realized he couldn't handle this topic anymore and tried to talk about something else. Of course everyone noticed that. Kosuke was close to finishing the storage. They had enough food for now, so they were going for the expedition maybe after two or three days. By the way, Kosuke made food they could take in their expedition. Power bars. He offered to try it out now. It had a taste of nuts and fruits, and it also had a very nice form. You could get pleased by how aesthetic it looks. Someone knocked on the door. It was Ira. She came with a drawing of a magic generator that works on magic stones, but Kosuke wasn't sure if he would be able to save a drawing in his interface. Then Ira took his hand and told him to go. Kosuke felt confused. Then he remembered Leonardo's words. Now it didn't look like a bad joke. It was more real than ever. Kosuke said he would come back soon. Kosuke was getting surprised by how Ira was acting with him. He never saw her doing such strange things. Well, it wasn't bad, maybe. Anyway, it wouldn't spoil their relationships. The next day was the day of the expedition. Finally, the scout squads were going to save their brethren from slavery. It was one of the most important moments in their history. Kosuke wanted to go with them. However, it might be dangerous and moreover, what then was the reason for training soldiers? That's fair. Silphy told Kosuke to do what he was good at the most. She didn't want him to take part in dangerous events like this one. Better to keep him in safety, he was their main person they were relying on. Thanks to his golden hands, they had everything they needed now. With common efforts, they forced Kosuke to stay here. He was going to do his job to not die from boredom. He headed to his forge with Ira. His friends were waiting for him. While Kosuke was working hard, our monkey got a harem of girls. Ira looked like she wanted to join their party too. There was a repeating crossbow made by Kosuke's drawings. He already wanted to test it out. It looked pretty easy to use. He did a test shot. Since you don't need to reload it after every shot, you can shoot faster than usual. The lizard girl tried to seduce Kosuke. However, her horny plan failed. Kosuke was on alert all the time so no one could do that to him. He got an idea to make this crossbow fully automatic by using Golem. Unfortunately, Aira proved it cannot be possible since the construction is quite small. But it may work with Ballista. The more important thing was how to build a Golem and how hard it would be. Aira said it depends on what this Golem would be doing. If it's something simple then it wouldn't be hard. But if he wanted to make a living mechanism that can walk, do jobs and etc. Then it would take a lot of time and resources. So they needed to make a Golem core. The alchemist knew the recipe. Kosuke realized he could just make it once, and then he would be able to make it instantly by using his game interface. Ira told Kosuke he's a very interesting person. It looked like she was trying to pick him up with all these compliments. Well, the more important thing was how to simplify Golem's mechanism. They could just use magic to activate the mechanism from a distance. Why not? Sounds nice. It would make their task way easier. Now it was time for work. And then five days later, everything was ready. They were testing out their upgraded version of Ballista. It was working great. So nice. Silphy saw it and praised everyone who was working with Kosuke on this project. Silphy sama told them a compliment. It raised everyone's mood high. Then they saw Pilna coming back with some great news. Jagira's squad was coming back. They saved 37 people. Their squad should arrive after tomorrow. Oh wow, Kosuke got some white clothes. He looks like a doctor. He's actually a doctor. A lot of people needed his help. He had a cure for anything, however, they still were afraid of humans, that's bad. He didn't even do anything bad, so what's the problem? Well anyway, no one could stop their panic now, but there was good news. The scout squads came back with no losses and with some information. They confirmed the fact that the kingdom was on alert now, and their forts including the Omit Desert were under high level protection. And to their surprise, there were some villages that were living their quiet life with no problems.
It also seems that the kingdom needed only mines and shafts with resources. Despite the sad fact they forced civilians to work hard there, they still were giving them enough food and water. But anyway, it was still bad for civilians since they had a lack of rights. Taxes were crazy, and they couldn't even be free in where they go. The punishments were something. They could kill even a child with no mercy. What demons they are. Demons who believed in their god and were forcing others to become part of their religion. The scouts killed everyone there and took villagers away from this hell. Leonardo and others were going to continue their raid by going deeper into the kingdom's lands. Brave soldiers. So for now, that was all the information. Sylphie asked them what things would be most helpful for their next expedition. Jagira and Zamir looked at each other. It seems they already had some ideas. Sylphie was confused seeing Kosuke ending up in such a strange situation. Kosuke explained there were some problems with civilians. First they were aggressive to him because he's human, but then he healed one of them, and the others became calm and let him do the same. It's really hard to make people trust you. Sylphie and others could only feel bad for him. Sylphie already had some work for Kosuke. It was time to go to the workshop. The workers were already waiting for him. When they came there, it revealed that their task was about making that type of food you don't need to cook with fire. Besides, they also needed to be in contact with each other from a distance. The better food soldiers eat, the higher their morale is. And having an opportunity to talk with each other from any distance would allow them to work more effectively. But they couldn't even imagine how hard it would be to make it real but they actually could make food for them at the moment. But the problem was in making it hot at any moment and without fire. Maybe using quicklime and water would make it possible, but it won't work if there'll be a lot of food like in their case. Anyway, it's better than nothing for the first time. Now it is better to think about communication problems. Kosuke already had an idea, Morse code. His explanation surprised everyone. There was a magical core in the dungeon. It was sending magic waves. Kosuke had an idea to use it as their main way to send messages. If it would be possible to put their speech on the magic waves, it would be great. Eira was such a genius as always. After a moment of concentration, she told Kosuke her idea. She was going to use the golem's technology as the fundament of their magical device. It's time to work. On the next day, the Brave Scouts went on a road back to the main base. Kosuke and others looked after them until they disappeared on the horizon. They hoped nothing would happen to them on the way, but Kosuke noticed they looked a bit tired and their weight loss was also noticeable. Sylphie thought in a positive way. She was sure there was enough food in the main base, so nothing to worry about. Oh wait, there were a lot of men in that soldiers group. It seemed that our monkey bro Sakes would get in trouble soon. Later in the office, after saving Sakes' life from lusty women, they discussed this problem. They had a lack of men and it wasn't good at all. Suddenly, Sylphie changed the topic to more private. She was worried if Kosuke was in contact with other women. She didn't see him for a long time. Well, Kosuke didn't lie and said he likes all the women here. But still, Sylphie will be his beloved one forever because she's the best. This answer left her with no words and was embarrassed. Nothing to say, he's a genius. But despite being such a strong warrior and leader, she was convinced that she lacked a woman's attractiveness. Kosuke was shocked when he heard such nonsense from her. Well, it was time to show her who's the cute one here. She tried to escape, but it was useless. After a few minutes, she turned into a maid. Pretty nice look. Now it's time to show up to others. Of course she didn't want to, but who actually asked her? Melty was the first one who saw Sylphie. Wait, really? It's cool. I mean, Melty was staring at her with some crazy sight. It's gonna turn into something unhealthy. Melty and Kosuke tried to apologize, but she didn't respond. It was bad. They didn't mean to act bad to her. But Sylphie still couldn't get rid of this embarrassing feeling. Then Melty showed up with a genius idea. She was going to ask Kosuke to make costumes for everyone, so Sylphie won't be feeling that embarrassed. Kosuke liked her plan, but he couldn't get rid of feeling Melty was going to put all the costumes on Sylphie instead. Sometime later, civilians gathered near the dressmaker Kosuke to get their new cool costumes. It was a spontaneous event that turned out to be very fun for everyone. I mean, look at Melty and Era, their looks are amazing. But then look at Kosuke, just look at his damn face. I feel the same now. It was a type of work Kosuke may have liked the most, even if it was hard. Aira wanted to get another one since she thought this one didn't fit her. Everyone was glad to change the look. 
See, there are some pretty girls in cool costumes. And then again, look at Kosuke's face. You got it. Then Melty asked Kosuke to look into the window. Kosuke turned around and saw Silphie's mad and jealous sight. Soon she will come out, I swear. Melty tried her best to seduce Kosuke to get some more costumes for herself, but Kosuke was undeterred. Well, he still didn't mind making some more for her. Then, here appeared Aira. In another one costume, by the way, and in the company of five harpies. So nice. Then Melty changed her look too. Looks even better now, isn't it? Kosuke would agree with us. And then the last guest showed up. Sylphie finally came out of her room. He already prepared a ton of clothes for her, so it was time to change again. She realized at that moment that it was such a big mistake. Sylphie tried to argue with Melty, but, well, do you think she had any choice? Kosuke blessed Melty for that. Suddenly, Danan appeared. He was serious as always, so he didn't get what was going on here. Then, Melty and Sylphie finally came out. And, well, okay, this was too much, even for this manga, I guess. Sylphie would agree with me. But who actually asked us? After that messy event, they had to apologize standing in front of Danan. He was really serious and didn't like the fact they were fooling around when it was actually the war days. Suddenly, Era entered the room to tell everyone that Pilna came back with an important report. Sylphie ordered Pilna to report to her what was happening there. It revealed that first, second, and sixth squads took control over some shafts in Vinisk. They freed more than 800 people. That's amazing. However, they had a lack of food and water. Obviously, it won't be enough for 800 people. They continued their way to free more lands from the kingdom's control. So, in that case, they will reach their closest base not earlier than in one week. The problem was that they did not have enough time to transport resources to them. So, Sylphie ordered them to begin the work right now. They needed to go to the Marinard Kingdom's territory with Kosuke, and Sylphie didn't like this fact at all. Anyway, they had no other choice. They began working now to finish everything until dawn. Good plan. They went on a road. Sylphie, Five Harpies, and Kosuke. Remind you, he didn't feel any fatigue from running. Then the harpy told Kosuke and Sylphie they noticed two gizmas nearby. Kosuke already had an answer to such a situation. It was time to play a shooter game. A few shots easily finished the enemies. Very nice. They almost reached their base. That was pretty quick. At sunset, they reached another base and decided to stop there for now. Kosuke offered them to take some rest, have a dinner, bath, and sleep. Not bad. Kosuke quickly made up a hot bath so the girls could rest here. It was such an amazing feeling to feel the water after running all day under the hot sun. Kosuke decided to make some food. That wasn't a big deal for him. True Minecraft player. After the girls left the bath, Kosuke was about to take a rest there too, but suddenly noticed a feather on the water. Suddenly Pilna yelled at him to drop it somewhere. Kosuke didn't see any problem in that. But then he noticed all the harpies got embarrassed hard. What's going on? Well, for them it was like someone takes your hair and begins to play with it and sniff it. Pretty uncomfortable scene. He apologized for that, but then the harpy girl acted kind and even would be glad if he would take it. Then all the harpies realized it might be a nice idea and asked Kosuke to take their feathers too. Wow, that's strange. Then Sylphie looked at Kosuke with jealous eyes and he realized it's time to stop making jokes with her feelings. For the last time, Kosuke took a feather and looked at everyone's reaction. Hard to believe it causes such expressions on them. Sylphie said it was time to go to bed since they have to wake up early tomorrow. Everyone agreed with her, it's sleep time. Kosuke had a pleasant dream. He felt like he was in embrace of thousands of soft and warm feathers. When he opened his eyes, he saw two harpies greeting him. His mood immediately rose up. Kosuke still felt a bit of fatigue after yesterday's work, but at the same time he could say he felt great in his lower body, if you got what I mean. Kosuke greeted everyone. Other harpies were glad to see him too. Sylphie immediately ordered him to make breakfast. He noticed she was kind of jealous today, but what was the reason? The harpies also were quite cute today, I mean how they were acting with Kosuke. Sylphie told Kosuke to be happy about this fact. Well, he still had a lot of questions in his head. Anyway, this day they had to reach the fifth base by midday. They came here quite fast. Kosuke could even see Marinard lands from this place. Now it was time to build a fort right here. After a few hours, Kosuke did all the work. That was pretty quick for such a large building. No wonder everyone was surprised by such a fast building speed. Kosuke needed to wait three days for the harvest. His abilities were kind of cheat for this fantasy world. But well, it was good. They still had to do a lot of things, but Sylphie was still full of energy just like Kosuke and others. Five days later, Kosuke started paying attention to his strange feeling and body. Every time he wakes, he feels his lower body very relaxed and every night he sees the same dream. Very soft and pleasant dream. 
That was very strange. He opened the window and Harpies greeted him as always. Maybe he was close to figuring out what's going on here. He felt really strange and excited while looking at them. It seems that he got in close relationships with these birds. And to confirm this fact, we can see Sylphie almost dying from jealousy and anger. She was trying to pretend that nothing happened, but her feelings were telling the opposite. Kosuke, you have to talk with her, it's not normal. The harpy appeared with a report. The scout squad left the fourth base and headed right here. Kosuke was glad they already prepared everything for them. A warm welcome for brave soldiers. Suddenly, another report from the Harpy. One of the squads was chased by the kingdom's army and they almost got caught. So they needed help as soon as possible. So it's time to use their new thing, right? Sylphie thanked the Harpy Fitch and the Harpy Ray for the reports. It was time to move fast. Meanwhile, the Kingdom Knights and the Freedom Army engaged in the battle. Leonardo actually wasn't nervous at all, more like it was just annoying to deal with their arrows. However, it was still not a really good situation for them. Leonardo couldn't keep them away for a long time. They just needed someone's help. Suddenly they noticed there was enemy squad attacking them from another side. It's gonna be bad. And to his luck, there appeared help. They looked above and saw the harpies with bombs. Soon, the enemy is going to explode. Flight, throw, and the enemy exploded. Amazing, right in the target, so it was their first blood. What a horrific power. Kosuke warned the harpies to be careful. Sylphie was sure they knew what they were going to do. The birds were about to begin their mission. Despite Sylphie trying to calm him down, it'll be okay. Kosuke was worrying for their lives anyway. Then Kosuke took the telescope and rushed up the stairs on the walls. It seemed that he was really worried, and even Sylphie's confidence couldn't calm him down. Sylphie noticed it quickly. Kosuke quickly looked into the telescope. It's a real war, and Kosuke knew that well. Everyone could die at any moment. Sylphie suddenly addressed Kosuke. She noticed he was nervous for real. It's because he had never participated in such dangerous events. He's a civilian, after all. But despite this fact he was fighting against monsters like a true warrior, Kosuke didn't actually feel himself as a real warrior since he never killed a human with his own hands. However, Sylphie argued gizmos are living creatures as well as humans, so in that case there was no difference. Maybe she was right. Kosuke agreed with her, but still, it's hard to make so many important decisions in a row for Kosuke. A few weeks ago, he ended up in this world and every day was intense. It was a feeling he never felt before, and well, he wanted to spend some time with Sylphie, it was making him sad. Sylphie suddenly hugged him and said there's no reason to overload yourself that much. She offered him to take rest if he needed to, because just looking at Kosuke who was dying from fatigue wasn't something good. Besides, it was a real war so no one would force him to take part in it. Once she tried to calm him down, and a loud sound of explosion from far away suddenly scared them both. Then Kosuke turned back to Sylphie and told her he already made his choice. He was going to help them no matter what. Kosuke was the one who invented so much military stuff there, and he was giving them a ton of advantage in the war, so how could he leave them alone? No, he's totally not like that. Sylphie was glad to hear such brave words from Kosuke. Now she realized how strong her beloved one was. She thanked him for being so kind. Leonardo's squad was able to escape the knights after the Harpy's bomb attack. Soon there appeared the Freedom Squad, a lot of people came to their fortress. At nighttime, all the civilians already were in a safe place. Kosuke and others were talking a lot about their next plans. Freedom forces were divided by three groups to defend the fortress in case the enemy would appear. Kosuke continued exploring the desert and expanding their base. And that's how four days have passed. And on the fifth day, they arrived at the front fortress. Their civilians met them gladly. Danan already heard from someone how they eliminated the kingdom's army. That was amazing news. The harpies were really happy about their new weapons. Powerful and fun to use. Kosuke told Danan he had finished expanding the base. He did a lot of work and for that, Danan praised him. Thank God they had Kosuke. However, he had no time to rest. Tomorrow, he needed to go back to the fortress. Danan apologized for overloading Kosuke with all this work, but he seemed to be okay with that. Suddenly, Eira appeared and tugged on Kosuke's sleeve. There was something she really wanted to show him. But what would it be? Kosuke got really interested in what surprise they prepared for him. It was in the workshop. When they came there, the workers still had to do some preparations. Saiks couldn't wait for Kosuke's reaction. First, Kosuke didn't even know what to expect. He only hoped it would be really useful stuff. But once Ira and her assistant showed up in backpacks, he was totally disoriented. What is it? A joke? Schoolboy's backpack for real? But then Ira smirked since she saw Kosuke's confusion. She explained everything to him. It's what they needed for communication. 
The phone. Impossible. Morning. The fortress was alive and in full work. Kosuke opened his eyes and immediately realized something was wrong. He looked under the blanket and was shocked. Ira, the hell are you doing here? Wait, what happened yesterday? How did Kosuke end up in such a situation? Then, he remembered, they were talking about the new device. It was supposed to be a phone with long enough range. Ira's brain is something. Kosuke's abilities were strong, but Ira wasn't worse in comparison to him, and they both could create everything from everything. There appeared Lamia with assistance and showed Kosuke the solution for the food problem. It was a portable burner that was working with burnt lime. Amazing. Kosuke had no words to say, and they had a really long conversation that lasted for all night, and that's how he ended up in this room in the workshop. Suddenly, Lamia opened the window to greet Kosuke. However, when she saw this confusing scene, she decided to pretend she hadn't seen anything. Kosuke was totally embarrassed and tried to convince her it's not like that and he can explain. Aira woke up from his screams. Kosuke had a ton of questions for her, but the answer was clear and honest. She just wanted to sleep together with Kosuke. And what else? They didn't do anything bad that night, Kosuke breathed out. But hey, it was so unexpected she has to at least ask him next time. And for that, Kosuke was going to punish her. Well. She didn't mind, actually. Then he has no answer to this situation. Ira confessed that she always liked Kosuke's strange powers. It was really inspiring to her. The embarrassment meter almost broke in Kosuke's head. Anyway, he had Sylphie already. So what's the point of trying to get in such close relationships with him? Ira said she didn't really want to become a wall between them. But still she wanted him to be his closest one, at least after Sylphie. He couldn't refuse her, it's still embarrassing for Kosuke. This world was surprisingly hard to understand for the one who came from another one. So Kosuke was glad to accept Aira as a friend. But looking into Ira's eye, we can easily guess what she really wants from him. Kosuke realized it too, but he couldn't let it happen that fast. He tried to explain to her how it usually happens in his world, but Ira totally misunderstood what he was talking about. So he decided to let Sylphie talk with Ira instead. It would be better. She looked pleased, maybe because she already imagined how it would be. Well, it's time for breakfast. Kosuke was glad he didn't offend Ira by his words. It seemed he said everything right. Well, another problem was still bothering his mind. How on the earth was he going to talk with Sylphie about that? They had breakfast outside. Wait, the hell is that scene? Pilna was shocked to see Kosuke with Harpies and Era that close. Well, she just said straightly that she was accepted by Kosuke. That's pretty frustrating news for Pilna. And these Harpies were here too. It was good he was getting along with them. But still, Pilna was jealous of that. It seemed she had lost her chance to get closer to Kosuke. So frustrating. Donan came back to ask Kosuke if he was ready to continue working hard. He was glad to accept the offer. However, he would need others' help. And he was going to choose some companions. Pilna. It's your chance. Let's go. She had a thousand reasons to come with Kosuke. They didn't even try to argue with her. So Kosuke will go with the Harpies. And so, he let Pilna choose Harpies to go with them. Ira's sight made Pilna feel confused. The hell? Obviously she won't let anyone get close to Kosuke. It's pretty rough. But she had nothing to answer. First she needed to talk with Sylphie about that. Kosuke noticed there was a conflict between them both. Oh, that's bad. Or he just misunderstood them. Danan just sighed and let them do whatever they wanted until tomorrow. He was serious as always. Well, it's just about time. Everyone was in a good mood today. They needed to work hard soon. It was time to prepare for the road. They tested the telegraphs. It worked well. It was working even from far away. So nice. So it meant they were ready for everything. They decided to get in contact tomorrow. Kosuke hoped they wouldn't meet any obstacles during the road, and anyways, they still had a plan B for some occurrences. Well, let's see how it will be tomorrow. After that, Eira confessed her feelings to Kosuke, and well, it wasn't the right moment for such words, especially when there were other girls. Total embarrassment. But the girls didn't see to be jealous, though. On the contrary, they knew everyone liked Kosuke. He's something. Other harpies came back, while observing they hadn't noticed anything strange. However, Pilna quickly realized Kosuke was feeling strange for some reason. Well, the Harpies were glad to meet each other. They were the closest ones after all. It's really nice to have a family or friends who love you and always have a warm welcome. It's evening time, which means they were going to prepare dinner. Kosuke made some sandwiches, tasty as always. There were 17 Harpies, and because they were always on observation missions, they rarely were seeing each other. 
Today, thankfully, they all found a chance to spend some time together. Pilna offered everyone to take a bath. Kosuke agreed with her idea, and it seemed that everyone else was glad to accept the offer. The bath party is going to be hot. Water was really soft and warm. Pleasure. They rarely took baths, so it was something new for them. Pilna suddenly offered Kosuke to take a bath altogether. Wait, it sounds illegal. He wasn't happy with this idea, but who actually asked for his opinion? And that's how Kosuke ended up in another embarrassing situation. This was becoming even more and more dangerous for Kosuke. They were happy to help him wash his back, even if Kosuke didn't ask them for it. No, on the contrary, he didn't want to end up in such a situation at all. But I repeat, who actually asked him? There's no jokes anymore, Kosuke, and unfortunately, Silphie wasn't here, so he won't be saved. But it turned out to be very pleasant, actually. Kosuke came back to the fortress and Sylphie gave him a warm welcome. Thankfully, nothing bad happened to them during the road. Well, she didn't know what harpies did to poor Kosuke, thankfully, and now she went a bit wild and almost broke his bones by hugging. Two lovely hugs. Well, it was nice they finally met. But where's the Freedom Army? Kosuke was about to call them with this new cool device. Wait, what? Well, they didn't know about this thing. Kosuke put the backpack on the table. However, nothing happened. It seems they were too far away and the phone couldn't catch the signal from another one. But still, it was amazing they already made such a thing. It means that they got a very big advantage in the war. Having an opportunity to contact each other during the battle and scout expeditions was kinda cheat in this world. Kosuke already had a ton of ideas on how to use it. Sylphie got the same feeling. This item was gold. Thank you, Ira. Suddenly, a report from Harpies. The enemy's army decided to attack them and will reach their fortress in a few hours. Wait, what? Until the sunset, they had to prepare for the battle. 1,000 horsemen, 4,000 infantry. That's way more than their current forces now. Kosuke was worried. What do they have to do now? Then, Silphie said, there's no reason to panic. They have a secret weapon. The fortress was full of bombs. No one would expect that. And because they had a phone. They could detonate the bombs right at the moment the enemy's army would enter the fortress. And then after a big explosion, all the army will be destroyed. The plan was perfect. Well, the only thing is that not all the 5,000 people would be able to enter the fortress. Anyway, they have to make it look like they ran away in a hurry by leaving food and other stuff in storage. Okay, it's time to dig the hole. This place was perfect for observation. Impossible to detect. They took some cookies and fruits from storage. It should be enough. It would be such a nice place to watch the fortress. Looked like a restroom, comfortable, but also with a detonator inside. Just press the button and see what would happen out of the window. All the preparations were done. Then Silphy gave the harpies an order to stay here and do the explosion at the right moment. Kosuke asked them to be careful. Their reaction to his words was especially exciting. Silphy and Kosuke now headed back to the fourth base. Later, Kosuke told Aira about their plan. The telegraph is a really cool thing. She also was worried because she couldn't catch the signal for some time. Kosuke just forgot about the telegraph's max range. Ira asked them to be careful and hung up. After the call, everyone got excited and asked Kosuke to make more of this thing. Everyone wanted to have such a cool device. Leonardo also wanted to ask about something important. When is dinner time? Oh god, was it really that important? Okay, it would be nice to have some food to eat anyway. Silphie asked Kosuke if he felt good. He replied that he was okay. Silphie took the wine and filled two glasses. Kosuke told her how he had spent time with others. Silphie looked happy. It was strange because she already knew about Kosuke's relationships with Ira, but instead, she was calm. It was still embarrassing to talk about such things though. Silphie didn't feel jealous or something like that. On the contrary, she was glad he was getting along with others. Kosuke anyway told her what he was thinking about. Despite the fact he was with other girls last week, he still loved Silphie the most and never had a feeling to cheat on her or forget about her. Moreover, if Silphie would end up in the same situation, he would die from jealousy. Silphie just saw it cute. Not bad, Kosuke. You have to get more wafus in your harem. It seems that Silphie wouldn't mind, actually. She began to get closer and closer to Kosuke's face, and it made him feel embarrassed. No matter how much time they had spent together, he still couldn't stop feeling like that every time. Oh, and what about Aira? Sylphie would be glad to spend time with them both if you got what I mean. However, their cute talks were interrupted by a loud sound. Something happened. It was an explosion. The fortress blew up with all the kingdom's army. Nice job, my lads. I am proud of you. Kosuke and Sylphie realized what happened only after a minute or two. That was really unexpected. 
but how it actually was from the Harpies view. Once they noticed the army surrounding the fortress, they immediately got on full alert. Then, the army began to enter the fortress. First they were careful, but after the command from the army leader, all the soldiers began to enter and soon all the rats were in the trap. The harpies couldn't believe they have to kill so many people by just pressing a button. And when the last soldier entered the fortress, the harpy pressed the button. And then you know what happened next. Kosuke and Silphie had no words to say. The power of the explosion was way above his expectations. Leonardo and others were also worried of what's going on. No wonder that everyone woke up after that. The Oni couldn't wait for their attack, but unfortunately they had to go back to third base, and then they have to wait for the Harpies report there. And also, they obviously needed more soldiers to conquer the kingdom. Anyway, the explosion looked really powerful. No one wondered if all the knights died there. Kosuke got an idea. He opened the achievements window and hoped there was a bonus for killing people. First, he noticed another funny achievement the lover damn it it's not what he wanted to see and yes he finally found it now there were no doubts if they killed all the army Kosuke got an achievement for killing more than 3,000 people Silphie noticed Kosuke's surprise expression he told her he saw an achievement well she didn't know what he was talking about so he was going to explain everything to her too much information stop it please no one got what he meant by that ton of words on the contrary, it caused even more questions to Kosuke. Better to forget what he said. He decided to explain it like God was helping him and that's it. So Kosuke could do something and get something for that. Pretty easy to understand now. Besides, he could level up his abilities or gain new ones. That was strange, so everyone was excited. It seemed that they believed in God's theory. Better than nothing. On the next day on third base, Pilna met with Kosuke and others. She was still excited and amazed by that powerful explosion they made. The picture still stood clear in her mind. After the bomb detonation, the Harpies got an order to what to do next. They had to check the territory around to see if someone was still alive. And as they expected, the explosion power was strong enough to kill everyone. Only 20% of soldiers were alive and could stand on their feet. But Pilna also added that even those 20% were done after midnight. Gizmas had no mercy for any of them. Poor soldiers tried to do something, but it was useless. Being less than in half from their strength, the knights became the food for the dangerous beasts. Leonardo was proud of Kosuke's genius mind, so they destroyed the enemy's forces. Now they didn't need to care about them for a while until the kingdom's army would regroup. Aira made a call and asked if the information was correct. Kosuke confirmed the elimination of the kingdom's army and success of their mission. Aira was worried for Kosuke if he could feel bad for killing so many humans, but to her surprise he was actually fine and on the contrary happy. Aira was happy too, she would take care of him later and for now she hung up. Silphie looked at Kosuke with contempt. Was he going to have a good time with Aira upon arrival? He had no reason to lie anymore. Of course he was dreaming of it, not gonna lie, it would be a really nice time. But Silphie imagined something different. Silphie asked Kosuke if he wanted her to do some pleasant stuff, and he obviously and gladly accepted her offer. But what happened next caused a total confusion on Silphie's face. Da hell are you doing, Kosuke? Well, if you feel good, then I can understand you. She actually was fine with it too. That's how they spend their night together. However, on the next day, Leonardo and others told Kosuke to be more gentle next time with Silphie's feelings. Kosuke didn't get what they meant, and should I say their night game was a bit different this time? It was a day outside, but for some reason Silphie didn't want to come out. She locked in her room and cried about what happened that night. That's why Kosuke couldn't tell them the truth. And the truth was so terrible, no one could imagine what it could be. And as you can guess, Silphie was taking the initiative in such things again. Once she tried to lie on Kosuke's knees, she couldn't stop being his personal cat. It was the cutest scene in this manga, and thankfully, I can finally show it. Pleasure for your eyes. Then Silphie finally left her room. Everyone immediately surrounded her with tons of questions. It seemed they cared a lot about Her Majesty, and thankfully, she was actually fine. Kosuke decided to demolish their mini-base. During the process, Kosuke noticed everyone was talking to Silphie. No, please don't tell them what happened that night. After the deconstruction, the Harpies came to Kosuke with the report again. They reported that Silphie was actually fine, and now they knew there was no Kosuke's fault. That's cruel. Stop it, damn. Too embarrassing. And no wonder Silphie finally blew up because of this mess. She couldn't hold back anymore, and was going to release her inner power to destroy everyone. There are no jokes anymore, my friends. It's time to run. Run for your damn life as fast as possible. 
but this incident actually helped them to catch up with others. Aira welcomed Kosuke upon his arrival. The workshop was fully in the hard work process as expected. It's time to take a little break and have some tea. Wait, where's Saix? It seemed he got a bit ill. Well, better to not think about what actually happened. During the tea party, Kosuke explained that the telegraph was kind of hard to use. He has to use magic power if he wants to activate it, but Kosuke couldn't use magic. The telegraph needs something like a magic battery. The engineers were glad to reconstruct it a bit, and they didn't even need to struggle with it. Pretty easy to do that quickly. Kosuke felt himself stupid in their company. Two smart heads around there. Now they were working on another cool thing. The Magic Waves Transponders. As you might notice, some things in this world were working with magic energy. Magic is the core of engineering in this world, just like the electricity in ours. Lamia showed him an example of a magic item, this gun. They took an idea from Kosuke's gun and made their own one based on magic energy. Sadly, it had some problems with durability, but still, what an amazing job. Kosuke praised them. Aira also told him about magic swords and magic spheres. Yes, they made it too, so their forces will become stronger with these new weapons. Kosuke also wasn't just fooling around. He had an idea to make a miso soup and a soy sauce. No one had any idea what he meant by that, and Kosuke also had no idea why he couldn't make it even with all the ingredients in the inventory. When the engineers saw what he was doing, they were amazed. And even if Kosuke couldn't make these foods, he was able to make other ones. Soy milk and soy flour, it's a pretty nutritious product, and it also looked tasty. Anyway, Kosuke was thinking about soy sauce and miso soup. There must be a reason why he couldn't make it. And then he realized what was wrong. He needed to try out a barrel instead of a workbench. He needed a few more items to finish it. Kosuke was happy. Two barrels were done quickly, 200 grams of beans, and it would be enough to fill, uh, the 20 kilograms barrel. This world is totally strange. Ira was curious about the process of making it. Kosuke was glad to share some information. Fermentation is the key. Oh wait, fermentation is also used in making sake. Interesting idea. Imagine their idea worked. They got sake. Now it's time to make some miso soup. But before that, they decided to transport the barrels to the central square. Good idea to free more space in the workshop. It was the middle of the day. Their work was in full swing. Kosuke was the one who could create drinks in just a few minutes. And then they got more sake. Sake for everyone. Kosuke didn't expect it to turn into a feast, but it seemed to be another cool event to discharge the heavy atmosphere of the war. Everyone got at least one mug of sake. Everyone's gonna be drunk today. Thank you, Kosuke. It was really tasty. All the civilians liked its taste. Then, Sylphie and Leo appeared there. They had no words to say. Kosuke explained to them what's going on, and, well, it still was confusing. And to make it less confusing, they just decided to take part in this feast. It was a really cool ale. Sylphie didn't expect it to be that good. Leo praised Kosuke. Other drinks in comparison to Kosuke's one could be called a horse's urine. No more, no less. Well, rough, but honest. Oni, Gerda, and others came here to join their drunken party. Let's go. Sylphie also liked this idea. Everyone took toast for Her Majesty. While others were drinking ale normally, Oni were wild and were drinking from barrels instead. They all hadn't drunk ale for a really long time, especially such a good ale. Look at the birds. It's another time they all met each other. Sylphie already got drunk. Kosuke was the only person who hadn't drunk a single drop. Ira couldn't believe her eye. The fermentation process was really fast and the same in every barrel. That's Kosuke's magic. And because Kosuke was the only one who hadn't drunk ale, he couldn't get into the party. Suddenly, there appeared another sober person. Danan. He couldn't understand what was going on there, but then he saw Sylphie drunk and got even more confused. Sylphie and Kosuke offered Danan to drink some ale. It's okay to be drunk today. And he didn't mind, actually. One mug of ale then, another one. Danan liked it a lot, I guess. That's how their evening had passed. The atmosphere of joy filled their hearts. Should I even tell you how they felt on the next day? While Sylphie was sleeping sweetly, Kosuke was already working on something. It was a dagger he made for himself. He called it Tsurugi. Kosuke was so focused on his work, he didn't notice Era appeared there unexpectedly. She came here to talk with Sylphie, but well, she was dreaming now. And while she was dreaming, Ira had the opportunity to steal Kosuke. He almost forgot about what they wanted to do. Lying on Ira's thighs was his favorite thing in spending time with her, and she enjoyed it maybe even more than Kosuke. 
He almost fell asleep from this soft and warm feeling. However, Silphy woke up not in the best moment. She noticed Kosuke was looking kind of tense. Of course you caught him cheating on you. Well, if it could be called that. She looked into his eyes seriously and sat in front of him. After a few minutes, he ended up in a really strange situation. He had no idea what would happen next. Silphy began to talk. It was time to finally solve this problem with Kosuke. Aira and Silphy were going to split Kosuke between them both. Wait, what? Is it going to be like I just imagined? Kosuke was afraid by their words. Silphy wanted to sleep with Kosuke and let him spend time with Aira on the day. But Aira also wanted to sleep together. Well, they could do it one by one. Then they turned their heads to Kosuke and were waiting for his answer. And it didn't look like he had any choice. He just asked them to act friendly with each other, just like sisters. Silphy and Aira liked his idea. Things were taking a more serious turn. They both got rid of their clothes. Kosuke couldn't even realize what was happening, but just by looking at them, he could say that nothing good would happen now. And he was right. Or wrong. Depends on how much pleasure or pain he would get from it. Later, Kosuke and the girls entered the conference room. Well, Aira pretended to be tired, so Kosuke was carrying her. Kosuke apologized for being too late. Anyway, it's time to discuss some important things. Danan offered to change their main plan. This news was shocking for everyone. Before they were pretty defensive, so now after they got enough weapons and forces, Danan came with an idea to become more aggressive and attack the enemy's forts. The atmosphere in the conference room was filled with excitement. Because the kingdom's army had lost thousands of soldiers, they had not much power in the Omit Desert. So it means there's no reason to stay defensive anymore. It's time for a counterattack. Everyone was listening in full attention. Kosuke got Danan's logic. First they couldn't attack, but now there's an opportunity to take control over all the territory. First there were only 300 people, now there are 5 times more. It was also possible to count the enemy's forces. There were around 6,500 soldiers, now they lost 5,500. It means they had only 200 or 400 soldiers in one fortress, but it still won't be easy though. And thankfully, they had Kosuke's weapons. With bombs and crossbows, they had all the chances. But it meant that they needed Kosuke on the front line. Silphy wasn't happy with this idea, of course. Her evil aura filled all the room. But Danin was persistent. He took all the risks and convinced Silphy it's a really important step in their mission. Everyone agreed with Danin. Kosuke amazed by Danin's strong nature. He was talking calm and confidently while looking at evil Silphy. Leonardo also supported Danin. Silphy had no arguments against it, she could only agree. Kosuke also was ready for that. Ira just realized that the enemy had no answer to the situation now. They had no powerful magic or something that could suddenly destroy their plans. Aira agreed with the idea of counterattacking. Besides, they had way stronger weapons than the enemy. Silphy then told Danan she wanted to go on the front line with Kosuke too. It was dangerous, but it will be more dangerous to send Kosuke alone there. In this case, they can protect each other's backs. And anyway, Silphy was one of the strongest warriors here, so there shouldn't be any problem. Danan apologized for being arrogant and acknowledged the princess's choice, so the counterattack plan was accepted by everyone, and for the next four days, they were preparing for it. Food, clothes, and weapons. Kosuke wanted to do his best, and for that he needed to sleep well. Kosuke entered the room and was met by the harpies there. Well, he didn't know they would be there. But what were they doing actually? Kosuke asked them straightly and got a straight answer. Silphy wanted to spend some time with him and that's it. She just felt like death might catch them one day and what day it would be no one knows, especially during the war. Despite the harpies having such a positive mood, Kosuke felt the tense atmosphere. Anyway, Silphy wanted him to have a good time. They also revealed the fact that they were training hard all this time while Kosuke was sleeping. Wait. That's illegal. Kosuke didn't know he was that kind of a toy for them. Aira also was here. She almost finished cooking dinner. It's time to eat. First he didn't get what it was, but it looked tasty anyway. Kosuke really liked it. The next day they gathered on the square to meet the forces from the main fort. Melty was in a very good mood. She also noticed Kosuke got along with all the girls. She wanted to join his harem too. But well, other girls were jealous and aggressive, but was it an actual problem for their relationships? Well, yes, Kosuke would be glad to have a choice in this world. Anyway, there's no time for fooling around. They had to go prepare for tomorrow. After that, they bid farewell and went outside to build a new fortress. Kosuke made it in a few hours as always. What a horrific power. 
Kosuke built it right in front of the enemy's fortress. It was their plan on conquering the enemy's territories. At nighttime, all the preparations were almost done. They planned to start in the morning. Then Kubi appeared to say they were ready. Danan got it and wished them luck. Nice job. All the forces surrounded the enemy's fortress. They planned their attack very well, so there shouldn't be any problem. Silphy looked at Kosuke and asked if he felt alright. Kosuke was actually calm to his own surprise. And then finally, the dawn. A perfect time to attack the enemy. Silphy drew her blade and everyone else too. Then finally, she gave a sign. Attack the enemy. Thanks for watching the video. Long time no see with this cool manga, I guess. We will wait for more chapters to make you feel happy for another time. And as always, I want to ask you to write a word in your comment. This one. The more comments I see, the more motivation I get for making more cool recaps for you. And also, don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to my channel if you still didn't. See you later, my friends. This intriguing story begins with the crown prince breaking off his engagement to an aristocrat named Anastasia in front of a larger audience. Anna, who does not comprehend him, questions his decision. The crown prince stares at her with distaste and then points to Amy, stating, she should be his fiancé because she is kind and has healing abilities. Why it seems to me that Amy is negative character? Anna questions his decision once more because Amy is not an aristocracy. The crown prince becomes enraged and yells at her, emphasizing that she bullied Amy. Other kids who have been observing all of this start gossiping and mocking our beauty. Anna, on the other hand, is not afraid. She took off her glove from her hand and threw it towards the crown prince, after which our main character wakes up from sleep. Everything was fresh in his mind. It turned out to be a scenario from a video game he'd played previously. Alan is the name of our hero and he resides in Rurden, the capital of the Kingdom of Saint Laurent. He is eight years old and appears to live a regular life, but he suddenly remembers a previous life in which he played a magic school game, and the world in which he now lives is this Otomy game. But the scenario is far from ideal because both the residents of this city and he will perish. In brief, let's return to the game's plot, to the scene in which Anastasia throws her glove to Amy and challenges her to a duel. Instead of her, the crown prince comes out against Anastasia, forcing her to fight him herself, which she loses. She decides to depart for a convent, embarrassed. She is attacked by bandits and disappears on the way, but that isn't the worst of it. The bandits that attacked Anastasia were sent by the Crown Prince, causing a loss of balance and the outbreak of civil war. The Eastern Empire attacked the kingdom, taking advantage of the country's chaos. The exhausted royal army was unable to continue the struggle and their kingdom fell, and many people perished in the city. And Alan could not allow such a plot to continue and harm his life. Hearing his shouts, his mother entered the room where Alan was standing absolutely naked. But the worst part is that mom and he handled it normally. But he is still child, so I guess it's okay. He explained that he had a bad dream and his mother called him for breakfast, smiling. The key reason for the plot change was his mother's rescue. Although he brought back memories of his previous life, this life and the people in it remained dear to him. As a result, our hero strikes a stance and delivers a regular speech about saving the city and changing the plot. We all have a lot of doubts regarding his universe and plot, though. He has breakfast with his mother while explaining the story. Crown Prince Carl Heinz is currently 8 years old, just like Alan, and has announced his engagement to Anastasia. There are now 8 years till the main storyline. Did our guy, on the other hand, play an Otome game for girls with a dick? And the reason for this is his sister, who then requested him to beat him in the game. While we were debating why Alan desired Anastasia, a carriage carrying a young attractive lady named Anastasia appeared on the road. Anastasia and Alan's eyes met, and she looked back at him in surprise as she passed by. The carriage has left, and we now need an explanation for this lady's rescue. Alan doesn't know what he needs to do to stop the main plot and moreover he doesn't want her to die. Nastya, I'll shorten her name now, is a villain in the game, yet she's a nice person. She spoke to the Crown Prince and other characters in the game about how everyone should fulfill their duty to the state and respect the commoners. Al is still able to negotiate a slight and successful price reduction with the vendor. He felt bad for Anastasia, who had such a bad narrative. Someone's huge and elastic boobs rammed into him when he was thinking about Anastasia's awful situation. A dream, not life. And Mamma Mia, she's adorable. This girl's name was Monica and Alan recognized her. Monica began stroking Alan's head and suckling him as he tried to apologize for his inattention. Monica was on her way back from doing some shopping for the guild where she worked. She said him farewell and implored him not to grow up like the other adventures. Alan is uneasy every time he sees her, yet if we were you, we would be grateful for fate. At this point, he recalls something and approaches her, asking for a favor. In the next scene, Alan was with his scared mom at the guild, where scary and strong adventurers asked what he wanted from them. Thus, 
his first step towards changing the plot began. The guild's adventurers were perplexed as to what he required. When Alan's mother asked him why they went to guild, Al loudly asked them to give him the opportunity to clean the dirt from the ditch. Everyone was stunned, but the adventurers cheerfully accepted. They requested that his mother to complete the paperwork for him to join the guild. Because of the adventurers, his mother appeared frightened and scared. Al was instructed to splatter a drop of blood on the guild card, which shocked mother. His mom's horror transformed into a sigh of relief as she was informed that all she needed was a mere drop in the bucket. Our hero sealed the deal by letting a drop of blood fall onto the card, officially marking his initials with the guild. He was then reminded not to lose his card in the shuffle. Alan glanced at the map, recognizing that this marked his maiden voyage towards changing the game's plot. But true to form, Monica swooped in once again, this time out of the blue, to offer her congratulations on his guild membership, greeting him with a friendly pat on the back. Alan's mom, on the other hand, couldn't help but shed a tear of joy while wishing him the best of luck. Alan's confidence soared, and he was ready to take the bull by the horns. Alan changed into work clothes to go to the ditch. First of all, in order to change the plot of the game, he needed to make sure that this is the true world in the game, and secondly, to earn a lot of money. To save the city and mom, he needs to save the villain, change the plot, and fight the crown prince in a duel. Alan started to clean up the dirt from the ditch so small and already cleaning up someone's shit. Once his dirty work was completed, a bespectacled man made him an offer he couldn't refuse to take the plunge into the sewers. Alan eagerly embraced this stinky job because, according to the game's storyline, the sewers concealed a needle in a haystack, a secret scroll that held the key to the plot. Eight years down the line in the game's timeline, Amy and her companions would seek refuge in the sewers, finding a silver lining, a secret passage, and a scroll in a hidden chamber. The sewers, it seemed, were the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow where Alan would confirm the game's plot. Alan reached the wall where the scroll was hidden. He triggered a secret passage, revealing the scroll. He wondered if there might be a trap, but he decided to retrieve it anyway. His height was a short, but he used his broom cleverly to grab the scroll. Upon opening it, he found the concealment skill, similar to what Amy had in the game. Alan gained the concealment skill, confirming that this world was indeed the same as the game. With newfound confidence, Alan returned to his fellow workers and began cleaning the sewage, all the while contemplating how he could change the game's plot. After working in the sewer, everything stank terribly and the workers told Alan to bathe. They all undressed and went into the bathing tent, but they were waiting for a surprise called Naked Monica. Everyone froze in surprise, someone got hard, maybe it was me, but everyone ran out of the tent together. However, Monica grabbed Alan and dragged him into her tent. Monica took charge of washing Alan, warning him that his mother would scold him otherwise. Not having Monica's clothes confused Alan. He looked at her in fright and realized that she was waiting for him to, what? None of us knows, but his screams were heard by others, and after washing, his ass glistened with cleanliness. Other workers realized that it was time for them to put some clothes on themselves. Seriously, naked people here are something normal, apparently. A nudist's paradise. Back home, he decided to use the power of concealment to see his performance. He tested the skill on his mom, who came from shopping. As it should be, she didn't see him. Alan scared his mom from, and she asked in surprise how long he's been here. Alan replied that from the very beginning. The experiment seems to have been successful, and the ability is deactivated after a long time of use. Afterward, he handed his earnings to his worried mother. She urged him to be careful and focus on his studies. And as for school, he didn't have to be able to read and write. But geography and history were necessary to get into the Royal Academy. With the concealment skill mastered, Alan set his sights on acquiring the appraisal skill, even if it meant venturing into a goblin lair. Alan hits the road and saw only horned rabbits around. Even though they weren't monsters, he still used a concealment to move freely. Our cheater couldn't find the ruins and had to go back to the city. Thanks to his disguise, he calmly walked past the Knights of the Guard. However, it was already the second day of his search. On the third day, he saw a strange fight between rabbits. On the fourth day, it started to rain and Alan got sick. His mom and everyone else were worried about his condition. But even being dog-tired, Alan told everyone that he was fine. On the fifth day, he found the ruins. And finally, his hard search was justified. Happily, he was trying to climb the stairs to the entrance to the ruins, but unexpected he saw something and hid behind a stone, trembling with fear. It turned out that these were goblins who shouldn't have been here. Alan froze in fear and did not know what to do now. There were goblins in the ruins, which horrified Al, because it was far cry from the previous plot of the game. 
Luckily Al successfully turned on his concealment skill and managed to hide from the goblins. He felt a sense of dread because the plot had changed and this was a tall order for him. He calmed himself down, gathered his thoughts, and believed in his ability to disguise. As he wished, he was able to pass through the goblins unnoticed and reach the basement. He went down and found glowing moss on the walls thanks to which there was light in the basement tunnel. After walking a little more Al found that small room, but to his surprise it was full of treasures which was different from the plot of the game. Suddenly a goblin appeared behind him. Al was scared and closed his mouth so as not to scream. These treasures were clearly dragged by goblins which meant a change in the plot. The goblin began to sniff and sort of detect Al's scent. Alan covered his nose so as not to feel the stench, and thanks to another goblin who hit the one that was sniffing, he was able to escape and remain unnoticed. Al fell down and breathed a sigh of relief. The game's plot has changed due to Al's previous actions. However, still to his luck, he was able to find a scroll in ground which the goblins did not notice. Nervous, Al walked past the goblins and successfully got out of the ruins and was able to walk to his town. Before entering his city, he decided to get the appraisal. He opened the scroll and received a skill that was displayed on his adventurer status window. He was delighted with that and now moved on to a new step in his business, sewage treatment. Two weeks later, he came to the guild where he saw how many adventurers, including his uncle, were busy with filling out a document and discussing. Al became interested in what they were doing here and Uncle Rudolph informed him that they had found a nest of goblins in an old maze and that now they were developing a plan to destroy them. Al was surprised and thought to himself that taking the scroll was a good idea. But anyway, in the future, scroll had to be found by Amy. Uncle said that there were a lot of goblins because of the treasures and soon a team of adventurers would go to them to clear the maze of goblins. Al thought that his uncle was also going to join the conquest team. Then his uncle announced that he was stopping adventurism, which greatly surprised Alan. The uncle showed his fake right leg to Alan and said that the arrow with poison got into his leg and he had to remove it by replacing to new leg. He can perform daily routines, but in battle he will only be a burden. He explained that his new leg works with magic and Alan was amazed by this. Uncle, with a bright smile on his face, said that Al would fight with a sword in the future, which pleased Alan. Suddenly, Uncle Rudolph was called by other subordinate adventurers who began to ask him for advice regarding their mission. Although he retired, everyone appreciated him which made him a role model for Al. But Alan still needs to continue cleaning drains as before. After getting the appraisal, now he is going to get the skill Alchemy. At home, Al got ready and put on his good clothes. Ara, Ara, McBoy's all jacked up. He warned his mother that he would be there only in the evening, but like any mother, she thought that Al was going on a date with a girl. An alchemy scroll priced at a steep 15 million seemed like an impossible goal for Alan, who currently had only 5 million in his possession. Determined to find a way, he headed to the market where various sellers offered their wares. Thanks to his newly acquired appraisal skill, he could assess the true value of items. One particular item caught his eye, an earring. His diamond eye revealed that it was both rare and had the remarkable ability to enhance a person's strength, all at an affordable price. He inquired about the earring's availability, but was informed that only one was in stock. The seller explained that he had received it as repayment for a debt, and although he hinted at Alan getting it for a girlfriend, he quickly backtracked. Alan purchased the earring, intending to sell it to other adventurers for a profit, using his appraisal skill to his advantage until he accumulated the 15 million needed for the alchemy scroll. Returning to the guild with his newfound rare items, Alan showed the gloves with the earrings to Rudolph who was genuinely surprised. Alan requested an appraisal of these items and Rudolph was tasked with the assessment. He looked at them a little and thought about it, then went to call an expert, asking Al to wait. After a careful examination, an expert confirmed that the earring was indeed rare and could enhance a person's strength. Rudolph told Alan that since he wanted to sell the earrings, the guild would buy them, that Al didn't get bad people. He asked the expert to prepare everything and warned Al to be careful with selling such things to wrong people, and Alan replied that he understood. However, there was one more thing he wanted to ask from Uncle, and it was, to teach him to fight with a sword. His training with Rudolph had already begun, and Al was trying hard to work with the sword, while Rudolph Sensei was teaching him how to hold a sword properly. Alan, however, had one more request. He asked Rudolph to teach him sword fighting. His training under Powerful Uncle had already begun, and despite the sweat and fatigue, Alan was determined to learn. Rudolph imparted wisdom, emphasizing that strength came from training one's technique and body. He told Alan that weapons were just tools and the true source of strength lay within. Al, barely holding on to his leg, replied with agreement. 
As Rudolph said, the main character thought he could read using skills, but physical strength and skills played a much bigger role. Rudolph then surprised Alan by ordering him to run 100 laps around the room, pushing him to strengthen his spirit. Rudolph and Monica watched him run and cheered him on. Exhausted, Alan complied, falling to the floor afterward. Rudolph's motivational words echoed in his ears, reminding him that he needed to become strong to protect his loved ones. Alan was committed, understanding the importance of his training. He continued his journey, practicing swordsmanship with Adolf, buying and selling items in the market, and even cleaning the drain. By the age of 11, he had managed to accumulate the necessary funds to purchase the coveted alchemy scroll. Alan got dressed and decided to go outside. Her mom wondered if he was going to the market and asked him to come before it got dark. Alan said goodbye to his mother and left the house. All this time, he was busy working, training, and studying. And finally, after two years, he achieved his goal by collecting the right amount of money. Alan went to a very dubious place and covered his face by activating a concealment. The people in the area looked intimidating. Al went down the stairs to the basement where he found a rules store. Disabling the disguise, he tried to open the door, but the door was magically sealed. Activating appraisal, he read aloud the words that need to be said to open the door, and it worked. Inside the shop, he encountered a suspicious old woman in a hood. She asked him what he was looking for, to which Alan replied that he needed an alchemy scroll. She quoted a price of 14 million and began searching through her belongings. Alan couldn't help but feel uneasy amidst all the strange items in the shop. The old woman handed him a scroll, claiming it was an alchemy scroll, but thanks to his appraisal skill, Alan realized it was a fake. Confronted about her deception, the old woman acknowledged his diamond eyes, then replaced the fake with a real alchemy scroll. Alan used his guild card to pay for the genuine article and quickly left the shop, eager not to return to such a place again. Thus, his efforts over the years came to an end with a cheat skill like alchemy. Alan's mom was understandably upset when he returned home late. She scolded him and urged him to get some rest. After exchanging goodnight wishes with his mother, Alan went to his room where he read a few books and remembered that he had a final school exam the following day. In his world, primary school began at age 12, and thanks to his prior knowledge, he had already graduated from high school at the age of 11. In the royal city, there were both primary and secondary schools that offered free education. However, many students didn't proceed to secondary school as it was considered necessary to prepare for high school. High school focused on basic subjects, local products, the country's political situation, and commoner etiquette. At school, Alan was called by his teacher and informed that his final exam would begin soon, and he followed her. His teacher turned out to be a very nice lady who was amazed that Al was graduating from school at 11 and wished him good luck. Al thanked her. His teacher gave him a piece of paper with a task and fixed the start time of the exam. But as Al said, the questions were very easy, where it was only necessary to remember everything. But only the geography was a bit complicated. Al raised his hand and announced that he had finished the test. His teacher was extremely surprised, saying that little time had passed, but Al said that he had finished everything. This worried his teacher and in a panic she started asking him to check his answers again. However, Al said he was confident and handed in his answers. A week later, Alan's results came out and his teacher was excited and happy to report that he passed, saying that he scored a perfect score in all subjects. She started praising him loudly and was very excited with joy, which is why many students heard it. She calmed herself down and asked if he wanted to go to high school. Al, of course, agreed, but his teacher warned him that he would have to wait four years before entering high school, and Al said with a smile that he knew this and would wait. He said that it was strange that you could skip classes, but you could enter high school only at the age of 15, to which his teacher agreed. Al said he could contact him after graduation through the Adventurers Guild or through his mom. His teacher understood everything and, grabbing his hand, happily congratulated him once again. All the students started applauding and congratulating him, which greatly embarrassed Alan. With his high school graduation celebration, his mother could only afford simple fare like white bread, but to Alan it felt like a feast, and he was grateful for his mother's presence. She gifted him a special dismantling knife, and Alan was deeply touched, realizing that it must have been a significant expense for her. From these thoughts, Alan began to cry. His mom hugged him and began to calm him down, saying that she wanted him to be happy and not overwork too much. He vowed to cherish the knife and protect it. It's really a very touching scene. He said he would save money for high school and protect it at all costs. As he turned 12, Alan received a notification allowing him to take the high school exam and bypass the age limit. He also officially became an F-ranked adventurer. Though three years remained before the main plot of the game unfolded, Alan was determined to change everything. 
Suddenly, Monica playfully attempted to embrace him from behind, but Alan swiftly dodged her. Her congratulatory words drew attention from everyone in the guild who celebrated his achievement. Though he considered himself an adult in the eyes of the guild members, he was still just a child. Uncle praised his skills, acknowledging that Alan lacked the divine protection of a warrior. This divine protection, a blessing from the gods, granted special abilities in their world. Rudolph had the divine protection of a swordsman, which allowed him to retain certain skills even after suffering injuries. The heroine of the game. Amy has a healing skill, and the crown prince has fire and a hero. But Al didn't have that, so he needed to get it before the high school. Al questioned what he needed to do to become an E-rank, to which Uncle replied that he just needed to close the affairs of the F-rank and he would become an E-rank. The tasks of the F-rank turned out to be easy, like killing a horned rabbit and so on. Confident in himself, Al said that he would start from tomorrow. Two days later, Alan returned to the guild with herbs and magic stones from horned rabbits astonishing the other adventurers. Although he had hesitated to harm the defenseless creatures, he had ultimately completed the tasks. Rudolph praised him, and as an E-ranked adventurer, Alan had more opportunities at his disposal. At home, Al was cleaning a knife given to him, with which he dealt with the horned rabbits and was grateful to his mother. Now, Alan faced the challenge of acquiring divine protection. The only path to it lay through the Valley of Flying Dragons, a seven-day journey. There, he hoped to obtain the Book of the Wind God, which would enhance his wind magic abilities, crucial for his high school exams. Thus began his adventure into the unknown. In the game, the dragon is angry at Amy for killing his husband, to which she says a typical stupid phrase of the main character explaining her reason, but the dragon attacks her in a rage and Amy has no choice but to use her power against her, which seemingly kills the dragon. The dragon attacks Amy from behind, and the crown prince cuts the dragon's head, covering Amy. Amy starts crying for what she did, and the crown prince, hugging her, calms her down. And this event... The Book of the Wind God was in a game that Al had played in a previous life, and right now Al was heading there. Al understood the feeling of the wyvern, whose husband was killed and precious objects were taken away, and Amy's feelings seemed empty then, which I will agree to. She seems like a very hypocritical bitch to me. Al gave his grandmother coins for a ride and said goodbye to her, thanking her. He prepared himself and found a place in a nearby village that is closest to the Flying Dragons, and now he will start his journey. He was interested in stories about a demon that lives on top of a mountain, but he didn't want trouble, so he continued to use concealment as usual. Al was climbing the mountain and thought it was vital to prepare for mountain climbing. But then a dragon flew directly over him. He was on one of the cliff's tops when he beheld an incredible sight and a swarm of dragons that astounded him. A wyvern is a subspecies of a dragon that only varies in that it cannot breathe fire. If this is the case, wyverns are simply demons that are lesser than dragons. He didn't have time to squander, so Al decided to build a computer in this location, using an alchemy skill which is typically used to build and improve something. He dug himself an underground shelter for the night, Minecraft in real life. By improving his skills, he can create vans and huge fortresses. In the last fight, there is even an item that weakens Anastasia. In this way, Al can build a temporary house for himself with the help of the alchemy skill. He touched his knife and thinking about his mother, wished him a good night. The next morning, he returned the earth to its shape again and set off, turning on concealment, because in the game, the wyverns attacked those they saw all the time. After walking his way, Al finally found the stairs to the Temple of the Wind. When he went up there, he found the black wyvern lord sleeping. This made him tremble, and he decided to leave and explore elsewhere in this situation. He was abruptly stopped by a voice and a powerful wind blew, and it was revealed to be a naked pervert. Oh, I'm sorry, it was the nude wind god that greeted Al. He was astonished to see him in disguise, and the wind god promised him that he would not kill him. He held the Book of the Wind Deity, which our main character was hunting for. Al was taken aback that he had it, and still couldn't figure out who it was. The wind god apologized, and said that they needed to wake up the lazy wyvern to which Al shouted questioningly, and the wind god savoringly sends a wyvern almost to heaven with one blow like Saitama, the wyvern hits the rocks, but even so, he did not wake up. Therefore, grabbing him by the tail, dragged him back to the Temple of the Wind and asked the wyvern to wake up. Al was perplexed by what was happening. Suddenly, the wyvern opened its eyes and woke up, but he turned out to be a rather timid and cute Lord Wyvern whose name is Jeremy. The wind god introduced him to Alan and Al said it was nice to meet him, but the wyvern was shy and started hiding behind the wind god, but in the end, they shook hands, paws, or whatever. 
However, the wind god's next request that Al find a wife for Jeremy shocked Alan. Alan couldn't understand why the wyvern needs help from him and the wind god said that Jeremy fell in love with a lizard girl named Melissa, whom Jeremy was very shy about. The wind god asked him for this favor, saying that he would give the book of the wind god in return. Although this confused Alan, he had no choice but to agree. The wind god relied on him and disappeared like Ugwe in his time, throwing everything at Shirfu. Alan asked Jeremy to show Melissa San. He showed it to her and it turned out to be very beautiful and white. Jeremy was embarrassed to even look at her. Al noticed the ribbon on her tail and remembered that in the game, Melissa is the boss who needs to be defeated to get the Book of the Wind God. While Al was thinking about this situation and analyzing everything, Jeremy stood next to him in embarrassment. Al asked if he knew anything about her and if he had talked to her at least once, to which the wyvern replied no. He was very surprised and loudly said that he was a stranger and a stalker, which upset our poor wyvern. Al told him to start by being friends with her, so Jeremy approached her and tried to start a conversation with her. However, he stammered a lot. Al, watching all this, thought to himself and realized that he had already failed. Melissa coldly asked who he was and what he needed, but Jeremy couldn't say anything, after which she flew away. She looked at him as if he was trash. Alan's next plan was to give a gift to her. Jeremy replied that a piece of meat would be a good gift, and Al doubted it a little. Al turned to God and asked where Melissa was now. The wind god took him to her. She was sitting by the rock, and Al and the wind god were watching everything. However, the flying head seemed to him creep. Jeremy finally showed up and brought her a live worm as a gift, which greatly frightened Melissa, after which she flew away again. Al gave another idea to improve his appearance and the wyvern flew away, but he flew to Melissa with a lot of flowers on his face, which once again scared her, and she flew away. Jeremy became depressed and thought he had no more chances. Our hero had an idea to dress well, then look fashionable. People trust a person who is well-dressed better than someone who is poorly. He thought for a while and decided to create a tie with the skill of alchemy and using the goblin magic stone. He used skills, a tie appeared in front of him, which suited the wyvern. Jeremy thanked him for that and Al looked tired, as he hadn't expected it to be such a tedious job if he focused on the details. Jeremy tried to hug Alan for joy, but he stopped him, saying that Jeremy was going to crush him. The wind god checked where Melissa was and reported that she was surrounded by dragons. Jeremy, terrified, immediately went to save her and the wind god took Alan with him. Jeremy burst into tears from fear at the thought that someone could harm Melissa. Go Wyvern Kun, save her from the gangbang plot. Jeremy, terrified, ran to Melissa to help her. She gazed in awe, surrounded by dragons, unable to comprehend what they desired. A wyvern flew to her unexpectedly and struck one of the dragons, causing the dragon to be hurled several meters away. The wyvern, enraged, roared at the other dragons to move away from her, and Melissa was astonished to see Jeremy arrive to help her. Other dragons began assaulting Jeremy and he yelled for Melissa to run, but she hesitated and remained still, unsure what to do. Melissa had no choice but to flee, but one of the dragons seized her tail with his jaws and she collapsed. At that moment, the wyvern was filled with strength and he flew up above the dragons to stop them. Melissa was taking off when the pervert god of the wind appeared in front of her and startled her. The dragons pursued them, but the wind god blew the wind in their direction, causing them to fall. Melissa was puzzled and couldn't figure out where people got this ability from, but in front of her stood a reincarnated man and a god. They pointed to Jeremy, saying he came to her rescue and defeated all of the dragons. However, Jeremy became exhausted and began to collapse to the ground when the wind god intervened to save him. Melissa, on the other hand, was the first to fall and cover him with herself. When the wyvern opened his eyes and discovered that he was lying on top of her, he panicked and became embarrassed. Melissa shoved him away, claiming he was heavy. Jeremy begged her forgiveness and just as he was about to fly away, Melissa grasped his tail and thanked him for saving her. Lucky man. Jeremy fell from happiness after she kissed him on the cheek or whatever they have there. Al stared at them, pleased that he had completed his mission. As promised, the wind god provided him with divine protection. It turned out to be a very quick process. Pervert god bid Melissa and Jeremy farewell, promising to bless them when they married. Al thought that he was very strange and now thought about how this could affect the future because Amy was supposed to receive divine protection. Jeremy praised Al for his assistance, but Al stated that it was solely because of Jeremy's hard work. The wyvern felt uneasy and wanted to thank him, but Al merely advised him to avoid this temple for the next four summers. Mel also expressed gratitude to Alan for the tie he made for Jerry. And of course, our lovely wyvern was humiliated. Melly vowed to assist Al whenever he needed it, and Alan agreed. Melissa whacked Jeremy with her tail to get him to calm down and stop being humiliated. She grabbed him and told him it was time for them to find their nest, after which they bid Alan farewell. 
Al was pleased that he had coped and that he was finally able to receive divine protection. But before returning to his town, Al wanted to build a glider, the fastest way to travel, because unlike a carriage, it can travel long distances more than 100 km. Al set a goal to build a motor glider powered by magic and drew its appearance. Although he did not think of building a glider right now, but after receiving divine protection, he decided to speed up the process. In a previous life, he was an aeronautical engineer and also a pilot of an airplane that he built with his friends from high school for some kind of competition. Having come up with a plan, the next morning he went to the field where he used his strength to clear the space. He was still ashamed to say the wind spell out loud. Thanks to the blessing he received, he received several skills and his power increased from F to D. While he was clearing the field of grass, Al was grateful to the creep god. Having cleared the hookup, he has now started creating a glider. He used his alchemy skill to put his drawing into the magic circle. Both the runway and the magic circle were built using the alchemy skill. Al used magic stones and wyvern bones, which Jeremy defeated as well as charcoal. After melting them and placing them in a magic circle, he built a glider. Being satisfied with his work, he decided to try to fly it. Using wind magic and fixing the system, Al activated his power, gradually strengthening the power. Suddenly, the leader moved quickly and it became difficult for him to control him. However, he decided not to stop and continued it. Turning on the V1 and VR speeds, Alan was finally able to soar up. Feeling the wind, Alan conquered the sky. Now, Al decided to head to his town of Rurden. At a bird's eye view, everything looked very beautiful. At the height, he noticed that he had forgotten to pick up some of his things and decided that he would pick her up later. Al hadn't flown since his university days, so these feelings of adrenaline and calmness were incredible for him. And on Earth, the glider was noticed by our future teenage antagonist, Anastasia. She pointed with her hand at a strange bird that doesn't flap its wings and just flies straight, but her friend thought it was probably a wyvern. Alan had already arrived at the royal city, and as soon as he thought about landing, he realized that he had not calculated it. Al couldn't land in the city, so when he saw the river, he decided to land there. He had little time to think about how best to land, and he just landed across the river with his raven man, who, touching the water, began to be uncontrollable and broke into pieces. Al, thank God, turned out to be unharmed. Coming out of the water, he took off his clothes and hung them out to dry. He was extremely lucky that the very things remained intact, but the glider could not be saved and it began to evaporate, since it was created with the help of the power of alchemy. Although he was able to take off, he lost the most important items like a femur and a wyvern wing. At the guild, Rudolph met Alan, saying that they had not seen each other for a long time and he wondered why his clothes were wet. Al explained that during the trip, he accidentally fell into the water. Rudolph spoke his wisdom to Alan again. Monica, passing by, seeing Alan's wet clothes, was angry at Rudolph, thinking that he had poured water on him. But they both explained that Al had fallen into the water himself. Monica, taking advantage of the opportunity that he got wet, wanted to swim with him, but Alan managed to escape from her. Monica puffed up her face, offended by him, but Rudolph said that Alan was no longer a child after all. In their world, souls with clean water are very expensive, but even so, it is quite developed and useful for people. Al, after showering, sold the items he got during his first investigation and after having dinner with his mother, fell asleep. Reflecting on the failures he had encountered as an engineer, Alan realized he had overlooked many essential details when creating the glider and even lost some of his items. In his previous life, he wouldn't have allowed such carelessness, leading him to believe that his thinking skills had regressed to that of a child's in his new body. He understood that he needed to be more meticulous. While he had created a glider, he had discovered a limitation. His magic could only control one task at a time. This meant he couldn't simultaneously operate multiple systems on the glider. His goal was to modify the glider's frame to allow for vertical takeoff and landing VTOL, without requiring a runway. However, he couldn't control all the glider's functions at once. This is where the multiple chanting scroll came into play, a skill he couldn't fully explain. He knew it was located in a somewhat dangerous place, but Al believed he could handle it. The next day, Alan built an improved version of his glider, special aircraft designed for this mission. Seated comfortably on the glider, he activated his wind god magic, giving him the appearance of a seasoned pilot. Al had learned that precision in his schematics was crucial when using the alchemy skill, as the final product depended on it. In the game, Amy could create complex items with ease thanks to her exceptional magical abilities, but Alan didn't possess such powers. Additionally, he had to carefully consider the materials required for his creations, as this played a vital role. However, he discovered that he could substitute materials with similar properties, which expanded his possibilities. With his glider ready, Alan soared into the sky, making his way toward his destination, the Tower of Sage. 
The Tower of Sage is the place Alan aspired to for multiple chanting scroll. His height conquered Al and he was amazed. Soaring even higher, Al was able to reach the top of the tower. The scroll was located in the highest part of the tower. Al used the magic of the wind engine and grabbed the parachute jumped out of the glider. While the glider was falling, Al cast a spell and with the help of it was able to summon a parachute with the help of the wind. The aircraft crashed into the tower but Al was able to remain unharmed. It looked like some kind of scene from a Fast and Furious movie. After safely landing at the tower, Alan stowed away the parachute. Although he felt a bit shaken by the experience, he had successfully infiltrated the tower through a hole in the wall, just as he had planned. Alan successfully managed to acquire the Chantless Scroll through a clever maneuver with his glider. He had initially been faced with the prospect of descending through the tower's lower floors teeming with terrifying monsters. However, his resourcefulness prevailed. Upon opening the chest, Alan discovered the coveted Scroll of Multi-Chanting and promptly made the purchase. His status window immediately displayed information about him gaining this new skill. With the scroll secured, he knew he had to exit the tower quickly before it could repair the breach in the wall he had created. His plan involved jumping from the building with a parachute, a prospect that filled him with dread. However, he had the multi-chanting skill now. Legend had it that long ago there was a sorcerer who used his magic to aid people. What set him apart was his unique ability to control magic spells without the need for repetition. Tragically, he had become lost on his way to the elf village while carrying ingredients for a potion and had perished. His spirit had transformed into the Chantless Scroll. According to local lore, he still awaited someone capable of fulfilling his wish to help others in the Forest of Illusion. Now Alan's quest was to obtain the Chantless Scroll, and his destination was the elf village within the Forest of Illusion. Flying his glider, Alan had initially thought he had no business with elves and that this trip could serve as a test for his VTOL aircraft allowing him to perform a vertical landing. As Alan examined the map, he realized that he was in a nearby village near the Forest of Illusion. However, the map provided by the guild was somewhat confusing to him. Lost in the sky, Alan became concerned about the potential dangers lurking in the forest. He knew there were powerful demon monsters that he wouldn't stand a chance against. The sun was setting, adding to his worries. Fortunately, he spotted a village from the sky and it seemed like a suitable place to land. Alan activated the vertical engine on his glider and managed to land safely. Using multiple magical spells to accomplish this left him exhausted. As Alan began to conceal his aircraft, he suddenly found himself facing a group of elves from the settlement. They had their weapons drawn and arrows pointed at him. Alan was taken aback but he complied with their commands. They captured him and brought him before their chief. The chief questioned him about his presence in their village. As Alan tried to explain himself, one of the elves applied pressure to his throat, accusing him of lying. The chief intervened, instructing them to stop. She explained that their village was protected by magic, and humans and demons couldn't leave the forest. Alan mentioned that he had come from the sky, which surprised the chief. However, one of the elves continued to push Alan with a stick, convinced he was lying. Alan decided not to reveal everything about himself and simply stated that he possessed the divine protection of the Wind God. This declaration left the elf leader extremely astonished. The elf leader sighed with relief, thankful that Al hadn't fully comprehended the situation. Al was directed to a beautiful elf woman who confirmed his divine protection and implored him to save their village. Al was puzzled by this request. The elf explained that their village faced a problem with the forest spirit which had been drawing closer and closer to their settlement. Al wondered if it was an evil spirit and the elf confirmed his suspicion, mentioning that it was pursuing them and other spirits. Thankfully, due to the spirit's slow movement, no one had been harmed yet, but it was only a matter of time. Al questioned why they couldn't handle the issue themselves since it fell under the jurisdiction of the clergy. The elf girl acknowledged the strained history between humans and elves but earnestly requested his assistance. However, their conversation was interrupted by the arrival of the princess of the elven village, who was vehemently against Al's help. Her mother, the elf leader, ordered her to leave, but the princess named Sherry was defiant. Their dispute was interrupted when one of the elf warriors reported the presence of an evil spirit in the village square. Sherry immediately rushed to the scene, despite her mother and others trying to stop her. Al realized the urgency of the situation and decided to follow. The village's soldiers gathered and sounded the alarm, announcing the presence of an evil spirit in the square. Al was still uncertain about what this spirit might be, but all he saw was a suspicious man in a robe who seemed lost in thought. He questioned whether they were sure he was an evil spirit, leaving the elf leader confused. Al asked for a description of the spirit, and the elf leader described it as a massive black fog that pursued spirits. 
However, Al couldn't see this entity at the moment, so the elf leader shared his power with him, enabling Al to perceive what was happening. But now it looked even worse, as if a pervert was harassing lowly girls. The princess shouted that she would defeat the evil spirit today with her arrow and bow. Alan, concerned that her actions might prove dangerous, attempted to intervene, but she had already released the arrow. To his relief, the arrow's trajectory veered in another direction, narrowly missing him. Frustrated by her failure, the princess seethed with anger. Meanwhile, Alan remained bewildered by the identity of the ominous figure before them. Sherry's mother implored Alan to assist them, and as the evil spirit turned its attention toward him, its menacing presence sent shivers down his spine. Al was at a loss as to what this strange guy was doing. He decided to turn to the sorcerer, to which he responded like a middle-aged virgin, which silenced Al. He asked again if he was a virgin, which he began to deny in confusion, and responded with the name Loringas. Al felt a prison sentence here and asked what he was doing here. The magician began to say that he had come to see the spirit of the elf village, which although it had lived for 1,000 years was just legal. The elves looked at Al in bewilderment, who seemed to them to be talking only to the black fog and thought that he clearly had problems with his head. The magician did not like being called a pervert, but he did not deny that he was a bit strange guy, if you understand what I mean. The sorcerer began to justify himself, saying that he had not touched her and simply admired her and that he would not dare to do such a thing. Alan angrily told him to stop chasing the spirit in that case because she was scared. Seeing that the spirit of the elf village was really scared, the virgin magician could not believe that his actions had scared the cute lowly and was very upset about it. The conversation took a strange turn as Loringas attempted to justify his actions, insisting that he had not touched the spirit but had merely admired her. He assured Al that he would never dare to harm her. However, he couldn't just leave because he needed to go to the elf village. Al said that this was the village of the elves, which greatly justified the pervert. He stated that he would now be able to make an elixir and he needed to meet the elf queen. When he saw her, he decided to rush to her for a request, but Al advised the magician to cease his pursuit of the spirit, as her current state of fear was clearly inappropriate. The desperate magician asked Alan to take the petals of the spiritual tree and honey from the elves, promising to leave once he had them. Al relayed the magician's request to the Elf Queen who promptly requested the required items. Loringas verified the items and expressed his gratitude to Mr. Allen before leaving the village. The villagers of the Elves were overjoyed at his departure and expressed their heartfelt gratitude. Sherry, despite her initially abrasive demeanor, acknowledged Al's assistance and noted that, for a human he wasn't all that bad, in a rather cute, sunder manner. The Elf Queen extended an invitation for Al to remain in the village, which he accepted. In the evening, Al went to the hot springs to unwind. While he had played through the game multiple times, the events that had unfolded today were entirely new to him. Lost in thought, he was approached by a muscular elf, an employee of the village head, who offered to massage his back. Al was taken aback by the unexpected proposition but couldn't find it within himself to refuse, and thus, the unexpected Gachimuchi party began. Leaving the hot springs, Al quenched his thirst at the village well and heard a commotion among the villagers. It turned out that the spirit of light had been born, which astounded him. Her Majesty replied that it had been 800 years since the previous spirit of light was born, and that most likely a saint was born in this world. Alan knew this event in the game, but then it happens when Amy finishes the event saving the village from demons, which should happen only in a few years, and the saint may be her. Al couldn't figure out what was going on. The spirit of light flew towards Alan and thanked him for saving him yesterday. It turned out that this spirit of light is our pervert virgin yesterday who, thanks to the elixir, was able to turn into a spirit of light. Alan's jaw dropped down because of shock and he couldn't believe it was Loringa's. Pervert, Kem Kem, lowly spirit of light made a contract with Millie, with an elf girl, which shocked Alan even more. Al informed the Elf Queen about these developments and she rejoiced, congratulating Millie. In the game, the contract was supposed to occur between Amy and the spirit, but this sudden twist had clearly deviated from the established plotline. Lo presented a scroll without chance as a gift, thanking Al for helping him acquire the form of a lolly. The scroll was originally intended for his daughter, but he no longer needed it. 
Al accepted the gift, his face betraying no hint of the confused emotions he was experiencing. After packing his belongings, Al began saying his goodbyes to the village, expressing his gratitude for their assistance. Sherry, in her usual manner, playfully smacked aircraft Alan and questioned if he was off to work again. Her companion attempted to prevent her from hitting Al. The Elf Queen, as a token of gratitude and friendship, presented Al with an amulet containing the prayers of the Elf Village, granting him the official right to visit their village as a hero. Al offered his sincere thanks and left the village, taking off on his glider. As he ascended into the sky, Al expressed his gratitude once more and promised to return. The villagers, including the transformed lowly spirit, bid him farewell with smiles. With the chantless skill in hand, he returned to his hometown, having gathered the necessary strength and funds for his high school enrollment. His mission now was to improve his abilities, level up, and face the impending challenges head on. Arriving at the guild, he announced his intention to hunt goblins. The other guild members expressed their support for him, with Rudolph offering a word of caution to avoid causing distress to his mother. Before departing, Al was suddenly enveloped by a set of welcoming and nurturing hills, leaving him flustered and embarrassed. Monica, the culprit, playfully squeezed him and reminded him to take care of himself and not to overexert. Returning home, Al said his goodbyes to his mother, prepared to embark on his journey to change the narrative and save the villainous. Back in his hometown, Al revisited the shop with the enigmatic grandmother who expressed an interest in honey from the elven village. She offered Al a substantial sum of $2 million, and he readily agreed and received payment with his guild card. The grandma inquired if he could acquire more items for her, but Al explained that it might be challenging for the time being. He also inquired about the availability of magic bags the size of an entire room. The grandmother chuckled at his question, mentioning that such bags could essentially allow someone to buy an entire country if one were available. Although the concept of magic bags wasn't present in the game, it seemed to be a part of this unique universe. After bidding farewell, Al set out to strengthen his skills as an adventurer, which led him to the village of Stroizen. Upon arriving in the village, Al encountered an elderly man tending to his cow. The man greeted him, noting that it had been at least six months since they'd had visitors. While the village offered free accommodations for a few days, he had to cover his own meals. Al intended to hunt goblins, a mission that would yield him approximately 1,500 after factoring in magic stones, with about 2,000 spent on his stay. Goblins weren't typically the most profitable targets for adventurers, as they were of lower value and often roamed in large groups. However, Al possessed a secret weapon, a Kalashnikov assault rifle. When he said getting stronger, I thought he's going to follow Goblin Slayer S path, but no, he went American. Bro used the skill Freedom to create gun. Activating concealment, Al disguised himself within the forest, where goblins often traversed after exiting the labyrinth. He spotted a goblin, took aim, and unleashed a hail of bullets from his machine gun. A single shot hit the goblin's chest and the creature fell lifeless. Al collected a magic stone from the goblin, elated by his success. The Kalashnikov, aptly named the AK-47 Kalash, harnessed compressed wind magic for its projectile propulsion. Although Al initially faced some challenges related to reloading and the magazine mechanism, he eventually overcame them. Formerly frightened of goblins, Al now possessed the power of freedom, allowing him to confront monsters without fear. During the day, Al gathered 12 magic stones by hunting goblins, earning the appreciation of the kind elder who paid him for his work. Al decided to spend more time in the village, leading to a period of regular days where he dined at the guild, hunted goblins, and rested. After a week of goblin hunting, he felt ready to undertake the mission to clear the goblins from the labyrinth, a significant event in the game requiring all goblins to be eliminated for a level increase. The labyrinth contained a core guarded by a goblin boss. Rumors suggested that destroying the core could dismantle the entire maze, but the demons it produced made such a course of action impractical. Al purchased a mana-powered lamp from the guild, a valuable tool for his forthcoming mission. Venturing deeper into the labyrinth, Al encountered two goblins who remained oblivious to his presence due to his disguise, but they couldn't ignore the Kalashnikov's unmistakable firepower. Al took them down with precise shots, eventually making his way to the labyrinth's heart where the goblin boss resided. At the boss chamber, he swapped out his bullets for more potent ammunition. 
In the ensuing boss fight, four goblin subordinates joined the Goblin King, the formidable leader. Al's priority was the elimination of the goblin magicians, known for causing trouble. The noise from the Kalashnikov reduced his stealth, prompting him to reactivate it. He dealt with the two magicians first, before eliminating the remaining two subordinates. This left the furious boss, who swung his sledgehammer wildly in an attempt to strike Al, who skillfully dodged each attack. Nevertheless, the fight was challenging despite Al's practice in the game. Al employed a clever tactic, tossing a substance into the Goblin King's armor, irritating his eyes and causing him to remove the helmet in agony. Seizing the opportunity, Al fired a bullet directly into the Goblin King's forehead. As in the game, the use of water mixed with pepper had worked on the boss. Although the boss's body still moved, Al dispatched him and retrieved a magic stone from his remains. With the mission complete, Al touched the core and exited the labyrinth, thereby conquering it. Back at the guild, everyone marveled at Al's accomplishments. Rudolph, his uncle, even praised him, a rare occurrence after a mission which left Al feeling a mixture of embarrassment and happiness. He bid farewell to the guild members, planning to turn in the goblin boss's magic stone. Monica arrived just in time, eager to embrace him, but Al managed to evade her warm and affectionate welcome. The guild procured the magic stone of the goblin boss, and an achievement related to conquering the labyrinth appeared in Al's status window. His level had now increased, and he possessed sufficient funds to proceed. Now, his level had increased, and there was enough money. So, he came to the guild with his mom, saying that he wanted to find a new home for himself. Returning home, Alan was greeted with the warm embrace of his mother, who was overwhelmed with joy and relief upon his safe return. She regaled him with stories and shared events that transpired during his absence, their simple conversation filling the room with a heartwarming atmosphere. As they sat down for dinner, Alan revealed his desire to purchase a new house. His mother couldn't fathom why he would want to do so, considering they could continue living together, even with potential future children. Alan, confused, pointed out the limited space and the lack of amenities such as a bath, toilet, and pets, as reasons for seeking new accommodations. He expressed his wish for them to live together and manage the household chores, a sentiment that touched his mother's heart. With a gentle smile, she agreed and offered to help him find a suitable home. Thus, they visited the guild. Alan's mother inquired about his behavior within the guild, and the members praised him. Rudolph, the guildmaster, introduced himself and shook her hand, commending Alan's talents and expressing the guild's intent to invite him to their party once he reached level D. Alan recognized the need to consider forming parties in the future, though he was unsure about his response if they were to extend an invitation. The conversation returned to housing, and Rudolph explained that he couldn't recommend any quiet and comfortable options suitable for a mother and child. This understandably concerned his mother. When Alan suggested that Rudolph help him find a suitable house, Monica made an appearance. Monica greeted Katerina, Alan's mother, in a completely different manner than usual. Upon learning of their house hunting plans, Monica invited them to see her own home, causing confusion. However, she clarified that her father rented an apartment and would be willing to show them. After some discussion, Rudolph accepted the offer, and Alan began to grasp the implication of her words. Monica suggested renting the apartment to them for $100,000 a month, which seemed like a reasonable arrangement to Alan. He offered his mother the chance to inspect the apartment, and Katerina asked Monica for her assistance. Before leaving, Katerina decided to address the guild's members. Monica playfully teased Alan about misunderstanding her earlier offer, causing him to blush with embarrassment. After departing from the guild, they made their way to the apartment which was conveniently located just a five-minute drive from the guild. The apartment was situated on the fourth floor and featured a spacious room with two large and two small bedrooms. The view from the window was breathtaking, offering a clear view of the castle. Katerina was amazed at the generous offer and couldn't believe that Monica would provide such accommodations at such a low cost. Monica explained that she saw Alan as an investment, a concept he found difficult to comprehend. Nevertheless, he readily accepted the apartment. In the guild, everyone decided that this was the right choice, and the drunks told him to start moving from today. This drunk got up and started asking everyone to help Alan with the move, which greatly confused our boy. He tried to refuse and didn't want to bother the others, but Jared said he was also working hard and just had to shut up and let them help. 
the adventurers set out to help him and Al didn't know what to do. Monty said it was better to let them help because Al is like a son to them. Her mom was glad that he had so many good people around him. Al felt warmth and joy inside and was even ready to cry and his mom had already started crying. The adventurers set out to transport Alan's belongings, drawing the attention of bystanders on the streets. They successfully moved everything and arranged the furniture in the new apartment. Even with all the furniture in place, the apartment still felt spacious. Jared thanked everyone for their hard work and invited them to his home for a celebration in honor of the move. Kate, with a mug in her hands, sincerely thanked all the adventurers and Monica for their help and for the fact that they always help him. She asked them to be the same, even when Alan could bring trouble, which confused Al. After which, she finished the toast, wishing everyone happiness. Everyone started drinking, and she started meeting everyone. He wanted his mom, Master Rudolph, Monica, and all the adventurers to live a happy life and smile, so he was determined to change fate. Amidst the lively atmosphere, Jared, to everyone's surprise, complimented Katerina's beauty. This led to playful teasing and some participants commending her looks, leaving Alan in disbelief. However, Rudolph, the guildmaster, intervened to prevent any further developments, asserting that he should be the first to make a move, prompting Alan's jaw to drop in shock. Rudolph, in an unexpected turn of events, began to romantically pursue Katerina, to Alan's embarrassment and concern. As the dinner continued, Alan couldn't help but wonder how the guild members could allow this situation to unfold. The next day, Al had been practicing pistol shooting outside the city, and he still needed small hummingbird pistols that could use a bullet with a better trajectory. In addition to Kalashnikov, he also created a smaller version of him, calling him Nikov, and also made FMJ bullets for each of them. What's next, depleted uranium-infused bullets? In the evening, he was taking a bath and his mom joked about joining him, but Al said she couldn't. He has returned to the goblin maze that he attacked earlier, where there are endless enemies with whom he can get money and level up. He explored the maze every day for a week and was able to collect about 100 magic stones. A man from the guild asked if he had something against goblins, but he did not answer and received payment for magic stones and their elimination. She asked Alan to check his status and Al discovered that he had received the title of Goblin Killer. He became Goblin Slayer, but more like Goblin Shooter. There was a wild boar in the forest, which Al shot with his machine gun. Oh no, he killed Inosuke's brethren. Al was located in a forest called Orc Forest, a number of suburban alt mount. Orcs can attack humans, but are also valuable as meat. Residents built a wooded area here to cope with monsters, and Al took up this case to reduce the danger. But in fact, these orcs are from the Great Orc Maze, which is Alan's next goal to level up and get rewards. Al used Hollow Bullet Point, which deformed to expand the area of destruction and primarily used in hunting. Since orcs are very tough, he used hummingbirds and these bullets, and Kalashnikovs for stronger opponents. He decided to go through the maze the next day, and in the evening he enjoyed the meat of the orc, which apparently gave him ecstasy. He even appeared in front of us naked. The next day he went to the Great Orc Maze, where, like in a normal maze, you need to kill weak orcs before getting to the boss. He only took magic stones from them, because there was no place for meat in the bag. As a result, the final boss with the previous average bosses was waiting for him at the end. He decided to use the same tactics as before, first destroying the orcs, sorcerers and priests first, creating a smokescreen and turning on concealment again. However, unexpectedly, the main counter attacked him with magic. Looking up, he saw that the king was controlling him to attack Alan. He needed to separate them, and he created a smokescreen. The monsters were smart and assumed that he would attack from behind, but Al attacked them with chili pepper extract from the other side and threw it at the boss. While the others were frozen in disbelief, Al shot them all with his machine gun. The Orc King's eyes had already healed during this time, and he was a really tough opponent. The monster struck a pose and tore towards Alan. He periodically shot at him, but the bullet bounced off. Al managed to dodge, and the Orc King hit the wall, which scared our man. However, the monster was unharmed. Al started running away and turned on concealment, after which he changed his weapon to a Kalashnikov and decided to aim at his weak point on the body, between the eyes and the heart. The Orc King got angry and ferociously moved towards Alan. 
he did not hesitate and immediately shot at him. The monster hit the wall again and stood up. Al rolled on the ground and was just ready for his next attack when he realized that the Orc King had died. He was hit by a bullet right in the heart and he fell back. Although he didn't have much space in his bag, he decided to take some of this monster's meat. At the very heart of the maze was a treasure, a fertility bracelet that helps for the conception of a child. This confused Alan and decided that it was not not worth adding such things in the mazes. In this way, he conquered the labyrinth of the orcs. Back in the elf village, a sense of tranquility prevailed. The area where the leader used to reside had now become an airport. Alan frequented this place to purchase honey and the villagers were always kind to him, even helping maintain the airport. It was typically a spot for children to play games, with some engaging in archery. Sherry remained consistent in her habit of kicking Alan's aircraft, though he was relieved it wasn't broken. As Alan celebrated his 13th birthday, he was now eligible to advance to level D, having also earned the title of Orc Slayer. The Elf Queen informed him that the honey he had requested was loaded onto his glider, and he expressed gratitude. She told him she wouldn't mind if he didn't pay for it, but Alan insisted, explaining that his mother loved it. She inquired about his next journey, which he revealed would take him to the Wind Mountain Maze. In the game strategy, this maze was known for its level 30 difficulty, far more challenging than the Orc Maze in Dragon Valley at level 15. At the end of the Wind Mountain Maze, Blizzard Phoenix awaited, a formidable opponent that Alan didn't feel prepared to face. The Elf Queen asked about the maze's danger level, but Alan assured her that he could handle it, thanks to the amulet she had gifted him. As they conversed, a peculiar figure, the Spirit of Light approached them, expressing concerns about not joining Alan on his journey, leaving him somewhat relieved not to have such a character following him. In the City of Wind within the Haven Guild, Alan approached the mission to conquer the Wind Mountain Labyrinth, doing so alone. The Guildmaster was surprised by his decision but granted him permission to proceed. It was important to enter the maze with permission, otherwise any items obtained were considered stolen. The Guildmaster specified that Alan should only reach the first level, but Alan assured him that he would proceed with caution. Among the seasoned adventurers undertaking the maze's conquest, Alan's solo approach seemed reckless in their eyes. And here is the Labyrinth of Wind Mountain. The record of conquering the maze of 30 levels is only 8 levels. It's a complicated maze with difficult challenges, but Alan had a trump card up his sleeve. He killed two monster bats with a shot from his new Saiga submachine gun, which is a Russian pistol. Since he has the Nikov, the Kalashnikov, and the Saiga 12, I can look forward to seeing some more Russian gun action. A 94 in RPK come to me? It turned out to be better. Shotguns delighted our man that he even hugged him naked in his fantasies. You need to chill, man. But thanks to his shotgun, he broke the adventurer's record and was able to get to level 28, to the level of tricks with floating islands. If you direct the force of the wind to a small target on the island, then you can move there. But however, you need to do it in the right order, or you will come back or die in the dark. And besides, you have to fight enemies in the air. At the base of one floating island, Alan discovered a hidden treasure room. Instead of the conventional method, he used his smelt skill to create steps and claim the treasure. The reward consisted of rings capable of reviving a person once if they died. Eagerly, he took both rings and proceeded towards the door leading to the main boss. Yet before facing the boss, he decided to seize more treasures. The last boss of the Wind Mountain Maze is Blizzard Phoenix. Phoenix immediately attacked, releasing spikes from the ice, but Alan knew this from the plot, so he made a shield in advance. After passing the first attack, the remaining attacks will only be a combination of concealment and attacks from the machine. One of the bullets hit Phoenix, but he immediately stepped back, and Al tried to turn on the concealment. The date started attacking him with a snowstorm and ice arrows, which slowed down our man. He created a boulder and hid behind it while the phoenix continued to attack him with its magic. Al decided to start using Nikov in the distance and then Saiga. He turned on the concealment and shot at the phoenix, after which he immediately created a boulder and hid behind it. 
He waited until the attack stopped, then came out of hiding and attacked him several times. Phoenix was badly injured, and Al hid behind a boulder again. Coming out of hiding, he saw that the bird was falling, and he also slipped and fell as the ground was frozen. He was able to stop until the moment when the Phoenix fell and remained alive. He finished him off, after which he began to disassemble his body. Surprisingly, the Phoenix's feathers remained even after being removed, creating a beautiful sight. He also decided to collect the bones, which proved to be incredibly lightweight. Inside the treasure chest, he found the Heaven Knight Sword, a weapon that bestowed the blessing of a knight upon the wielder and allowed an upgrade to the Heaven Knight with the additional gift of wind magic. However, the most precious discovery in the maze was the Magic Stone Synthesizer, which enlarged smaller magic stones when combined, raising their value. Alan planned to use the synthesizer upon every return to the maze, and he resolved to keep the details of his progress here a closely guarded secret. Back in the city, Master Rudolph noticed that Alan was still engaged in ditch cleaning. Alan explained that he did this only during his spare time. Rudolph inquired about Alan's plans for the upcoming year, as he was now 14 and eligible to attend high school. Rudolph requested Alan's assistance on a guard-related task that would help him raise his level and reputation. Initially uninterested, Alan attempted to refuse, fearing that it might reveal too much about his battle capabilities. However, when Jared arrived with other adventurers, announcing they were ready to work with him, Alan found himself facing unexpected and persistent demands. Rudolph set a 7 a.m. deadline, and Alan, trapped in a cloud of alcohol-scented breath, realized he had little choice but to comply. Al found himself on an escort mission, accompanying a little girl named Carlin along with his older brother Dirk. Their journey was to a small village where Dirk regularly delivered essential supplies like coal, wood, and dried meat from the royal capital. Carlin, a spirited young girl, had a keen interest in Al's wind magic and the two quickly developed a close bond. A few other adventurers, including the formidable Jared, joined them on this journey, but Carlin was hesitant to get close to Jared due to his intimidating appearance. The route they followed led through a treacherous mountainous area known for bandit activity. It was the responsibility of Al's team to protect the caravan from these threats. Despite the tension of the mission, Carlin and Al got along splendidly and she had grown quite attached to him. Al had left his powerful Kalashnikov and Saiga assault rifles behind, but carried a small Makarov pistol discreetly concealed under his clothes. While he may have appeared formidable to others, Al wrestled with the moral dilemma of whether he could use it against a living, pleading person, unlike the monsters he was accustomed to dealing with. Carlin's sweet interruption broke through his contemplation, and she inquired about his well-being. Jared, meanwhile, issued a warning, explaining that the path ahead would become narrower, making them vulnerable to bandit attacks. The carriage, pulled by horses, pushed forward, but suddenly, a barrage of stones began to rain down from a nearby cliff. These fallen stones obstructed their path, bringing Dirk's carriage to a halt. Bandits swiftly encircled the carriages, closing in from both the front and the rear, brandishing daggers and demanding the goods they carried. The adventurers instructed Dirk to stay inside the carriage while they unsheathed their swords and readied their bows. Amidst this tense standoff, a skirmish erupted with one adventurer successfully striking a blow against one of the bandits. Jared, the leader of the expedition, ordered Al to employ his magical abilities against the bandits. Although Al was proficient in dealing with monsters, he found himself grappling with which technique to use on humans. When one of the bandits nearly lunged at a fellow adventurer, Al swiftly employed his wind magic, injuring the assailant. The other bandits, now aware of his extraordinary abilities, panicked and fled. Jared then instructed Al to eliminate the remaining bandits, but Al's compassion and moral quandaries deterred him, causing the bandits to escape. While the rest of the adventurers celebrated their victory, Jared remained incensed, directing his anger towards Al, the 14-year-old boy who had spared the bandits' lives. Al was bewildered and stated that he couldn't bring himself to kill people. Jared emphasized the need to exterminate such threats threats, comparing them to monsters, as they posed a danger to others in the future. With this stern message, Jared withdrew into the carriage, leaving Al perplexed. His senpai asked him for assistance to remove the rocks from road, and they quickly finished this task. As a result, they were able to get safely to the village, where they were met by villagers and small children who were doing business in the village. They were all overjoyed and ran to them and began to help unload the cargo. 
The girls immediately began to examine the clothes before bringing them inside. Carlin also wanted to look cool and be different than them, but in the end she also reached for a dress that she liked. Dirk started giving everyone the goods they asked for. Al looked at them in silence. Jared asked why the mission would have failed if he was the leader, and Al clearly replied that it was because he didn't kill them. Jared was glad that he realized his mistake and said that there was not so much difference between monsters and these bandits and said that next time he would not delay so much. Al understood his words. At that moment, their conversation was interrupted by Carlin and a bunch of small children who wanted to see his wind magic and Jared left him, leaving him to play with the children. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Al continued demonstrating his wind magic until the children eventually returned to their homes. The evening brought a lively village celebration, a customary event that welcomed male visitors from afar. While the villagers were gracious hosts, this village had an unusual practice of men coming to fertilize the women to prevent their blood from thickening. Al was taken aback when one of the women attempted to approach him in a manner reminiscent of this peculiar tradition. Flustered, Al questioned the unusual customs, wondering if he had wandered into an Otome game. The group intended to stay in the village for three days. The tranquility of the evening was shattered when noise erupted from the neighboring room. Al later observed how the tired men emerged from their overnight accommodations, a common occurrence as they didn't have wives of their own. Al had intended to spend the next day playing with the children, but the village head delivered devastating news. Carlin had been kidnapped. The announcement filled Al with horror and dread for the safety of his young friend. Carlin and other children had been abducted while playing outside the village's protective walls. As soon as Al received this distressing news, he swiftly changed into his adventuring attire. Consumed by guilt and believing that his failure to eliminate the bandits had led to this dire situation, he resolved to save Carlin and the other kidnapped children. He began to blame himself for the whole situation. Al approached Jared admitting that the abduction was his fault for not taking decisive action against the bandits earlier. Jared concurred, but advised Al to remain calm. Jared explained that he would undertake this rescue mission alone since adventurers typically only engage in cases requested by clients. Furthermore, the bandit leader had sent a letter to the village making demands in exchange for the hostages' safety. The letter stipulated that the village should provide them with women, food, and money. Any attempt to thwart their demands would result in the death of the captive children. Jared's words served as a harsh reminder of the grave consequences of their previous encounter with the bandits. As Al fell into a heavy silence, the rest of the adventurers contemplated the difficult situation. Jared then posed a direct question to Al. He inquired whether Al was now prepared to kill the bandits to save the kidnapped children. Recalling Carlin's innocent and endearing smile, Al responded with newfound determination, confirming his readiness to take lives to rescue the innocent. The adventurers decided to accept the village's request, despite the moral dilemmas it posed. In this moment of crisis, Dirk, Carlin's older brother, grasped Al's hand and implored him to save his sister. Al gave Dirk his word, promising to do whatever it took to rescue Carlin. Alan, accompanied by Jared, embarked on a mission to track down and confront the bandits who had kidnapped Carlin and other children from the village. Jared explained that there were only a few places where the bandits could be hiding, and they were a couple of hours away from their current location. They reached a vantage point in the forest from which they could observe the bandits' hideout. The hideout was situated in a cave with a spacious interior, suggesting the presence of around 30 bandits. Alan was determined to approach the hideout stealthily, a decision that Jared initially found to be a reckless idea. However, Alan was confident in his stealth abilities and believed that there might be fewer bandits inside the cave than anticipated. Jared questioned his course of action, asking what he would do if they found about 10 bandits inside. Undeterred, Alan assured Jared that he had a plan in mind. After testing his magic, he asked Jared to trust him in this endeavor, emphasizing the importance of the children's lives being at stake. Jared trusted him, but warned him that if he failed, the children would die. Alan thanked him for his trust and went to their hideout. With his senpai hidden and awaiting his signal, Alan carefully navigated the area. He utilized his concealment magic to render himself virtually invisible, ensuring that he would not be detected as he approached the bandit's hideout, a cave in the mountains. At the entrance of the cave stood a guard who had been present during the attack on the carriage. 
While Alan was incensed by the guard's involvement, he refrained from killing him and proceeded to enter the cave silently. Using his appraisal magic, Alan assessed the cave's interior, revealing that it was much more spacious than he had initially anticipated. Now his primary objective was to locate the abducted children. Inside the cave, he counted about 13 bandits. As he examined the area, he identified three different paths within the cave. Two children were confined in a cage along one of these paths, but Carlin was not among them. Determined to find her, Alan pressed onward, following the sounds emanating from a nearby door. As he opened the door, he was met with a distressing sight, a man attempting to harm Carlin. Overwhelmed with anger, Alan reacted swiftly, using his fists to subdue the assailant until he ceased to pose a threat. Carlin, frightened but relieved, was safe once again. In this perilous situation, Alan extended his hand to her, assuring her of her safety. Carleen, embarrassed and delighted, almost shouted his name, but Al closed her mouth in time, telling her not to make noise, and Carl calmed down. He took her hand and left her in a safe place while he rescued the other children. He closed this room with a stone so that no one could find it. Turning on concealment, he went to the prison room with the children where the guard was sitting. Taking his gun, he hesitated but then shot him in the head, after which the man immediately died. The children seeing him were a little scared and cried, but Al asked them to be quiet. He took them to Carlin and everyone kept calm. Al created a thinner stone and closed the room with it from the inside, after which he asked the children to cover their ears. He drew a seal with a spell on the stone, which was visible from the back to the bandits. The children covered their ears and the bandits could not understand what it was. Al used his power at that moment, after which, all the bandits flew away because of the explosion. Jared was very surprised and realized that this was the signal he was talking about. Alan asked the children to stay inside and he went out to check the situation and saw a bunch of people who were terribly injured but still breathing. He thought about whether he should kill them but decided to prioritize the evacuation of children. At that moment, one of the bandits, who turned out to be alive, decided to attack him with a dagger in his mouth but Jared quickly finished him off. Alan was surprised to see him and felt relieved. He said they had to go back to the village now. Coming out of the cave, Al told Carla that she had done a great job and at that moment she cried a lot and the other children too and rushed to hug him and Jared. The heads of the bandits who had attacked the children were hung on the village's fence as a form of public humiliation. Following this grim task, Bot Senpai instructed Alan to stay and prepare for their journey back to the capital. Meanwhile, he and the other adventurers returned to deal with any surviving bandits. The necessity of killing the bandits, as cruel as it seemed, was emphasized. In a world where failing to defend oneself and strike first could result in death, this grim reality was all too apparent to Alan. It was a harsh lesson, but one he needed to learn. The adventurers loaded their belongings onto the carriage in preparation for their return to the capital. While making these preparations, three children approached Alan to express their gratitude for his heroic actions in rescuing them. They also asked if he would demonstrate his wind magic again someday. Alan happily promised them with a smile, and the children bid farewell as the group prepared to depart. And after the guild finished analyzing the tasks, Alan became the youngest adventurer to receive the C rank and finally turned 15. Katarina was surprised that he was doing a good job with tying a tie and was upset that she couldn't tie it for him. She then hugged him, expressing her pride and wishing him the best of luck. And yes, today was important, and it was the day that we have all been waiting for for so long. Alan finally begins his school life at the Royal Academy. All the new students were greeted by the head of the school and asked them to sit down in their place checking the list. This year, including our young talent, 39 people were enrolled. Alan was able to enter the class second on the list along with all the noble bigwigs. All of his class were aristocrats and commoners were not allowed to communicate with them first so Alan could simply be invisible. At that moment, the one who made Alan blush and his heart beat faster appeared in the corridor. Yes, the main villain of the game is Anastasia Kleiner von Ramslet. She was adorable and she exuded a magnificent aura. She looked in Alan's direction, which made him nervous, but he couldn't believe it. After her, other characters appeared, like Oscar von Wimlet, the son of the Marquis of Wimlet, the richest man in the kingdom. 
and then the bespectacled Marcus von Benz, who has the blessing of a sage and the son of the head of the royal magic, and another one, Leonardo van Juk, whose father is the commander of the royal guard, and Claudia Justin de Westerdale, the prince of another country with the blessing of the first king. They are effective characters in the game, and of course, all the girls were crazy about them. They looked at Alan and said that he was quite ordinary, which made him a little angry. And here comes the main character, His Highness Crown Prince Karl Heinz Bartil von Centralen. All the other girls were just crazy about him and admired him and he really had the aura of a crown prince. And now the main character of this whole story, Amy von Bries, has appeared. Surprisingly, Amy greeted Alan warmly and mentioned that she had known his name. Her unanticipated attention left Alan wondering how she knew him. Amy shared that she had been born into a commoner family and had attended the same school as Alan. She expressed her amazement at his rapid progression through classes with perfect grades, which prompted her to strike up a conversation with him, a surprising and unexpected development in the story. Al had completely forgotten about her, but according to the plot of the game, she should first talk to the prince not to him. She asked if there was something wrong with him, but he said nothing. And as expected from the Otome game, it turned out to be very, very cute. And that's how his school life began. A week after the school's opening ceremony, Alan prepared to move into the school dormitory, indicating that he wouldn't be able to visit for some time. Katerina expressed how much she would miss him and asked if he had made any friends. Although Alan replied in the affirmative, in reality, he had been largely ignored at school. His classmates paid him little attention, and Amy, after becoming the crown prince's girlfriend, had started to ignore him altogether. In a magic lesson, their teacher explained how to activate magic and control the flow of power. He asked who could successfully make magic attacks, and only a few people raised their hands, including Al. The professor asked the crown prince to demonstrate his strength to the others, and he, apparently considering himself to be very cool, agreed. He activated his flame blessing and aimed at the target, after which he successfully hit it. Everyone applauded him, saying that he had done a great job. The next one was Anastasia, who told the crown prince that she would try, but he ignored her. He already had signs of hatred towards her. She activated her power and fired it at the target in the form of an arrow and completely defeated the target. This amazed everyone and they were very surprised. Alan was also surprised, but did not expect this from the final boss of the Autumn game. But unlike the admiration of the others, the Crown Prince got angry, saying that she was mocking him. She tried to say that it was not so, but the Crown Prince got so angry and decided to show his real strength and asked her to move away. She moved away and he activated his power, but suddenly his magic exploded in his hand. She quickly reacted to this and built a wall of ice, preventing further storage and protecting the rest of the students. As soon as she anxiously wanted to approach the crown prince, she saw that Amy was already with him, holding his hand and treating him with her magic. This made our beautiful lady very angry. Alan was worried that Amy's healing power might not work, but she was able to heal his wounds and the crown prince woke up. Anastasia held out her handkerchief, asking if he was okay, but he completely ignored her paying attention only to Amy and thanking her. Amy embarrassedly began to say that she couldn't do anything else after seeing Carl in such a state, which angered Anna a little and just left the two of them. Alan remembered that in the game this event ends faster, but apparently in life, treatment takes longer. And then Amy grinned, I don't like her, she seems like that kind of scum. After this incident, Amy and Crown Prince Carl became very close and the jealousy of the other girls began to show. They all insulted her and didn't even try to hide it. These were Anastasia's friends who supported her, but in the game after the Civil War, they disappear. At that moment, Anna appeared and said that they should be ashamed to say and do such vulgar things and she asked them to stop it, to which the girls asked for forgiveness and obeyed her. If Anna was noble, Amy at the same time made a cute face and complained to the guys that everyone was avoiding her, and the guys, of course, supported her. Amy used bullying as a way to get closer to them. Alan thought that her character was very different from the one in the game. The game did not show such events, so Alan did not know if everything was going according to the scenario of the game. After all, Amy was a commoner and then became an aristocrat. She had to go to a school for aristocrats and was bullied here. 
and hoping for her sweetness and charm was the only way to save her and a chance to become someone after graduation. Why does the author show them in the shower? Explaining all this! The girls in the class support either Anna and or the Crown Prince and no one supported Amy. Although the girls tried to mock her, she herself prevented their attempts. But the Crown Prince's supporters also understand that he is using Amy to push Anna away, but they do not feel any sympathy for Amy. Because the Prince ignores his daughter-in-law, people outside the school who know this might be weaving a game against the Crown Prince. The people support the egoist who only cares about his opinion and sees nothing else but his wishes, which was very sad. As for Alan's academic life, he lives in peace like a shadow, where no one bothers him. As a result, summer holidays came, and students needed to prepare a summer research paper. This work will greatly affect which class the student will be in next semester, and the aristocrat who stands last, it was very important. Suddenly, to Alan's surprise, Anna personally turned to him, and he sat on his knees asking how he could help her. She said that there was no need for such formal, and replied that he was at the top of the class as a scholarship student, which surprised her. She asked if he had ever explored mazes, and Alan said yes. She said she had some kind of message, and then said goodbye, apologizing for disturbing him. Alan couldn't figure out what she meant by a messenger, and thought she might be following him. But a few days later, everything fell into place. He was asked to be the guide of all the main characters from the Otomi game, and he had no choice but to agree with this. He asked if they were ready to go, and the Crown Prince arrogantly replied that they were ready. Anastasia's request to help them with the research was more like a team, so now Alan was in a difficult situation where he accompanied these people. On the way, he explained about the monsters and asked everyone to be careful. Everyone behaved like cool and said some stupid pathetic phrases like, in games, which infuriated Alan and he wanted to go home. Amy was worried that they weren't getting Alan and everyone else immediately started praising her, saying how sweet and kind she was, which made Alan want to go home even more. However, not only he, but Anna's face also portrayed annoyance. She noticed that Alan was looking at her and quickly came to her senses. Anna said that they would have to return early to his highness, so he ordered Alan to hurry up. As a result, they were able to reach the ruins of the Goblin Maze. Everyone was circling around Amy, telling her not to fall and be careful, which made Anna very angry and she was cold. In the game itself, they were supposed to be accompanied by other adventurers, but the scenario of the game changed since Anastasia turned to him. Inside the maze, everyone was amazed at how everything glitters, but complained about everything. But as soon as Amy started talking about how the walls shine beautifully, they immediately changed their minds and began to compliment her. Alan was really annoyed and he thought that Anna was probably ready to explode, but when he looked at her he saw a beautiful picture. She looked divinely beautiful, which made Alan embarrassed. Amy asked if there were monsters here, but Alan said that this place used to be a goblin maze, but adventurers destroyed their nest and now there are no monsters. The Crown Prince started complaining, saying what was the point of them hiring him and Alan asked for forgiveness. He suddenly saw that Amy was looking for something here and asked what she was doing. This infuriated the Crown Prince a little, and Al again asked for forgiveness. Everyone got bored and no one listened to Alan's stories, but only the beautiful Anastasia found it interesting. Al noticed again that Amy was looking for something on the ground, and this was the very place where the appraisal scroll was once hidden. Everyone reacted to this maze in their own way. Amy was surprised and thought about it. He asked her what she was thinking, and she replied that she was just thinking about what adventurers are useful. Amy was looking for the scroll exactly at the place where it was hidden, and Al realized that she was the same reincarnated one who knew the world of Otomi games. They finished exploring the maze and everyone went outside, after which everyone started hitting on Amy again. Anastasia came up to him and thanked him for seeing them off and Al smiled, saying that it was an honor for him. Anastasia showed more jealousy in the game, but now she behaved calmly. It seems that the world of the game is slowly changing. Anastasia invited Alan to spend time with her the following day, and he accepted. They agreed to meet in front of the school gates. When the day came, Alan waited nervously in front of the school. Suddenly, a carriage arrived, and Anastasia stepped out, looking stunning. She apologized for keeping him waiting, and they got into the carriage. She thanked him for agreeing to accompany her, and then they shifted the conversation to the report of their recent expedition, 
where they would be consulting with experts. Anastasia explained that she had arranged meetings with researchers in the fields of labyrinths and local historical ruins. Alan was surprised by her dedication to this endeavor. She told him that the Crown Prince and Prince Cloud of Westerdale were also involved in this report, and the success of this project was essential for their country's futures and peace between the two nations. Alan felt compelled to assist her despite the challenges with the aristocrats. They met with various scientists and researched materials from previous reports, but initially, none of the information seemed particularly useful. With determination, they persevered, working through their difficulties, and eventually they managed to complete the report. Upon receiving the report, the Crown Prince dismissed it, claiming it was too lengthy. He requested that they summarize everything in just three minutes. Though Alan was irritated and had no desire to assist the spoiled prince, he noticed the pitiful look in Anastasia's eyes and reluctantly explained the report to the Crown Prince, simplifying it so that he could understand. Saying that it was a great job, his bullshitness left the room. Oh, how he pisses me off. I would break him bones with wind magic. Anna apologized to Alan for the Crown Prince's behavior. Her sad expression weighed on him as she seemed like someone forced into an undesirable fate. Despite the annoyance and frustration with the aristocracy, Alan continued to support her. As a result, their report was highly appreciated appreciated among the professors of the academy and also outside the school. All people admired the two princes because of course this imbecile had to be indicated as the main author and he was also crucified. How is he not ashamed at all? And Alan by luck just managed to have his name included there. Now Al has to endure it only until winter. After the winter he will defeat the prince and the others after which he will drop out of school. And autumn came which meant that now there would be a cultural festival. Everyone was furiously discussing about the festival, but Al was worried about the fact that it was necessary to participate in it, but he already had the idea of the festival. Suddenly, Anna approached Alain and asked what he was thinking of organizing for the festival. He was embarrassed and said that he had already submitted a solo application. Anna wanted to offer him to help the crown prince. She understood and wished him good luck and left. Al was confused, but still he should contact Amy or Anastasia's group. He remained interested in their conversation, so he activated his concealment ability and hid in the room where they were discussing the festival plans. As expected, all the attention revolved around Amy, while Anna appeared almost invisible. Everyone was thirsty, and Amy arrogantly asked Anna to pour them tea, saying that she was not doing anything, which annoyed Al a little. But Anna calmly agreed. Everyone decided to have tea in the garden, but Amy decided to stay in the room with Anastasia. Amy suddenly started asking why she was here, because she wasn't doing anything, after which Anastasia coldly just fell silent. Amy saw her face and started teasing her, saying that the crown prince deserves a cute princess next to him and not like her. These words angered her and she turned to her. At that moment, Amy, such a clown, rudely told her to smile. Anastasia was unhappy with her behavior in her direction because her status was still higher. Amy was different from the one in the game. She said that they were all the same, but Anna, getting angry, replied that her behavior would not undermine her status. Amy at this moment portrayed the victim and the crown prince suddenly violently opened the door. Amy's manipulative behavior left Anna shocked as she attempted to explain herself, but found the crown prince unwilling to listen. The crown prince ordered Anna to clean up the room, and she complied without a word. As she gathered her belongings and left the office, Amy was waiting for her in the corridor. Amy taunted Anna, suggesting that she had stolen her fiancé. This was the breaking point for Anna, and she tried to punch Amy, but just then Alan suddenly appeared, sneezed, pretended not to have witnessed the confrontation, and asked for forgiveness before quickly leaving the scene. Anastasia was quite surprised to see Alan there, and it helped her regain her composure. She responded to Amy with a dignified and proud demeanor, asserting that Amy was not worthy of Alan, and then she left. Amy was left alone in the corridor and was extremely annoyed that mob like Alan constantly interfered in her affairs. Alan, having heard everything, reached a significant realization. He concluded that Amy, like him, had been reborn and aimed to create a harem for herself, sticking to the main plot of the game, even knowing about the war that might occur. Alan was determined to stop her. It would have been so easy to kill her. I would have done this if I had the invisibility power. Now we will learn the story from the perspective of our heroines. Let's start with Amy, who is the main character of this world. 
She was born into a poor family where she had to suffer, but however, after she was shot down by a garage, her memories returned. She remembered that this world was just an Otome game that she loved to play. In her previous life, she died in high school due to an incident, but she had no regrets about her miserable life and was happy to be reborn in this world. In the end, it turned out that she was the bastard of some aristocrat and she and her mother were taken into the family of the Baron's Breeze. For an otaku like her, playing harem was easy, and as a result, she entered high school. Anastasia, hearing that the commoners were on the second and third place in rank, was extremely surprised and asked her assistant to find information about them. Second place? Our man Alan, who grew up in a poor family but is the youngest person to graduate from a school for commoners with perfect grades and also an adventurer. And the second, Amy, scum, who was lucky that her dad turned out to be an aristocrat and has the blessing of treatment. Anastasia decided to keep an eye on them as she decided that these two could receive support from the opposition faction. In the office for first year students, she saw Alan, who seemed ordinary to her, but she had to be careful with him. Amy, having entered the classroom, also drew attention to the mob, who took second place and whom she had not seen before. For this reason, on the first day she decided to greet him and chat so that our man would fall in love with her. Realizing that he was ordinary, she decided to ignore him. For Anna, the main danger was the third student, Amy, who flirted with the crown prince, knowing that he was her fiancé. She was worried that this attitude of the crown prince could lead to chaos in the kingdom, and as the person in charge of the aristocrat, she wanted Carl to understand everything. However, Amy's healing abilities, which were very low level and took a lot of time, attracted the prince's attention and he was grateful to her. Carl trusted her too much, and Amy, besides the prince, was able to win the heart of all the main men in the Otomi game. Amy didn't care about bullying in her direction from other characters, but it was Anastasia who was perfect and had everything that annoyed her. But she was glad that in the end, she would end her life terribly. Anastasia saw in the list that she was in second place according to the results of the last exam and felt defeated in front of Alan, as she was busy thinking about His Highness and Amy. Anastasia calmed herself with thoughts that the crown prince would not associate himself with a girl of low status and decided to focus on studying as a study of ruins. Amy, during the ruins expedition, discovered that the appraisal scroll was missing. She decided that there was no such scroll in this world with a difficult level, but for an experienced otaku like her, this was not a problem. Anastasia was glad that she invited Al as their guide and was amazed by his knowledge and hard work she realized that he was talented. Amy began to pay attention to the fact that Anna and the commoner got along well and wanted to make him her faithful slug. How noble of her. Anna was thinking about how wonderful and smart Alan was. She felt joyfully around him discussing and exchanging opinions. She noticed that he was always alone and wanted to help him join the team of aristocrats, so she thought of inviting him to the team for a cultural festival. However, Al refused her, which upset her a little, but she wanted to see what he would cook for the cultural festival. Amy in the discussion room specifically angered Anna so that she would hit her, but at that moment the crown prince appeared, which disrupted her plans. After scaring Anna, he left the room with Amy and she felt satisfied, but she didn't want to give up so easily and decided once again to bring her to a state where she would hit her in the face, which she almost succeeded, but Alan appeared out of nowhere and prevented a catastrophe after which he immediately left. This angered Amy, but Anastasia was able to collect her thoughts and hold on with dignity until the end. Anna remembered this moment in her room in the evening and realized that she had been saved by Alan. Alan landed his plane and felt the autumn chill as he inspected the orc meat he had captured, pleased with his plans to open a shop selling it. Meanwhile, the Academy's cultural festival commenced, bustling with activity. Anastasia accompanied her friend Margaret as they explored the festival grounds before their own event. Spotting a crowd around Alan, who was cooking orc meat, Anastasia was surprised while Margaret was thrilled. Observing students hesitant to try the orc meat, Anastasia and Margaret decided to assist Alan. As the others looked on, bewildered and uncertain, Alan sampled the orc meat. Suddenly, Anastasia and Margaret approached, requesting some meat to fry. Alan, surprised to see Anastasia accompanied by another girl, greeted them. Margaret enthusiastically bit into the orc meat, expressing pure delight at its taste. She lavishly praised its flavor, while Anastasia also found it enjoyable. Alan mentioned acquiring the meat in the dungeon, feeling a bit puzzled. Margaret continued to extol the meat's excellence. 
Observing their interaction, other students grew curious and began ordering meat skewers from Alan. Anastasia was pleased by the interest, and just as she prepared to leave, the girls invited Alan to attend their event. Thanking them for their assistance, Alan agreed to join them once he finished selling the meat. After successfully selling all the meat, Alan closed his shop early and headed to view Anastasia's exhibition with the Crown Prince. However, upon arrival, he found the office deserted. The Crown Prince's exhibit, titled Life, depicted the existence of a commoner in the royal capital. As Alan observed the portrayal of commoner food, he found it overly luxurious, knowing firsthand the struggles of those living in poverty. Exiting the exhibition, Alan pondered Anastasia's involvement when he stumbled upon an embroidery display. There, he encountered Margaret, who explained that it showcased their group's work. Seeing Anastasia unexpectedly among them, Alan felt embarrassed as she wore a flower-embroidered dress. Learning of her expulsion from the Crown Prince's team and subsequent joining of Margaret's team, Alan was taken aback. However, Anastasia showed no regret and proudly presented Margaret's work to him. Alan found all the pieces sophisticated and beautiful, particularly admiring Anastasia's embroidery depicting a cake and fruits. Though Anastasia grew silent, Alan praised her work, causing her extreme embarrassment and acute reaction that make him nervous. Both became flustered until Margaret intervened, announcing the festival's end. Thanking them, Alan departed leaving Anastasia confused about his perception of her interest in sweets and food, a sentiment Margaret echoed. At the festival's conclusion, the Academy declared the Crown Prince's team the winner for their exhibition spotlighting the plight of the poor and the kingdom's issues. As the Crown Prince, Amy, and the team took the stage, Alan observed their performance with a poker face, suspecting they likely discarded the food prepared for the exhibition. Some time passed and winter was approaching which indicated that the event of Anastasia's conviction was approaching. According to the Otomi game, Anastasia and her friends mock Amy, but at the moment this has not happened, although the relationship between the Crown Prince and Anastasia has deteriorated. Alan decided that maybe they could avoid judging Anastasia, but Amy had her own plan. The next day, Alan in class heard from his classmates the news that Anastasia had allegedly bullied Amy out of jealousy, and Alan felt that bad things were about to happen, when suddenly he heard the screams of the Crown Prince, who ordered Anastasia to admit her guilt to Amy. But Anastasia denied her involvement in this. Other students and Amy's harem did not believe her, after which they also began to condemn her, but Anastasia did not think to admit guilt, and as soon as she thought to leave, Leonardo grabbed her and stopped her. Anastasia ordered him not to touch her without permission, as his family's status was lower, but Leonardo began to threaten her. In that moment, Alan intervened, reminding everyone that classes were about to begin, prompting annoyance from Amy. He directed Anastasia to return to class, realizing that he had once again intervened to help her. Sensing the looming condemnation, Alan understood the gravity of the situation Amy had orchestrated. As time passed, the freshman's promotion and graduation drew near, and the Crown Prince was named Student of the Year. During his speech, he called upon his friends for support, including Margaret, who introduced Alan to Isabella, Anastasia's friend and his future classmate. The Crown Prince thanked all his allies, including Amy, for their assistance before making a declaration, commanding Anastasia to come to him in a loud and imperious manner. The long-awaited scene unfolded as the Crown Prince announced the end of his engagement to Anna. However, Anna remained composed, seemingly prepared for such an outcome. Emmy found her reaction less intimidating than expected from the game. The Crown Prince hugged Amy, praising her honor while also embracing Anna, causing Amy to blush and appear pleased. Anastasia responded differently from the book, maintaining a calm demeanor which Alan observed. The Crown Prince then began to disparage Anastasia's family, the Ramslets, which irked Anastasia, as an insult to her family could not go unaddressed. Amy joined in, insulting Duke Ramslet and using Anastasia's words against her. Fed up, Anastasia turned to leave, but the Crown Prince ordered her to stop, challenging her to defend her honor in a duel. He mocked her, eliciting laughter from aristocrats of other factions standing nearby. Anastasia was reluctant to engage in a duel, seeing it as pointless, but the Crown Prince insisted. She sighed, removing her glove and approached Amy, tossing it in her direction, challenging her to the duel Amy desired. Amy grinned, believing everything was going according to her plan. However, Anastasia remained calm and walked away, surprising Amy, who expected a more aggressive response. Suddenly, the Crown Prince declared that he would fight as Amy's representative. 
Anastasia found this behavior absurd, but the crown prince disagreed. Additionally, Amy's other suitors volunteered to represent her in the duel. Anastasia's friends looked concerned while the crown prince laughed, thinking Anastasia had no representative. To everyone's surprise, Alan raised his hand, offering to be Anastasia's representative. This shocked Anastasia, who rushed to him, expressing concern for his safety. She blushed as she tried to dissuade him from fighting against the crown prince. However, Alan reassured her with a smile and declared his acceptance. Anastasia, still blushing, didn't fully grasp his intentions until Alan announced to the crown prince that Anastasia had chosen him as her representative. Worried for Alan's well-being, Anastasia didn't want him to get hurt. The crown prince looked at Alan, initially puzzled about his identity, until he realized Alan was a commoner who had studied with him. Alan inquired about Anastasia's request for the duel, and she demanded an apology for the insult to Duke Ramslet. Amy's condition was for Anastasia to keep her distance from her, the crown prince, and their suitors. The crown prince proposed that Alan face five opponents consecutively, but Alan suggested they all attack him simultaneously. His remark elicited laughter from the crown prince and his companions, prompting Alan to question if they feared him. This angered the prince from the neighboring country, but Alan continued to taunt him. Marx asserted that Alan couldn't handle the challenge alone, prompting Alan to retort that Marx was inferior to him in magic. Oscar relied on his family's influence and Leonardo lacked the intellect to be a future knight. Despite their anger, Alan persisted in provoking them, claiming they couldn't defeat him even as a group. Anastasia realized Alan's intention to provoke them, which horrified her. Amy couldn't comprehend why Alan, whom she dubbed Mob Alan, defended Anastasia, a departure from the game's plot. She concluded that Alan was in love with Anastasia. The Crown Prince agreed to a 5 versus 1 duel in a fit of anger. Anastasia imposed a condition prohibiting killing in the duel, which Alan accepted. Amy's harem and the prince's allies agreed to this condition after discussion. Unexpectedly, one of the aristocrats who had previously mocked Anastasia volunteered to witness the duel, though it seemed unfair to Alan. However, the crown prince accepted him as a witness and ordered Alan to the training ground in 30 minutes, warning him not to flee. Alan agreed without hesitation. As students hurried to the training ground to witness the duel, Anastasia and her friends urged Alan to reconsider. Despite their concerns, Alan insisted everything was fine, appreciating Anastasia's supportive friends, much to her confusion. Anastasia's friends sided with Alan, further perplexing her. Anastasia asserted that she wouldn't allow Alan to die in the duel. Alan simply smiled and asked if they had heard of the youngest adventurer who achieved EC rank. They confirmed they had, prompting Alan to reveal that he was that adventurer. Anastasia was surprised to learn this. Alan had conquered numerous mazes and became a goblin slayer. Confident in his ability to win the duel, Alan bid farewell to Anastasia, leaving her blushing and bewildered. Meanwhile, Amy nervously bit her nails, annoyed that a commoner had emerged as Anastasia's representative. She was confident that the crown prince would prevail and grinned at the prospect of Anastasia's demise. Believing that the whole world was on her side, Amy went to watch the duel. At the training ground, where a large number of academy students had gathered, Alan appeared. While the Crown Prince's party wielded various weapons, Alan brought only a dagger. He sat in front of Anastasia and vowed to secure her victory before advancing toward his opponents. The duel began as the witness oversaw the proceedings. Despite the immediate rush of attacks from his opponents, Alan remained unfazed, smiling as he conjured smoke to obscure their vision. The smoke obstructed the view of both Alan's adversaries and the onlooking students. Amidst the obscured fray, Alan swiftly dispatched five opponents, leaving them incapacitated on the ground. Prince Cloud, Oscar, and Leonardo fell unconscious, one even displaying symptoms of distress. Anastasia, astounded, could hardly believe what she witnessed. Prince and Marcus, though still mobile, struggled to communicate amidst coughing fits. Alan wasted no time seizing Oscar, who feigned unconsciousness, holding a dagger to his throat to assert his victory. The witness reluctantly acknowledged Alan's triumph. Triumph. With three adversaries swiftly neutralized, only two remained. The spectators marveled at Alan's prowess, leaving Anastasia slightly taken aback. In the midst of the fight, Alan created a smokescreen to hide from his opponents. Then he started shooting them with a quiet gun, using special bullets that don't kill. He kept adding more smoke to the mix, 
Marcus got scared and tried to get out of the smoke, but Alan shot him too. Next was Leonardo's turn. He was swinging his sword like crazy. Alan didn't want to accidentally hit anyone else, so he cleared some of the smoke. Leonardo was relieved to be able to see again, but Alan still managed to shoot him quickly. Oscar, an archer, was horrified by the sounds of his comrades falling, but his own fate awaited him as Alan's shot found him. Thus, only the hapless prince remained, seeking refuge in the smoke. While the crown prince pondered Alan's whereabouts, Alan swiftly took him down too. In the same manner, he defeated all his adversaries. Amy, witnessing this, was not just surprised, but furious and horrified. She couldn't believe that strong students like the Crown Prince Marcus, Oscar, and others had succumbed to Alan. The thought of Alan potentially disrupting her perfect world annoyed her. On the other hand, Anastasia was incredibly impressed by Alan. After dealing with the others, Alan was unsure of what to do with Marcus and the Crown Prince, key figures in the country's future leadership. Approaching Marcus, who could barely move, Marcus attempted to leverage his family's status against Alan. Seeing this as cowardly, Alan realized Marcus feared losing to him. Marcus's threats also seemed illogical, as they targeted Anastasia and the Duke Ramslet family, a fact Alan pointed out. Marcus, exhaling, claimed he was trying to protect Amy. Alan countered, suggesting that Amy had provoked Anastasia and initiated the conflict, which Marcus found hard to believe. Unaware of their conversation, the other students, particularly Amy, hoped Marcus would use his magic against Alan. Alan proceeded to rebuke Marcus for his conduct as a future prime minister, then delivered a resounding slap that sent Marcus's glasses flying and rendered him unconscious. With the judge declaring Alan the victor, the other students were astounded that a commoner had bested aristocrats. Turning to the crown prince, who was barely holding on, Alan encountered a pitiable sight. The crown prince pleaded for a fair fight, but Amy perceived Alan's tactics as dishonest. However, Alan countered, stating there were no rules against weapon use and accused the crown prince of cowardice for challenging Anastasia to a duel and shaming her. Attempting to shame the crown prince for his actions, Alan was met with the crown prince's outburst about the challenges of royal duty and his belief in Amy's understanding and uniqueness. Recognizing the Crown Prince's feigned victimhood, Alan shifted his focus to Anastasia, praising her dedication to her country and fiancé while exposing the Crown Prince's derogatory remarks toward her as baseless. The Crown Prince angrily demanded Alan to be silent, asserting that commoners like him could love anyone. Alan responded with a smile, suggesting that the Crown Prince could simply elope with Amy and experience life as an ordinary person for his own enjoyment. These words infuriated Amy and surprised the other students. However, Alan also pointed out the hardships of commoner life, emphasizing the struggles of making ends meet and living in subpar conditions. This frightened the prince, prompting Alan to assert that he was not a spoiled brat, period. Yeah, man! The tension lingered in an awkward silence, but Alan persisted, expressing that if he were the crown prince, he would prioritize living with Anastasia for the people's sake, albeit acknowledging that it was now too late. Anastasia, perplexed by Alan's words, suddenly noticed the crown prince covertly preparing an attack aimed at Alan, hoping to catch him off guard and potentially fatally injure him. The crown prince unleashed his fireball attack towards Alan in an attempt to secure victory for Amy's sake. Anastasia rushed towards Alan, intending to save him with her ice magic, while the other students fled the scene. She called out Alan's name, causing him to freeze momentarily. However, Alan simply waved his hand, redirecting the crown prince's magic towards himself, creating a powerful vortex that swept through the area, lifting the crown prince into the air before he fell unconscious. Alan approached the witness, ensuring the crown prince was alive and declared his victory in the duel while the crown prince had lost. Anastasia's friends rejoiced while she felt embarrassed by the situation. Amy, stunned, fell from her seat to the ground realizing this might be the end for her. She couldn't fathom losing as she believed herself to be the central figure in their world. Alan approached Anastasia, kneeling down and dedicating his victory to her. Shyly, Anastasia thanked him and expressed her concern for his well-being. Alan reassured her, stating he hadn't killed anyone and that everyone was either exhausted or injured, much to Anastasia's relief. Alan admired Anastasia's selflessness, even in the midst of chaos, and suddenly thanked her and her friends before departing. 
Confused, Anastasia attempted to stop Alan, but the witness intervened, urging her to provide the final verdict on the duel. With no other choice, Anastasia reluctantly did so. After the duel concluded, Anastasia rushed to Alan's room, perplexed by his last words. Upon opening the door, she found the room empty, with belongings gone and the bed neatly made. Anastasia questioned a maid about Alan's whereabouts, only to learn that the room had been cleaned out per instruction, leaving her greatly surprised. Meanwhile, Alan, having planned his departure after the duel, packed his belongings and left the academy, returning home. His mother was taken aback to see him with so many possessions, prompting Alan to recount the events of the night, including Anastasia's unfair treatment and the duel. He felt guilty, knowing his mother had high hopes for his future after graduation. However, she remained calm and expressed gladness that he had helped Anastasia. Despite Alan's concerns about potential repercussions from the crown prince and neighboring prince, his mother assured him she would handle it, prioritizing his safety. Reluctantly, Alan agreed and retired to bed as his mother instructed. Alan lay on his bed pondering recent events and contemplating how to protect his mother and the city's inhabitants. His mother entered the room, turning on a light and remarking on the view of the castle from his window. Alan smiled in response and his mother expressed joy at seeing him in bed, reminiscent of his childhood. She remarked on his resemblance to his late father, a sentiment that filled Alan with guilt for involving her in his troubles. However, his mother assured him that his father would be proud of him now, a thought Alan held on to, eager to learn more about his father's character. With a tender smile, his mother reassured him and vowed to confront the aristocrats. Alan apologized once more, but his mother expressed pride in him. She then decided to sleep beside him, admitting her fear of descending the stairs. By morning, Alan woke up and washed his face, after which he gathered his thoughts. He was pleased that he had prevented a possible civil war and was watching the street from the window. His mother was setting breakfast on the table and they sat down to eat. Alan had not been home for a long time and felt calm. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door of their house. Alan stood up anxiously and decided to check who it was. When he opened the door, he found no one, but the hidden man was waiting for him in ambush, after which he hugged Alan so tightly, pulling him to his chest and began to strangle him with his chest. Oh, and I don't mind dying this way, a dream. This was Monica, who was glad to meet Alan after so long. She brought fresh vegetables and Katerina, Alan's mom, thanked her. Monica said that the people from the guild were waiting for him downstairs and Alan, still embarrassed by Monica's embrace, hurried to go to the guys from the guild. The adventurers from the guild greeted Alan, then started asking if he had been expelled from the dorm for misbehavior, a claim Alan quickly refuted. When one of them joked about him bringing a girl into his room, Monica playfully hit him, and they all bid Alan goodbye, inviting him to visit the guild. Alan smiled at them and told his mother he didn't want to involve the guild members in his affairs. Suddenly, his mother spotted an unusual sight, a beautiful carriage on their street. Alan became alarmed, fearing it might be from the castle and that they had come to arrest him. The carriage stopped and an elderly man introduced himself as Butler, an employee of Duke Ramslet who had come to fetch Alan. Alan immediately recognized him as being from Anastasia's castle. Alan was taken aback by the unexpected visit to the Ramslet's castle. Sebastian the butler explained that the head of the Ramslet family had invited him. However, Katerina interpreted it differently and began to defend her son, insisting on his innocence. Sebastian reassured them both, affirming that Alan was not in any danger. Alan comforted his mother and she asked him to change his clothes before leaving. Once dressed appropriately, Alan joined Sebastian in the carriage. As they traveled through the aristocratic street, Alan marveled at the grandeur of the mansions. Finally, they arrived at Duke Ramslet's residence. Sebastian escorted Alan to the living room and requested he wait there. A maid brought him a cup of tea, for which Alan expressed gratitude. Glancing around, he couldn't help but be struck by the opulence and influence of the Ramslet family. Placing the tea on the table, he attempted to compose himself before meeting with the head of the family. Suddenly the door handle turned and Anastasia's father, Gerhard, entered the room. Alan felt nervous and stood up from his seat. Gerhard greeted him warmly and Alan reciprocated with a respectful bow before introducing himself. Gerhard then gestured for Alan to sit, expressing his apologies for summoning him so abruptly. He acknowledged hearing about Alan's defense of his daughter in the duel and expressed his gratitude. 
Alan was taken aback by Gerhard's knowledge about his achievements as the youngest adventurer to attain a C rank, including defeating the Blizzard Phoenix. Gerhard also knew about Alan's early graduation from a commoner school and his efforts to raise funds for academy studies. Gerhard's curiosity was piqued as he questioned Alan's decision to represent Anastasia, speculating that Alan harbored feelings for her. Alan admitted his respect for Anastasia but acknowledged the difference in their social status. Despite this, he affirmed his readiness for any consequences. Gerhard probed further, intrigued by Alan's motives. Alan confidently stated that his actions were driven by a desire to protect his family and friends who had supported him. This revelation surprised Gerhard. Alan pointed out the potential consequences of Anastasia's expulsion from school, which could lead to chaos and conflicts among aristocrats, including a potential showdown between the crown prince and the second prince, destabilizing the kingdom. While Gerhard grasped the political implications, he struggled to see the direct connection to protecting Alan's family. Alan then shared his concerns for the stability of the Kingdom of Estonia, impressing Gerhard with his foresight. Gerhard assured Alan that he would take responsibility for him and his mother, promising their protection. Grateful, Alan thanked Gerhard, who instructed Sebastian to escort Alan back home. Alan bid his farewell with a bow, leaving Gerhard to ponder the young man's potential. Gerhard reflected on Anastasia's remarks from the previous night, finding alignment with Alan's character and strength. The previous night, Anastasia rushed to her family's mansion and entered her father's room, surprising him with her arrival. Sweaty and nervous, she recounted everything that had transpired over a cup of tea. Gerhard couldn't believe the crown prince's foolishness and inquired about Anastasia's victory. She confessed that Alan had protected her, passionately extolling his virtues as the best student and a strong individual. Gerhard was surprised and speculated whether Anastasia was in love with Alan. Blushing deeply, she was embarrassed but didn't deny it. Anastasia's engagement to the crown prince posed a problem for Gerhard, who then questioned the butler about Alan, learning more about him. Anastasia realized her father had already researched Alan, acknowledging the importance of retaining such a genius for their country. Despite Gerhard's orders for Anastasia to rest, she remained worried about Alan. Returning to the present, the situation weighed heavily on Gerhard. Anastasia entered the room, and Gerhard noticed the resemblance to the description she had provided earlier. She confessed feeling provoked into the duel, recognizing the potential serious consequences and feeling guilty about the situation with the crown prince. Overwhelmed, she began to cry and her mother stepped in to comfort her. Gerhard, wanting to protect Alan, received Anastasia's tearful gratitude. Meanwhile, the butler accompanied Alan to the carriage, informing him that Anastasia didn't wish to see anyone that day. Alan pondered during the ride, wondering if Anastasia now harbored resentment towards him, but was relieved that he had emerged unscathed. A few days later, Katerina informed Alan of a visitor. He went outside and was surprised to see Sebastian once again, who handed him a letter from Gerhard inviting him to their house for dinner. Alan felt a mix of excitement and embarrassment upon realizing he would be meeting Anastasia again. The following day, Alan and his mother arrived at Anastasia's mansion, dressed for the occasion. His mother fretted over her outfit, but Alan reassured her that it was fine not to wear formal attire. Nonetheless, Katerina couldn't help but pout about Alan not having to worry about his uniform, a typical reaction from her. Just then, Gerhard appeared and greeted them both warmly. Katerina bowed and expressed gratitude for the invitation, to which Gerhard introduced himself and kissed Katerina's hand, thanking her for Alan's assistance to Anastasia. Gerhard introduced his wife Elizabeth and his son. Alan sat on his knees and introduced himself to her, but Elizabeth asked him to drop such formalities. At that moment, Anastasia appeared, who looked simply magnificent. Her beautiful appearance embarrassed Alan. Anastasia, irritated, grabbed Alan by his clothes and pulled him along. While the others remained unclear, they went out into the hallway and she pinned him against the wall, hitting the wall with her hand. Damn, love this type of woman. She was angry that Alan didn't say goodbye to her properly, and Alan was embarrassed and asked for forgiveness. He was confused and said he was glad to meet her again. Anastasia averted her gaze, and embarrassed also admitted it. She thanked him for fighting a duel for her, and Alan was glad that she didn't hate him. But even so, Anastasia was killing him with her eyes. They looked like a couple among themselves, and Elizabeth noticed it. Upon their return, Anastasia apologized for the delay. 
with Elizabeth mentioning Anastasia's tears and concern for Alan, which Anastasia denied, feeling embarrassed. Elizabeth then suggested that Alan address Anastasia as Anna, confusing her. Alan sought Anastasia's permission, and she sheepishly agreed. To divert attention, Anastasia instructed Sebastian to lead them to the dining room, which pleased Alan. Seated at the table, Gerhard announced that the Crown Prince and Amy would publicly apologize to Anastasia during the upcoming ceremony, officially ending Anna's engagement to the Crown Prince. He hinted that Alan would remain her sole confidant. Additionally, Alan wouldn't be expelled from school, bringing relief to him and Katerina. Gerhard offered Alan a post-graduation position with them and encouraged him to enjoy school life. Overwhelmed, Katerina cried tears of happiness with Sebastian offering her a napkin. Alan was also elated. Anastasia then turned to Alan, expressing her intention to support him in the coming year as he had supported her. They all happily began eating and conversing. Alan felt immense satisfaction in having worked hard and achieved his goal. After dinner, the Ramslet family escorted them to the carriage and they began to say goodbye. But suddenly, Anna called Alan to her, so Elizabeth decided to show the garden to Katerina. Anna invited him to explore the Altman maze together and asked him to be their guide. Alan already knew about the maze and asked how deep she wanted to go in there, and Anna was surprised that Alan knew about the maze. In theory, Alan had been through this whole maze for a long time and didn't know how to tell her. Anna couldn't believe that Alan had already explored this maze, and Alan admitted with a smile, that he had been through it for a long time and there were only orcs inside. Anna was perplexed, and even Alan added that he passed it in fast laps. Alan said that this is a method in which you need to go through the maze several times, which made Anna preplexed. Anna fell silent and was embarrassed by Alan's awesomeness. Alan stuttered. Alan eventually agreed to be their guide. A few days later, after a journey by carriage, they reached Altmund, where Margaret and her team awaited them. Margaret suggested they could uncover treasures there and asked Alan to watch over her. She reassured Anastasia that she had no intentions of stealing her knight savior, much to Anastasia's embarrassment. Unfortunately, there were no treasures left in the maze. The other male knights regarded Alan with disdain, viewing him as too young and deciding to act independently, much to Alan's confusion. Upon entering the maze, Alan began offering advice, which the girls eagerly welcomed. However, the knights didn't take him seriously, a fact that Alan quickly noticed. When they encountered a monster, Alan decided to face it alone to prove his strength to the skeptical knights. Drawing his machine gun, he confronted the creature, causing alarm among the others. With determination, Alan fired a few shots, defeating the monster. Everyone else froze and just lost the power of speech, and Alan breathed a sigh of relief. All the knights in disbelief began to ask what it was, and Alan told them that it was a magical device of wind magic. Anna and Margaret were confused and surprised. They decided to continue their journey, and the knights were afraid of him, so they decided to obey him. After that, they met another monster. When the soldiers tried to attack him, Anna stepped in front of them and sent an arrow of her power towards the monster, which hit the monster's eyes. While the monster couldn't help but see anything, Anna quickly hurried and with one swing was able to chop off the monster's head. Anna jokingly asked whom Alan was trying to protect, and Alan felt delighted with Anna's technique and strength. They continued on their way, where Alan led the team and the knights reported the danger. In the end, they were able to defeat the Orc King and were able to do such a great job. The knights thought about stopping their work. Alan told everyone to grab the ball to get back to the beginning of the maze. Margaret thanked him, after which they all went to the balloon except Anastasia. Unexpectedly, Anastasia said that she wanted to try the fast lap method with Alan and embarrassingly said that she would not go behind. Alan was upset. Thus, Alan and Anastasia went through the maze several times, just the two of them. Thanks for watching the video, my friends. If you enjoyed this recap, please press the like button and leave a comment with your opinion. Please use the word force in your comment. It's really important to me. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more cool recaps. See you later. This is the world of women, where they fight in a war between countries and men become their trophies. The world is structured with a staggering ratio of nine women to every man, rendering men powerless in public affairs. Stripped of rights, these men, possessing strength and prowess, become sought-after commodities, 
auctioned as slaves for large sums, and in a world where our main character is surrounded by so many women, he is still a deviant for the men of their world. Fast forward two years, and our protagonist, Faust Polidoro, finds himself navigating the complex dynamics of the royal court. No amount of time has dulled the discomfort he feels in the presence of Her Highness Queen Lysenlot. Ayo hey, ma'am, step on me. His role as an advisor to Princess Valir places him in a delicate position. Kneeling before the Queen, Faust struggles to maintain composure, avoiding any inadvertent glances at her revealing attire. Suppressing the pain in his nether regions, Faust whispers about his discomfort, but his words remain unheard. The Queen, oblivious to Faust's internal turmoil, seeks his opinion on a matter of importance. Confused and distracted, Faust contemplates the societal norms that govern his interactions with women in this world. In this world, a man displaying arousal before a woman is deemed a social pariah, inviting disgrace upon his family and birthplace. Therefore, to not reveal his friend to the whole world, Bro sealed his ultimate weapon in a metal cage. God damn it. Faust, a virgin in his previous life, finds himself aroused by the overly revealing attire of the queen. Wrestling with his internal turmoil, he wonders why Princess Valir's first battle is against bandits with a limited number of knights under her command. Struggling to contain the pain in his nether regions, Faust articulates his concerns. Valir suddenly noticed this and looked at his pants, after which she blushed. The queen continued to move gracefully with her legs, further intensifying Faust's struggle. This puts a lot of pressure on our protagonist as he struggles with conflicting expectations of duty and personal comfort. Therefore, in order not to burn down his little friend, he covered himself with the body of the princess, using the excuse of discussing Princess Anastasia's campaign against the Willendorf country and that the queen was now sending a Valir to battle against bandits was unfair. He asked the queen to consider the decision and breathed a sigh of relief. Valir, Sensing Faust's unease looks at him with a mix of embarrassment and gratitude. Despite the discomfort, Faust manages to convey his thoughts, deflecting attention away from his predicament. Valier trembled and gently stated that she was used to such an attitude directed at her. The queen abruptly ordered him to halt and lift his head. He couldn't do it though since he didn't want to let his pal get up again. The queen responded that fighting bandits was also a highly worthwhile job and inquired if he thought it was too low for his level. Our virgin had a nosebleed, and he seemed really menacing, as if he was about to assault the queen, but in fact he barely restrained his body. Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. As a result, the guards began to protect Her Majesty, believing that he intended to attack her. Valir and the queen were taken aback by his reaction. The queen, a little perplexed, told him that she did not question his ability. Citing a campaign to a nearby nation with Anastasia in which he killed ten barbarian knights and personally stabbed the head of their commander. The queen, unaware of Faust's internal struggles, acknowledges his concerns but remains firm in her decision to send Valir against bandits. Faust, finally granted permission to leave, breathes a sigh of relief. Valir stared at him, embarrassed, and added gently that she was happy Faust is her advisor. Faust was also pleased, as was the fact that she didn't get her mother's large fat breast. Valir was able to receive extra money from the treasury because of Faust, and everything looked to be over, but the queen's thoughts remained on him. She was concerned when Faust von Polidoro defended Valir's honor in front of her. The queen thought that Faust was irritated by their decision to underestimate him, and he took the affront by being sent to combat outlaws. The problem was that Valir had to be sent on such an insignificant campaign in order to successfully hand over the throne to Princess Anastasia. Yet, as the Queen observed Faust's affectionate demeanor and warm smiles directed at Valir, she couldn't help but recall her late husband. A realization dawned upon her. She had erred in allowing Faust and Valir to grow closer. Anastasia, the elder princess, had taken notice of Faust's gallantry in a great war and was beginning to develop feelings for him. Fearing the potential harm this could cause to her younger sister, a conflict brewed between the two princesses. Anastasia's advisor, the formidable Duchess of Astarta, stood as the third in line to the throne. Recognizing the prowess of this influential duo, the queen understood that, in a dire scenario, they might not hesitate to eliminate Valier. To avert an impending tragedy and maintain the fragile balance within the royal family, the queen made the difficult decision to separate Faust and Valier. 
The queen ordered Valir to go on a campaign alone, and now Faust will be an advisor to her sister Anastasia, which greatly shocked Valir. Valir, shocked by the unexpected turn of events, questions why her trusted advisor is reassigned to her sister Anastasia. Tears well up in her eyes as she recalls the moment she found Faust two years ago. When Faust, 19, was at the bar, Valir, 12, approached him and offered to be her mentor. Valir was enraged by his quiet, and Faust questioned its utility. She considered it and said she would arrange for him to meet the queen, which made Faust laugh. Valier began proposing other possibilities such as money and a place to stay, and Faust was amused. He inquired as to why she had chosen him, and she stated unequivocally that he was powerful and would become the strongest in a sword combat. This astonished him, and he declared that men were not permitted to engage in the duel. Valier stopped him and therefore offered to unite and become one team. Faust, without hesitation, accepted her offer and kissed her hand. This was the reason why Valier could not give up and give it to her sister. Uh, for Faust, the decision to become an advisor to the second princess turned out to be less than favorable. Seated in the garden amidst roses, he brooded over the impending Great War, the need to maintain composure before the Queen, and the upcoming duel against bandits causing regret to course through him. Near the palace, two male employees engaged in derogatory discussions about Faust, taking jabs at him. Faust shot them a disdainful glance but opted not to dignify them with a response. In this world, women favor delicate and feeble men, a far cry from Faust's demeanor. He resented the lewd, half-naked bodies he sees and the fact he gets occasional insults hurled his way. All Faust desired was to marry and return to his homeland in Polidoro. Suddenly, one of the servants insulted Faust's mother, casting aspersions on her character. This unfounded attack ignited Faust's ire as he recalled his mother, the last ruler of Polidoro Domain. A woman who, after the death of her husband, chose not to remarry and dedicated herself to raising Faust, imparting political acumen, combat skills, and strategic thinking, qualities typically reserved for women in this world. Therefore, Faust always tried hard. He always studied late and the training fights were always tough. However, Faust did not suspect that there was such a gender inequality until, at the age of 15, in his first expedition, he learned from the head of the square Helga that male knights are extremely rare. His mother's body began to weaken, but she always forced herself to get out of bed and taught Faust how to survive in this world. When Faust was 20 years old, her condition collapsed and realizing that she had nothing more to teach him, she died a strange woman who refused to get married again and devoted herself to raising a child. Provoked by the servants' derogatory comments, Faust confronted them with a menacing expression. His retaliation took the form of forcefully poking his fingers into one servant's nose, leaving him bleeding and in pain. The second servant, attempting to intimidate Faust, invoked their allegiance to the Duchess of Astarte. Unfazed, Faust continued his assault, leading to the second servant's fearful collapse and making first servant terrible sounds of pain. At that moment, the Duchess of Astarte made her entrance, addressing Faust with concern. The servants attempted to justify their actions, but Faust revealed the derogatory remarks about his mother, prompting the Duchess's anger. When she realized it was true, the Duchess became enraged. The servant fell to the ground in fear and tried to make excuses, but the Duchess did not even let him finish before kicking him with her foot and beginning to beat him, thereby punishing him. The Duchess spares neither women nor men and is the goddess of war with whom Faust fought together in the Great War in Villendroft. She is the same veteran as him and has beautiful breast shapes. The Duchess asked him for forgiveness and Faust said that it was okay. She smiled and started laughing. Air camaraderie had developed during the war, transcending factional boundaries. Astarta has the spirit of war and easygoing personality, but she always harasses Faust and grabs him by the ass. Astarta playfully complimented Faust on his supposedly enlarged posterior, much to his embarrassment. The blushing virgin requested her to desist, citing potential damage to her esteemed status. The Duchess, embracing him, assured him that such antics would remain confined to private settings. Faust, however, couldn't shake off the peculiar habit of her frequent touches to his behind. Trying to dispel any misconceptions about his ass, Faust insisted that there was nothing extraordinary about it. Astarta, feeling a little awkward, continued to admire his butt. Undeterred, she offered to enter into a more intimate relationship, but Faust declared that he was keeping his virginity for his future wife. 
In a surprising turn, the Duchess boldly declared her intention to make Faust her husband, leaving him momentarily silent in astonishment. However, Faust expressed concern about the potential transfer of his lands to her family. To address this, Astarta proposed an alternative. They could become lovers and bear a child together, ensuring the succession of Faust's lineage. Amused by the proposition, Faust burst into laughter, recognizing the societal criticism he would likely face for having a child out of wedlock. Unfazed, Astarta, emphasizing her unparalleled stamina, suggested that he be her first interesting encounter, even offering payment for the act. As Faust's face contorted with embarrassment and blood began to flow from his nose, the tempting proposal lingered in his thoughts. Despite the internal conflict, he found himself unable to outright refuse the idea. Just as Faust appeared on the verge of committing to a start's proposition, the unexpected arrival of Princess Anastasia disrupted the unfolding scene. Annoyed by a start's audacious advances, Anastasia, a formidable leader in the war against Willendroff, intervened. Inquiring about the nature of their conversation, Anastasia listened as the Duchess candidly shared the details. Clearly embarrassed, Anna expressed her disapproval of their potential union, hinting that Faust might not object to the refusal. This revelation greatly upset Anastasia, leading her to raise her voice in objection to Faust's involvement with Astarta. Anna argued that such a liaison was unacceptable within the aristocracy, citing their differing factions as an additional complication, a concern that Astarte seemed unconcerned about, much to Anna's irritation. Taking charge of the situation, Anastasia commanded Faust to reject the Duchess's proposal, to which he hesitated. She groaned and asked if he would join her faction, but Faust declined. Anna was perplexed, and while knowing that Anna would be the queen, Faust picked the second princess because he is free to act as he pleases and will support Valier. Anna smiled as she remembered her father and how the queen began to see how similar they were. OMG, she has father issues. She reflected on how huge, strong, and caring Faust was, much like her father. Despite his refusal, she was satisfied with this response. The Duchess and Princess bid him farewell. The Duchess, like Shaitan, began to murmur in the Princess's ear to surrender and give him to her, because she would never be able to have him because he would not become her husband and his estates might pass to her. Anastasia inquired whether she should give up before her first love, but the Duchess began to speak ominously about how they would share it together and how they only needed to have one child, who would be Faust of the Polydoro land's successor. The princess thought this was strange, and Astarte began to whisper like the devil that Anna wanted him. Anastasia was deeply ashamed and she hid her face in shame. They agreed to wait for him to return from his stroll with the second princess and then envy him. In Valir's office, the atmosphere turned tense as she read a letter from her team of knights requesting money for a brothel. Perplexed, she decided to postpone her meeting with Faust and delve into the matter later. Afterwards, Faust retired to his chambers. A man named Ingrid sought him out and Helga greeted him at the palace entrance, guiding him to Faust's room. Throughout the journey, Ingrid expressed admiration for Faust's accomplishments, recognizing the meeting as mutually beneficial. Ingrid, an exclusive supplier of goods for aristocrats, had a long-standing association with Faust's family, the Polydoros, and Faust's remarkable mother. Upon reaching Faust's room, Ingrid was welcomed, and Faust, adopting a serious demeanor, engaged in conversation. For Ingrid, a relationship with Faust equated to significant profits for her trading company, given their collaboration on various requests related to magic and military supplies. However, the discussion took an unexpected turn when Faust, somewhat perplexed, brought up a peculiar request. Ingrid, ever accommodating, expressed her readiness to fulfill whatever request Faust had in mind. Suddenly, Faust broached a sensitive topic, his struggles with a chastity belt causing discomfort and pain due to its tightness. This revelation embarrassed Ingrid, though it seemed this wasn't the first time Faust had approached her with such a matter. Ingrid assured Faust that the belt was tailored to his size. However, Faust insisted that he grappled with the fear of public exposure and potential harm to his intimate anatomy. This revelation left Ingrid slightly embarrassed, but she was willing to assist. Faust expressed concerns about the visibility of his long thing and potential damage due to the tight belt. Ingrid, puzzled, inquired about the cause of his stick getting bigger all of a sudden. Faust attributed it to his masculine nature, prompting Helga, who overheard the conversation, to find it problematic. 
Despite his embarrassment, Faust earnestly requested a new metal belt, underscoring the importance of protection. He explained that lacking a wife to shield or vouch for him in the event of an inadvertent display made the situation perilous. Ingrid brought up the Duchess of Astarte's apparent interest in Faust, but he dismissed it as a mere jest. Even if she were serious, Faust asserted that he couldn't be with her since aristocrats typically married individuals who matched their social standing. With a smile, Faust expressed his quest for a wife, acknowledging the challenge due to his perceived unpopularity. Ingrid, upon hearing Faust's concerns, realized he was viewing himself incorrectly. As a warrior who had saved the country, Faust was in fact quite popular. Ingrid believed many people were romantically interested in him, and the Duchess of Astarte might be more serious about it than he assumed. She even speculated that the Duchess might be content not to legally marry anyone. Yet, Ingrid found the mansion's dynamic strange. The Queen and the Princess could have arranged a wife for Faust, but it seemed they were deliberately safeguarding him and reluctant to let him go. Ingrid harbored concerns about the formidable Duchess Astarta, a powerful warrior with significant influence in the country. Despite the potential business advantages of becoming a supplier for the future queen, Ingrid hesitated to jeopardize her relationship with the Duchess. Faust abruptly inquired if Ingrid was paying attention, prompting her discomfort due to her tendency to drift into her thoughts. Choosing to align with Faust for the moment, Ingrid then surprisingly suggested he cease hiding his big stick. Faust, taken aback, questioned her sanity, leading to a bewildered and indignant silence in the room. Recognizing that he might need to endure the metal belt until marriage, Faust turned to Helga inquiring about the possibility of getting married. Seating herself, Helga proposed asking Princess Valir to search for potential matches. Faust mentioned the princess deeming it impossible for him to find a mate currently. Helga expressed her disdain for aristocrats' lack of taste in men, urging Faust to consider finding a girl in his homeland. She declared her weariness of metropolitan affairs and Faust, smiling, remarked on her unusual outspokenness. This retort irked Helga, prompting her to pivot to a new topic, encouraging Faust to evaluate the subordinate women of Princess Valir. Helga suggested he choose the one who appeared the most appealing among the guards, all of whom were two or three daughters of aristocrats serving Princess Valir. Faust didn't oppose the idea and recalled that he was scheduled to meet them soon. However, Helga suddenly recollected that the guards of the second princess resembled barbarians, capable only of solving problems through brute force. Faust remembered Valir mentioning that they were akin to chimpanzees, lacking any semblance of common sense, leaving Helga incredulous at their perceived inadequacy. Meanwhile, in Valir's office, she queried Zabina, one of her guards, about a letter requesting money for a brothel visit. Ma'am, your honkas looks heavy. Let me carry it for you. Before Valir, Zabine, the captain of the Royal Knights of the Second Princess, stood as a proponent of violence, earning the moniker Head of the Chimpanzee for her dangerous nature, despite her noble blood. She informed Valir that every knight in the guard of the Second Princess was a virgin leaving Valir perplexed. Zabine, with confidence, requested money for a brothel, but Valir, irritated, promptly refused, leaving Zabine in a metaphorical horny jail. Surprised by the rejection, Zabine sought an explanation, and Valir, laughing, clarified that she couldn't request treasury funds for such purposes, as most of the money was allocated for military expeditions. This revelation brought Zabine to tears, proclaiming the futility of their existence if they died as virgins. In a moment of vulnerability, Valir admitted her virginity and suggested facing their first battle together. Zabine proposed going to a brothel, but Valir, angered, refused ordering them to spend their money and physically tearing off Zabine's clothes. Zabine, in confusion and sadness, pointed out their lack of funds and emphasized that even her rank as captain held little significance. She started pushing Zabina back and forth, saying that they were knights and that even 15 of them could not seduce one peasant man to do some bad things. Zabine argued that, being knights with blue blood, they couldn't engage with ordinary men but could hire prostitutes. Valir, feeling a mix of pity and despair, cried, expressing her frustration with these knights, whom she referred to as chimpanzees, causing trouble even four years after becoming Valir knights. Comparing them unfavorably to her older sister's knights, Valir lamented their incompetence, leading to a diminished reputation, where for some reason they spy on male servants. As a result, 
The Queen Mother considers the Knights of Valyr to be just a bunch of idiots who are not capable of anything. Valyr sobbed, claiming she could no longer deal with these chimps like them. Zabine, shocked by Valyr's words, lifted her on her back, crying, and pleaded for Valyr not to leave them, as they were unwanted even by their own parents. Valyr reassured them, wiping Zabine's tears and claiming that she would not leave them, and declared that no one would die, though uncertainty loomed over the impending duel, but Zabine didn't know if everyone survives. Valier then shifted the narrative, passionately narrating the story of Faust, the renowned knight of the Great War in Villendroff, and advisor to the second princess. She highlighted his feats, including facing overwhelming odds in battle, defeating strong opponents, and leading a group of warriors. He led and fought against 50 men, with 20 girls in command. This is a man who fought against the strongest knight Willendorf commander Reckenbell and was able to defeat him. Continuing to talk passionately about his battle in the Great War, Valir, realizing she might have gone overboard, concluded by asserting Faust's status as the strongest in the country, dispelling their worries. Amid confusion, Valir instructed them to focus on improving their sword skills, prompting Zabine to suggest a surprising idea. Since Faust had always been there for them, she proposed that Valir ask Faust to take their virginity. Valir, taken aback, dismissed the suggestion as a joke, but Zabine's desire seemed insatiable. At that moment, Faust arrived at the Valir castle to meet her. Greeting him from the window, Valir, trembling, hoped Zabine was jesting, but her lustful intentions were clear as she was already ready to tear off Faust's clothes and take him whole. Valir knocked her out, protecting Faust from the amorous advances of her knights. Bro was almost fed to the wolves. Princess is doing her best to protect our innocent boy from horny Amazonian women. Faust, unaware of the situation, entered the office, surprised by Zabine's absence. Valir explained that she had been injured during training and couldn't attend the meeting. Bro's virginity is protected by royalty. The Amazons, members of the second princess's night squad, gathered at a bar in the evening for what they deemed their last drink before the upcoming hike. Recognized by the bar owner, they faced the challenge of lacking funds for their evening. Aware of their financial situation, Zabine, upset about Valiera's refusal to provide money for a brothel, requested her money back to treat the group to a barrel of beer. Unfortunately, beyond Zabine, the others had no money to contribute. Zabine shared her disappointment about Valiera's decision, and the girls, upset at the prospect of dying as virgins, vented their frustration by blaming the treasury. Hannah, one of the knights, spoke up, acknowledging the obvious denial of permission from the princess. As a knight of the second princess, she expressed shame in her team's actions. It prompted others to attack Hannah, claiming that she was no different and was also a virgin. In embarrassment, Hannah conceded that they were all in the same boat. The girls, finding humor in the situation, laughed and teased he. In a somewhat ironic celebration, everyone raised their glasses of alcohol and collectively shouted virgins. Zabine, after apologizing for not securing funds, proposed an alternative plan involving Lord Polidoro, Faust. In a drunken fervor, she suggested the idea of having intimate relations with Faust, narrating Valir's passionate description of him. However, the girls were not entirely thrilled with the proposal, as they had diverse tastes. Some preferred small, gentle, and chubby men, challenging the notion that the most crucial factors were an appealing backside and genitalia. Hannah struggled to comprehend their conversation. Undeterred, Zabine declared that the one who impressed Faust the most would have the chance to become his wife, presenting it as a golden opportunity for those who were neither material wives nor high-ranking knights. Zabine, fueled by alcohol, passionately declared that only one of them could become Faust's wife, starting a competition among them. They began jokingly suggesting that they should die in the name of the virgin Faust and played with each other. Hannah worried and watched over them. Zabine, taking a bold step, stood up and, exposing her breasts, suggested a more direct approach, forcing Faust to do some fun things with all of them so they could collectively lose their virginity. Hannah, realizing the potential consequences of Zabine's actions, felt a sense of being banned from another bar. Motivated by Zabine's proposal, the girls, including those with diverse interests, real elites at this point, decided to join the battle to win Faust's affections. Hannah, observing their antics, remarked that they were just a team of idiots. The next day arrived, marking the day for Valir's camping expedition. Clad in her knight's attire, she nervously approached her sister Anastasia's room, expecting some form of reprimand or punishment. 
To her surprise, Anna greeted her warmly. Valier, still on edge, speculated whether Anna planned to hinder her camping trip, perhaps by confinement or even violence, and she felt on the verge of tears. Standing before Anna, anxiously closing her eyes, Valier was taken aback as Anna, casually filing her nails, began offering advice. This unexpected kindness left Valier bewildered. Anna acknowledged the potential challenges of the upcoming duel, warning that they might face formidable opponents. She shared a perspective on battle, different from the heroic narrative Valier had heard from Faust. Anna emphasized the uncertainties of decision-making in the heat of battle, and advised Valier to focus on what she could do, rather than dwelling on potential regrets. Anna's unexpected support served as mental preparation for Valier, who found it surprising that her sister had called her in for such advice. With a smile, Anna encouraged Valier to hasten her departure, wishing her good luck and providing a moment of calm. Upon leaving Anna's office, Valir joined her squad of wild Amazons and the legendary hero Faust. As they gathered and set off through the bustling city, Valir couldn't help but feel a sense of awkwardness about leaving the city. As the group moved through the city, Valir expressed her concern about their slow pace. Zabine attributed the slowness to the weight of their weapons and armor, prompting Valir to quip that it wasn't the armor that was weighing her down, but rather the effects of their likely night of drinking. While Faust's personal troops were also clad in armor, none of them complained about the weight. The Amazon wild chimpanzees, the Knights of the Second Princess, found themselves on the ground, weakened and exhausted. Valir scolded them, urging them to clean themselves up, while Zabine, feeling sick, struggled with the physical toll of their journey. Faust, understanding that it was their first trip and they were not accustomed to it, suggested taking a short break. Valir, confused and unsure of what to do, looked at everyone in silence. Faust, noting that nobody was discussing the upcoming battle, asked Valir if they should take a rest. Valir, still bewildered, agreed to a short break and they arranged for some rest. As they rested, Valir contemplated the outcome of the upcoming battle. The stakes were high. If she lost, she would not only lose Faust, but also disband her royal knights. Uncertain of what to do, she observed her knights, who were fooling around. Despite the lack of expectations from family and aristocrats, Valir hoped for the survival of her squad and was prepared to do anything for them. Amidst scolding her knights for their carelessness, Valir was interrupted by sounds coming from behind the bushes. To her surprise, someone was relieving themselves, and the person was startled by Valir's loud voice. The knights teased the individual, leaving Valir both confused and angry. The atmosphere was lively as Valir's knights and Faust's team resumed their journey, with the Amazon women singing a peculiar and embarrassing song about his long thing. Despite the embarrassment it caused Faust and Valir, the group was in high spirits. Helga observed an unusual deviation in their behavior, prompting Valir to request Zabine to cease singing the explicit song. In response, Zabine playfully defended the act, citing it as common among soldiers expressing their lust. Valir emphasized their role as royal knights and requested them to refrain from such songs, especially in front of Faust. Valir explained that soldiers from Polidora punished anyone who disrupted Faust in a vulgar manner. Helga's expression conveyed both disgust and a readiness to reprimand the Amazon women for their behavior. Zabine was also confused. Valir apologized to Faust, but Faust assured her that he stopped listening in the middle, further embarrassing Valir. Zabine confusedly replied that she had forgotten that a man was with them and asked if they should sing a heroic ballad. As Faust's group approached a village, a strange smell caught Faust's attention, prompting him to ask Helga to investigate. Faust's soldiers immediately prepared their weapons, showcasing their readiness for any potential threat. This surprised Valir, who was taken aback by their quick response. The princess and her knights were left puzzled by the unfolding situation. Helga, seeing that the whole village was burning and was destroyed, was in complete horror. She reported seeing bodies there. Faust felt that everything was worse than they thought. Upon reaching the village, they were met with a horrifying scene. The village was in ruins, with bodies of murdered women scattered around, some hanging on ropes, displaying signs of brutal violence. The gruesome sight left the princess and her knights in a state of terror. They proceeded towards the center of the village, 
where they discovered the well, beside which lay the corpse of a woman already partially consumed by crows. Valir, descending from her horse, was deeply shocked by the gruesome scene before her. As they explored further, a wounded, barely alive woman approached Valir, nearly collapsing in front of her. The group decided to enter the main building of the village, assigning the knights to guard outside as they sought to unravel the mysteries behind the tragic events that had unfolded. Inside the building, they confronted the head of the village and discovered that approximately 100 bandits had attacked. Faust, inquiring about the stolen resources, questioned the village head's role and why she was the only one left alive. Faust harbored suspicions and lacked trust in the village head. Introducing himself as Faust von Polidoro, he urged her to provide all the details. The tearful village head explained that she was wounded during the attack and lost consciousness. Valir, puzzled by the inconsistencies with the report sent to the capital, sought clarification. The village head revealed that the initial group of 30 bandits had grown into a formidable force over time, raising concerns for Zabin. In an emotional state, the village head narrated a conflict with a neighboring town of 1,000 people. This conflict escalated into a bloody battle, where the first daughter emerged victorious. However, when ordered to kill her younger sister, the second daughter of the Bozel family, Knight Caroline von Bozel, escaped with her soldiers and weapons. Valir was left in shock and horror by the revelations. Faust, incredulous, questioned the village head about her sources of information and she explained that the first daughter had warned them. She admitted to being an incompetent leader incapable of correcting her own mistakes. Amidst the horror and despair of the situation, the head of the village reported that they had dispatched people to the capital. Valir realized that the capital was already aware of the dire circumstances. Tearfully, the village head sought forgiveness, acknowledging that they stood no chance against the formidable bandit force. Valier, despite her own fear, comforted the village head and with a trembling voice turned to Faust for guidance. Faust, recognizing Valier's fear, suggested following the example of the second daughter attempting to escape behind Willendorf to unite with their forces. The challenge lay in facing a team of over 100 members. Faust mentioned the possibility of victory if the Duchess of Astarta arrived from the capital with 200 knights, though time was of the essence. The realization of the dire odds left everyone in a state of horror and despair. With an army of only 37 soldiers against more than 100 bandits, Valir contemplated the potential outcomes of failure, including the loss of Faust, disbandment of her knights, and the interference of her sister and the queen. Overwhelmed by these thoughts, she questioned whether she could sacrifice the lives of her knights. In a moment of reassurance, Zabin turned to Valir and assured her that they would do everything possible. With a hopeful smile, Zabin suggested that if they conducted themselves admirably, they could become heroes in the capital. Encouraged by Zabin's words, Valir mustered the courage to order everyone to take action. Tearfully, she sought Faust's guidance on the next course of action. Faust, after a moment of hesitation, suggested giving up the pursuit. Relieved, Valir decided to follow his advice, determined to avoid the loss of her cherished knights. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed this recap, please press the like button and leave a comment with your opinion. Use the word take in your comment, it's very important for me. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. See you later.